You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil. Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moyes. I will mention as well that the, there, there are 15 lectures here given at Dornach, Switzerland, from the 6th of September to the 13th of October. Lecture 1, given on the 6th of September, 1918. I'd like to go more deeply into some of the things we have been considering here this summer, and we'll add some historical details and also some factual things in the next few days. Today I intend to draw your attention to some historical facts and then present you with some conclusions drawn from a deeper study of these and particularly from the revelations of some historical figures. Initiates of the mysteries have through the ages always said one thing, rightly so. It is that if one does not know how to judge the two streams in philosophical life properly, two streams we have been considering, idealism and materialism, one will be in danger of either falling through a trap door into a pokey little cellar hole or coming to a dead end in the search for a philosophy of life. The cellar has been considered by initiates of all times to be dualism, where one does not find the bridge from ideas, spiritual thinking tinged with theory, to the sphere of matter, of material things. And the dead end one may reach in following different ways of looking at the world, when one does not manage to balance idealism against materialism, is what initiates call fatalism. In more recent times there has been a definite tendency to take a dualistic view, and on the other hand to be fatalistic though there are things which those taking the present-day views fail to admit or do not even realize. To begin with, I would like to take one individual who lived in the evening twilight of the fourth post-Atlantean era, just in general outline, with reference to the philosophy of life, and then look at others who are more characteristic of our present-day philosophy of life of the fifth post-Atlantean era. One highly characteristic figure with regard to Western philosophy of life was Augustine of Hippo, who lived from 354 to 430 of the Christian era. Let us recall some of Augustine's thoughts, for as you can see from the dates, he lived in the evening twilight of the fourth post-Atlantean era, which came to a conclusion in the 15th century. It is clearly evident that this conclusion was approaching, starting from the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th post-Christian centuries. Augustine gained impressions of many different philosophies of life. We have spoken of this before. Above all, Augustine came to note Manichaeism and skepticism. His soul took in all the impulses which one gains when, on the one hand, one sees all that is ideal, beautiful and good, everything that is filled with wisdom, and then also everything which is bad, evil. And we know that in Manichaeism people sought to manage, putting it crudely, but it can also be put in this way, with these two streams in the philosophies of life, so that in a way they accepted eternal polarity, opposition persisting forever between light and darkness, good and bad, wisdom filled and evil. In Manichaeism, people only managed with this dualism by connecting certain ancient pre-Christian concepts with this acceptance of the polarity of phenomena in the world, and above all, connected certain ideas, which can only be understood if one knows that in earlier times people used an atavistic clairvoyance to see into the spiritual world, 
ideas that those visions were similar in content to the impressions gained through sensory perception. Having taken in such ideas, I'd say, of the supersensible as seemingly sensible, Manichaeism gave the impression for many people of making the spiritual material, of envisaging the spiritual in forms that are sense-perceptible. This is a common mistake made also in more recent philosophies, including more recent theosophy, as I've been telling you the other day. Augustine gave up Manichaeism for the very reason that he could no longer bear the way things were made sensible, material. That was one of the reasons why he gave it up. Augustine then also went through skepticism, which is a justifiable philosophy of life, insofar as it makes people aware that merely considering anything which is to be gained from the sense-perceptible world and the experiences and events in the sense-perceptible world will not tell them anything about the supersensible. And if one then also holds the view that one cannot gain the supersensible as such, one will doubt if truth is to be found at all. Augustine also went through this doubt without knowing the truth. He gained the most powerful impulses from this. Now, in order to make you understand what really gave Augustine the position he had in Western philosophy, I have to refer to the main element in his point of view, a point from which all the light shone out that lived in Augustine, and was indeed the main point in his later, his last philosophy of life. It is the point which we may characterize as follows. Augustine realized that human beings can only be certain, truly certain, with a certainty free from all delusion, if they refer to their own inner experience. Everything else can be uncertain. It is impossible to know if the things we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, things that make an impression on any of our senses, truly are constituted the way our senses make us assume. We cannot even know what this world actually looks like if we close our eyes and ears and other senses to it. That is how people think, who think in the Augustinian way about the outside world, which they can experience. They think that this outside world, which they can experience as it presents itself to human beings, could not provide true certainty, that nothing can be gained from it on which one might base oneself as a fixed point in a philosophy of life. But with regard to the things which people experience inwardly, irrespective of how they do so, being with them directly, it is the individual himself who lives in the ideas, the feelings inside him. One knows that one is right within one's inner life. For a thinker like Augustine, the fact, inwardly experienced, is that with regard to anything human beings inwardly experience as truth, they can be under no delusion. You may think that everything else which the world says may be deceptive, but there can be absolutely no doubt that the ideas, the feelings that live in us, are really and truly experienced by us in our inner life. This solid basis for accepting one truth about which there can be no doubt was one of the starting points in Augustine's philosophy of life. In the fifth post-Atlantean era, this point was taken up in a most striking way by Descartes, who lived from 1596 to 1650, already in the dawn, therefore, of the fifth post-Atlantean era. For Descartes, too, saw this element which remains when all else is in doubt, as the starting point, and he put it in the well-known words, I think, therefore I am. And he was wholly, excuse me, and he was really wholly in accord with Augustine in taking this view. Now, the situation is that when it comes to one's philosophy of life, one always has to say, quote, someone who is in the stream of human evolution at some point in time will have certain views. There will be certain aspects of his views of which he is not aware. 
People who come later will see them. Close quote. We might say that those who come later are privileged to see something in a fuller and truer sense than someone who has to say certain things at a particular time in human evolution. This is a fact that cannot be denied. And it is good, as I have mentioned on previous occasions, if people who are taking our anthroposophical point of view will consciously and thoroughly realize the following. The knowledge of spiritual things one is able to gain at the present time, however distinctive it may be, must not be taken as a sum of absolute dogmas. It has to be clearly understood that there will be others at a later time who will see a greater truth in such things as we are able to present today than we are able to see for ourselves. This is indeed the basis for humanity's cultural evolution. And any obstacle to all inhibition of cultural advance ultimately depends on people not being prepared to admit that they would really like to be given truths that are not the truths of a particular era, but are absolute timeless dogmas. Today, in particular, we are able to look back from our point of view on Augustine and we'll have to say to ourselves, quote, if one takes the Augustinian point of view, one will have to be very clear in one's mind that he assumed uncertainty as to the truth in all external revelations, but genuine truth in experiencing the things that live in our soul. Close quote. It calls for a degree of courage for someone to take this point of view. Perhaps one would not need to speak of this in the decided fashion in which I have to do it, if it were not the case that exactly in our time courage would characteristically be lacking when it comes to philosophies of life. This courage to which I am referring shows itself in two directions. One is that, like Augustine, you boldly admit you will have genuine certainty only with regard to anything you experience inwardly. Close quote. Then, there has to be the other pole of this courage, and at the present time this is indeed lacking. One must then also have the courage to admit to oneself, quote, the revelation of external things through the senses does not have this genuine certainty of their being real. Close quote. It does need inner courage in our thinking to say that there is no genuine certainty about external reality, which is considered to be absolutely certain in modern materialism. On the other hand, it needs a degree of courage to say to oneself, quote, genuine certainty comes only if one is really aware of one's inner experiences, close quote. Yes, even in our day, this has been said again, and there are people who ask others, people who want to develop a philosophy of life, to have this courage, which shows itself in two ways. Yet we have to think differently about this today, if we really want to get to the bottom of things. And there we see the whole historical position held by Augustine for the people of today, and that our thinking about the matter has to be somewhat different. For today we have to know something which Augustine or Descartes did not consider. I have discussed this in the part of my book titled The Riddle of Man, where I was referring to Descartes. Today, we have to say, quote, the idea that one might arrive at a satisfactory philosophy of life by grasping the direct inner life of man, the way people experience it today, this idea is refuted every time we go to sleep. Close quote. Every time someone falls back into the unconscious state of sleep in our day, he or she will be deprived not of the absolute true certainty of inner experience of which Augustine spoke, but of the reality of this inner experience. The reality of this genuine experience is always lost from going to sleep to waking up again. Today human beings experience the inner life in a slightly different way from the way people did as late as the fourth post-Atlantean era, and even in the evening twilight of Augustine's day. Today they have to say, quote, however clearly, 
However exactly a certainty may be inwardly experienced, it still offers no certainty for life after death. For the simple reason that we see reality sink down into the unconscious sphere every time we sleep. And the people of today do not know if it does not also sink down into unreality. Close quote. So today we may no longer conclude that things inwardly experienced in seemingly absolute certainty cannot be called in question. In theory, none of it can be called in question, but the fact of sleep goes against this. Turning our attention to what has just been said, we will immediately see how Augustine was able to arrive at this view and did so with much greater justification than Descartes later on, who really was more or less only repeating Augustine's statement. Some late echoes of the old atavistic clairvoyance still existed, still existed for the whole fourth post-Atlantean era, including the time when Augustine lived. Sadly, far too little of this is taken note of in history today, and little is known of it. But throughout the whole of the fourth post-Atlantean era, very many people knew from personal experience that there is a spiritual life, for they saw it in their visions. But during that fourth era they mostly saw it because it entered into their sleep life, and that was different from the way it was in the second and third eras. We may therefore say that in the fourth post-Atlantean era it was different from the way it is now in the fifth era, when sleep means being wholly unconscious. In the fourth post-Atlantean era people still knew that from going to sleep until waking up was a time when the ideas and feelings they had in their waking hours acted in other forms. The waking life of truth went down, as it were, into the dim conscious awareness of sleep life. And they knew that the inner truth they experienced held not only truth but also reality. For they knew moments in the life of sleep when the things one learns in the inner life were present as real and not merely abstract life. It is immaterial if someone may be able to demonstrate even today that Augustine would have been able to say from personal experience, quote, I know that the things we experience inwardly as true but unreal exist for the time from going to sleep to waking up. Close quote. But it was certainly possible in Augustine's day to gain such a view and base oneself on it. If you now extend what I have been saying with regard to the subjective human principle and generalize it for the whole macrocosm, this will take you to something different. You then discover the element from which this subjective principle actually arose in earlier times, namely in the fourth post-Atlantean era, and what has made it possible. In pre-Christian times, the mystery of Golgotha marks the boundary between the ancient atavistic views and later new ones which are still evolving today, people were still able to adhere to certain living mystery truths. The truths from the mysteries which I mean here are truths relating to the great secret of birth and death. Some initiates considered the secret of birth and of death to be a secret which should not be made known to the world because the world was not yet ripe for it. But within the mysteries, some view was also held in pre-Christian times on the connection between birth and death in the macrocosm, man being part of this in the whole of his essential nature. During that time before Christ, it was through the mysteries that attention was above all directed toward birth, toward all that was being born in the world. Anyone familiar with the old philosophies of life will know that the emphasis was on being born, on coming into existence, shooting and sprouting. And I have, of course, made it clear on several occasions that the opposite came with the mystery of on Golgotha. I used the following words, quote, Consider that about 600 years before Golgotha, Buddha, who in human evolution represents something like the ending of the pre-Christian philosophy of life, did, among other things, develop his views on seeing a corpse. 
death is suffering. And it was like an axiom for Buddha that suffering must be overcome. The means had to be found to enable one to turn away from death. It was the corpse from which the Buddha turned away to arrive at something which, albeit spiritualized, was to him, nevertheless, something in which one can get a sense of shooting, sprouting life. Looking at life in other regions, 600 years after the mystery on Golgotha, we see that seeing the dead body of the Christ on the cross was not something people would turn away from, but something they would turn toward, something they would look upon with all their heart as the symbol that would solve the riddle of the macrocosm insofar as it related to the human being and his growth and development. This is a very special relationship within those twelve centuries. Six hundred years before the mystery on Golgotha, turning away from a corpse led to something that was to be an elevating principle in the philosophy of life. Six hundred years after the mystery on Golgotha, the symbol of the cross had evolved, a turning toward death, toward the dead body, to find there the strength to arrive at a philosophy of life that would cast a light also on the progress of man. Among the many things which characterize the tremendous change that came with the mystery on Golgotha is this Buddha symbol of turning away from the dead body and the Christ symbol of turning toward the dead body, which is seen as the dead body of the most sublime spirit ever to have appeared on earth. It truly was the case that in a certain respect the old mysteries placed the riddle of births at the center of philosophies of life. In doing so, the mysteries, which sought to convey mystery knowledge and not just superficial views, did at the same time present the human soul with a profound cosmological secret. They directed attention to the principle connected with the life of births in world evolution. And you will not be able to understand the life of births in world evolution unless you go back to the ancient riddle of the moon. We know, of course, that before the earth came to be earth, it was embodied as the old moon. Various phenomena connected with our present moon, the late descendant of the old moon, you can read it up in my title, Occult Science and Outline, Readers Aside, also known as An Outline of Esoteric Science, and of Readers Aside, have to be seen as late echoes of events that happened in the time of the old moon, a time which preceded earth evolution. There would be no births, none, in all the realms of nature, in earth evolution, if the laws of the old moon did not apply, or rather those of its late descendant, which is the earth's satellite. Every birthing in all the realms of nature and in humanity is connected with the moon's activities. And it was in connection with this that the ancient Hebrew initiates considered Yahweh to be a moon god. Yahweh is the God who controls all bringing forth. It was understood that, cosmologically, the laws of the moon governed all bringing forth processes in all realms of nature. They were thus able to speak of a profound secret in cosmology, symbolically, as it were, saying, quote, As the light of the moon shines on the earth, all shooting, sprouting life, all births, come from the principle represented by the moonlight. Close quote. In the highest mysteries of pre-Christian times, people did not turn to the light of the sun, but to the sun's life as it was reflected by the moon when speaking of the secret of births. The particular nuance given to pre-Christian philosophies of life in their depths had arisen because in the old mysteries people knew the secret of the moon. The light of the sun was considered to be something veiled, something not very good for people, unless they were well prepared. For it was known that it is delusion, maya, to think that the sun ray coming to earth called forth the shooting, sprouting life forms in the different realms of nature. It was known that getting born did not depend on the life of the sun, but rather the other way round, being scorched, the diminishing of life did so. 
The mystery secret was that the moon lets life forms be born and the sun lets them die. However much people were venerating the life of the sun for other reasons in the pre-Christian mysteries of old, they venerated it as the ground and origin of death. The fact that life forms must die cannot be ascribed to the sun, which we know from title occult science, to have been the second embodiment of the earth, but we can ascribe it to the present sun, which we see on the horizon in all its glory. Well, now, the end of life, which is the opposite of those births, is connected with the life of the sun. But there is also something else, something that was not so important in pre-Christian times, but has become particularly important in post-Christian times. All conscious life is connected with the life of the sun. And the conscious life which human beings go through in a life on earth, that conscious awareness which shines out particularly in the fifth post-Atlantean era, which is our own, is intensively connected with the life of the sun. We merely need to consider this life of the sun from the spiritual point of view, just as we have been doing in the lectures given earlier this summer. Yes, the sun is the creator of death, the scorching life in the cosmos and also for human beings, but it is at the same time also the creator of conscious life. This conscious life was not so important in pre-Christian times because they still had the atavistic life in clairvoyance inherited from the old moon. Conscious awareness has become important in post-Christian times, more important than life itself. For the goal of earth evolution can only be achieved if this conscious awareness is gained in an appropriate way. Human beings have to accept this conscious awareness from the one who gives us not only this but also the life of death, not the life of births. It is with this that through the mystery on Golgotha, the son of the sun, the S-O-N of the S-U-N, the Christ entered into earth evolution, going through the living body of Jesus of Nazareth, the power, as it were, which has become the most important principle in earth evolution. This is connected with profound cosmic secrets. Quote, from your sleep life, the initiates of the old mysteries would say to their disciples, A sleep life into which the powers of the moon enter even when you are awake. We know, of course, that human beings are partly asleep even in their waking hours. The life of the moon tinges this life of sleep just as the silver sickle of the moon tinges the darkness of night. Christian initiates have to say to their disciples, quote, seek to understand that conscious awareness shines out from waking life because the powers of the sun enter into it just as the sun shines on all life on earth from morning to night. Close quote. The change came with the mystery on Golgotha. In pre-Christian times it was most important to perceive the origin of life. Now it has become most important to perceive the source and origin of conscious awareness. It is only by knowing how to connect the cosmological truth to which I have been referring with the true certainty that lives in our souls, that is only by grasping spiritual science inwardly, that we will be assured of the reality of the spirit within the principle which otherwise does not assure reality in this inner life. We cannot get far with the means available to Augustine, the means available to those who base themselves on Augustinian principles. Every sleep confutes the genuine certainty of our inner experiences. It will only be when, in addition to these inner experiences, we come to experience their reality that we can gain a genuine firm foothold on the soil of these inner experiences. Anything we think, anything we feel in our present life on earth is not real in this present life on earth. Even today there are some scientific thinkers who acknowledge this. It is unreal for the present time. The strange thing is that our most intimate experience where the truth shines out for us beyond all doubt is not real in the present time. 
but it is the actual perpetuating seed for our next life on earth. We may speak of this principle, of which Augustine spoke and for which, in his case, there was no guarantee, as the seed for our next life on earth. We may say, quote, It is definitely true that the truth shines out within us but does so as something which is not real. Today it is still unreal, but in our next life on earth, this unreal principle which is seed in its unreality will be fruit, a fruit which will bring the next life to life, just as this year's seed in a plant will bring the visible plant to life next year. Close quote. We have to overcome time. Only then will we find reality in the things we are able to experience inwardly. We would never be the human beings we are meant to be if at the present time the inwardly experienced truth did have the same reality as the outside world. We would never be able to be free. Freedom would be completely out of the question, nor would we be individuals. We'd be part of the natural order. Anything happening within us would happen of necessity. We only are individuals, and indeed free individuals, because on the billows of necessary developments there arises, like a miracle, the unreality of our inner experiences, something which will only be outward reality of the kind we see in the world around us in our next life on earth. That is the deceptive quality of time, something which still lives in people's fantasies today. People do not consider that anything which inwardly shines out as unreal in one life on earth will be real in the next. Well, this is something we'll be considering further tomorrow and the day after. We see how, from the point of view we are able to gain today, we can survey Augustine's point of view and see something in his way of looking at things, as it were, which he himself was not yet able to see. Thus, Augustine is perhaps especially significant for us as someone in the evening twilight of the fourth post-Atlantean era, because he was, with particular precision, pointing to the ideal, conceptual stream in world events, seeking to find a fixed point in that ideal stream in world events. That is what Augustine tried to do. All we want to do today is to state this historical fact. In his time, people had not yet understood that a tremendous change had come with regard to the mystery on Golgotha and to death. For it is only from this mystery of death that the true consolidation of the absolute certainty of the truths experienced within the human soul can then well forth. We'll now take a big leap and characterize another individual, just as we have been talking about the characteristics of Augustine during the evening twilight of the fourth post-Atlantean era. We are going to consider characteristic individuals of the fifth post-Atlantean era in a particular respect. I'll select two of them. One of them, and beginning with him, we can characterize what emerged for humanity in the fifth post-Atlantean era in one particular respect, was Henri, Henri de Saint-Simon, who lived from 1760 to 1825. The other, a follower of Saint-Simon, was Auguste Comte, who lived from 1798 to 1857. Augustine was someone who made every effort, using all means his insights had provided, to consolidate Christianity. Both Saint-Simon and Auguste Comte had grown utterly confused about Christianity. It will be easiest for us to get an idea of the thinking of Auguste Comte and in a sense also of saint Simon, by considering some of Auguste Comte's main ideas, at least in a schematic way. Auguste Comte was very much a representative for a particular kind of philosophy of life. And it was only because people were not much concerned about the way in which the different philosophies fit into people's way of life that someone like Auguste Comte was studied as a rarity in history. What people don't know is that basically, though perhaps not everywhere, people have been influenced by, in a way, been pupils of Auguste Comte, though this is not what matters. 
deep down in their thinking they are of the same mind as August Comte. So we are able to say that August Comte is representative of a major part of people's approach to life in the present time. August Comte said, quote, Humanity has evolved. It has evolved in three stages and has now reached the third stage. If we observe people's inner lives through these three stages, we find that at the first stage people's ideas inclined mainly toward demonology. Close quote. This means that the first stage of evolution in the Comptean sense would be demonological. Quote, People imagined that spirits were active, taking effect behind the natural phenomena which are perceived through the senses. Close quote. You have to think of them the way people always imagine spirits to be in ordinary life. Demons are suspected to be everywhere, big ones and small ones. That was the first stage. Then, having developed a bit further, people began to move from the demonological view to a metaphysical one, where they had originally imagined demons, elemental spirits or the like, behind all phenomena. They now thought of understandable reasons put in abstract terms. People turned metaphysical when they did no longer want to believe in demons. The second stage was therefore metaphysics. Certain concepts were thought up and connected with one's own life, and people thought that they would get to the ground and origin of things with such concepts. Humanity has now also gone beyond this stage and entered into the third stage. Auguste Comte assumed, and this was very much in line with the thinking of his teacher, St. Simon, that wanting to learn about the ground and origin of the world, people no longer look to the demons nor to metaphysical concepts, but merely to the sense-perceptible reality provided by positivist science. The third age of this of excuse me, the third age is thus one of positivist science. People are meant to consider the things revealed to them in external scientific discoveries as enlightening and leading to a philosophy of life. They were to seek enlightenment about themselves in the same way in which mathematical enlightenment cast light on dimensions in space, physics on systems of forces, chemistry on the structure of matter, biology on the systems of life. In his great work on positive philosophy, August Comte sought to give a complete picture of the harmony of everything which the different sciences can tell us saying that this alone was worthy of man in his third stage of development. He did consider Christianity, saying it was the most sublime development, but nevertheless only as the final phase in demonology. Metaphysics followed. They provided a sum of abstract concepts. But according to Auguste Comte, only positive science arrives at something that is truly real also offering an existence worthy of humanity. He, therefore, wanted to establish a church based on positivist science, to organize people in social systems which were based on that positivist science. Auguste Comte did in the end arrive at some very strange ideas. I'll just take some characteristic elements today. He spoke a lot about establishing a positivist church, This positivist church, if you study this you will get to know the man's thinking, was also meant to introduce a kind of calendar. There were to be a great number of anniversaries dedicated to such figures as Newton or Galileo as representatives of positivist sciences. Those days of the year were to be devoted to the veneration of the individuals concerned. Other days were to be given to calumniating individuals, such as Julius the Apostate or Napoleon. This, too, was to be regulated. Life in general was to be largely regulated according to the principles of positivist science. If you know life, you'll know that not many people want to put the ideals of Auguste Comte into practice, but that is sheer cowardice, for in truth people do think the way Auguste Comte did. If you study the image presented by his positivist church, you will certainly gain the impression that the structure of that church is exactly the same as that of the Roman Catholic Church, although Auguste Comte's positivist church lacks the Christ. And this is what is so strange. 
We have to consider it utterly characteristic that Auguste Comte was looking for a Roman Catholic Church without Christianity. He arrived at this by letting the three stages, demonic, metaphysical, and positivist, enter into his soul. We might say that he considered all the trappings of Christianity that evolved in the course of history up to his time as something that was very good, but he wanted to remove the Christ himself from that church of his. Basically, that is the essence of Auguste Comte, a Roman Catholic church without the Christ. This is highly characteristic for the dawn of the fifth post-Atlantean era. Someone who had taken up Romanism was thinking in a Romanist way and at the same time was entirely thinking in the way of the fifth post-Atlantean era with its anti-spiritual character, had to think the way Auguste Comte did. Auguste Comte and his teacher St. Simon are therefore absolutely characteristic of the dawn of the fifth post-Atlantean age. But much would be decided in this fifth post-Atlantean era, and therefore the other nuances, which are also possible, also came up. As I said, I want to give you some glimpses of history today. We'll then develop things in that ba- on that basis. Schelling, who lived from 1775 to 1854, is in remarkable contrast to Auguste Comte. He is equally characteristic, as it were, of the dawn of the fifth post-Atlantean era. Today I cannot give schemat- I cannot even schematically go into Schelling's philosophy, highly differentiated in itself, of course but I'd like to refer to a few things that are characteristic. I said that in the evening twilight of the fourth post-Atlantean era, Augustine's position was to consider the one stream, the ideal one, in such a way that a fixed point might arise from it where he might take his position. We now enter into the fifth post-Atlantean era. In its dawn, We have figures like St. Simon and Auguste Comte who were looking for the firm base in the other, the purely natural, material order of positivist sciences. This gives us the two directions, Augustine on the one hand, Auguste Comte on the other. Schelling used the means available in the fifth post-Atlantean era to look behind the things one is able to see in the world for a bridge between the ideal and the real, the ideal and the material. You'll find the main points in my book titled The Riddle of Man. He showed tremendous energy in looking for a way of reconciling these opposites. Initially, he only developed abstract ideas. By starting from the same base as Johann Gottlieb Fichte, he made some progress and tried to come to something in the world that was ideal and real at one and the same time. There followed a time in Schelling's life when he felt it was impossible to arrive at such a bridge using the means of abstraction which had evolved in the course of time in that era. It seemed to him that this was impossible. One day, he said to himself, people really have only gained these concepts for understanding the natural order outside on the basis of modern scholarship. But we have no concepts for anything which is behind this outer natural order, the sphere where a bridge can be built between the ideal and the real. Close quote. And it is most interesting that one day Schelling admitted that it seemed to him that the academics of recent centuries had come to a secret agreement, that they would exclude anything deeper from their philosophy of life, anything that would lead to true and genuine life. One would therefore have to go to the non-academic people. This was also the time when Schelling considered the works of Jakob Böhme. There he found the spiritual deepening which led to the last, the theosophical period in his life, from which has come the beautiful work on human freedom, the beautiful work on the gods of Samothrace, on the Kabiri, then his title Philosophy of Mythologies and title Philosophy of Revelation. Schelling was seeking, especially during this last part of his life, to understand what influence the mystery on Golgotha had had on human history. This was what he wanted to know above all else. And he came to realize 
that the concepts available to the scholars of his day would not enable people to understand the life where the mystery on Golgotha was flowing, and therefore also not the true life of man. Schelling, and that is the trait which I want to draw special attention to, we'll make this the basis for further study in the days ahead, arrived at a view that was the absolute opposite of the view held by his contemporary, Auguste Comte. And this is the strange thing. We are able to say that Auguste Comte was looking for a Catholicism, or rather a Roman Catholic Church, that was without Christianity. Schelling was looking, from his point of view, for a Christianity without a Church. A Christianity without a Church. Schelling was, as it were, seeking to Christianize the whole of modern life, make it wholly Christian, so that everything human beings are able to think, feel, and do would have the Christ impulse pulsing through it. What he was not looking for was a separate religious life for Christianity, especially not on the pattern that already existed in historical evolution, though he did take a careful look at this life. We thus have the two extremes, Auguste Comte's idea of a church without the Christ and Schelling's idea of the Christ without a church. I wanted to speak to you about these two historical views so that we may make this our basis. We see one individual, Augustine, seeking a firm base in idealism. Another individual, Auguste Comte, who was looking for this in realism and Schelling, who wanted to build a bridge. All these were tendencies that preceded the evolution in which we now find ourselves. What we can say is that one can survey what happened through many centuries, what went on where philosophies of life are concerned, and one can then turn one's attention to the way in which people's ideas evolved in a wider context. Study of Auguste Comte yields a most important aperçu. But Auguste Comte was not able to grasp it in its pure form, being wholly caught up in his prejudices. However, we get something that will be an important starting point for us in the next few days if we consider the whole situation. I'd say Augustine, Auguste Comte, Schelling. I want to come to this aperçu when we conclude today's reflections, for I would wish you to have it in mind. In the next few days we'll then speak of something which is connected with this aperçu in a most significant way. As it has arisen from the subject matter I have been presenting, I will give it to you in aphoristic form, without being able to go into reasons why this aperçu has come up not with Auguste Comte, but with others when one takes the standpoint of a later time, as I put it today, and takes a point of view which is much later, the standpoint of someone who, at the beginning of the 20th century, thinks about someone who was a thinker at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. But it really is important. I have stressed this many times over and also brought out clearly this time, that today we look at philosophies of life not just in abstract terms and on their own, but in the way in which they are part of the whole life of humanity. This is the only way of coming to a standpoint of reality. We have to consider how it fits into the whole life of humanity. St. Simon and Auguste Comte clearly understood that they were only able to arrive at their positivism in modern times. That positivism would have been impossible at an earlier time. Auguste Comte in particular was very much aware, quote, the way I am thinking, close quote, he more or less said to himself, continue quote, is a way which is only possible in our time. Close quote. This is tremendously important in the modern movement and is indeed connected with the aperçu to which I was referring. If one makes the point which Auguste Comte considered to be the starting point for his threefold system, one can say, in his sense, that this threesome is theology, metaphysics, and positivist science, as he called it, Parenthesis, rightly or wrongly, so that does not matter. Parenthesis. The strange thing is that we are able to ask, quote, who is most liable to be a believer where one of these directions is concerned? 
close quote. Please, do not misunderstand me with regard to what I am now going to say with reference to the aperçu, and do not take it as a one-sided dogma, nor to take it as it might be crudely observed with absolute certainty. Uh, readers aside, the word aperçu, which I believe I'm spelling correctly, I believe I don't actually know the meaning of it at the moment, but it's spelled A P E R C with a little mark under it U. A P E R C U Aperçu. My apologies, and readers aside. No. We have to consider the whole course of human evolution if we want to turn our attention to the words I am now going to say. But in that case, we cannot ask, quote, who'll be the believer, close quote, but, quote, who'll be most likely to be a believer in one of these directions, close quote. Careful observation will then show, however much the facts would seem to contradict this, that the one most likely to be a believer in theology not a representative of theology, but a believer, I am not talking about religion, but about theology, is the soldier. Civil servants, especially in the legal field, are most likely to believe in metaphysics, and industrialists will most easily come to believe in positivist sciences. When one wants to judge life, it is most important not to be abstract, but to look at life in a truly unbiased way. But one then has to raise questions like these. Coming to a conclusion today, I want you to treat this as an aperçu, something which comes to mind when one enters more intimately into Auguste Comte's thinking. He was aware that he could only be fully understood by industrialists and could really only come up with his views in an industrial age. This is connected with the fact that an industrialist will most easily believe in positivist science, a soldier in not just the Christian but any theology, and the civil servant in metaphysics. The end of Lecture 1 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. This is a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moise. This is Lecture 2, given on the 7th of September, 1918. Full insight into the situations we are currently considering will not be possible unless we take a closer look at the nature of the human being between going to sleep and waking up again, that is, in the sleep state. You are all familiar with this sleep state in theory. The principle which we call capital I and astral body, if names are to be used, separates from the physical body and the ether body. Yet if we want to take a closer look at the nature of sleep, we have to be aware that it is actually in the sleep state that human beings experience the reality of which we spoke yesterday. I said that Augustine sought to grasp true and real certainty about the world in inner experience. But human beings do not fully grasp their inner life when they are in the waking state. It has to be understood that the principle known as I and as astral body does not really come to conscious awareness in the waking state only an image, a mirror image of I and astral body, comes to conscious awareness in this waking state. If human beings were aware of themselves when in the sleep state, that is, from going to sleep to waking up, or we might also say if they grew aware of themselves by doing the exercises which are described in my published works, they would, in being aware of their experiences during sleep, gain living experience of the true form, as it were, of I and astral body, and not of the mirror image they have in the waking state. It has to be understood that this true form of I and astral body appears before the soul, before conscious awareness, in images, in such a way that in their sleep human beings truly experience inwardly in their inner life 
within their eye and their astral body, something which we call the third hierarchy, the hierarchy of angels, archangels, and archai. In their waking state, human beings are not aware of this intimate connection with the spirits called angels, archangels, and archai, and connection, a connection, which continues for the whole of their lives. This is the delusion under which they are in their waking state, that their experience is limited to the abstract I and the shadowy ideas and thoughts that fill the human soul, for they are indeed shadowy, or indeed the dreamlike sense of wanting to do things. The whole point is that in their waking life, human beings have to remain limited to this shadow nature of their I and their astral body, and that they cannot be conscious of the fact that the spirits of the third hierarchy are having an influence on their eye. At the very moment when human beings are actually waking up in sleep, if I may put it like this, they would not have an outside natural world around them, but would have an inner sense of those spirits, angels, archangels, and the spirits of the age. It is because of this that we have something in the state of our soul which we would not otherwise have. If the hierarchy of the angels did not influence our astral body, we would not be able to see ourselves as individuals. It is because the hierarchy of the angels influences our spirit and soul that we feel ourselves to be independent individuals. Thanks to the influence of the hierarchy of the archangels, we feel ourselves to be part of the whole of humanity. We may also say that we feel ourselves to be human because the archangels shine into our existence in spirit and soul, inspiring it. And because the archai, the spirits of the age, send their pulses into our true nature, intuiting it, we feel ourselves to be creatures on earth, that is, not just part of present-day humanity, but part of the whole of earthly humanity, from the beginnings of earth evolution to its end. So this is why we feel ourselves to be part of the whole of earth evolution. We sense it only dimly, for we only have a dim inner sense of the spirits of the age. We cannot say that we see ourselves as an individual. This we can only do when we achieve awareness in images. This awareness in images continues to be a kind of mirror image for as long as we only experience our thoughts in such a way that we feel ourselves to be individuals through our independent life of thought. Let us be clear once more as to what makes us feel that we are individuals. We do so in that we are able to join one thought arbitrarily to another. You would immediately cease to see yourself as an individual if you were forced to add one thought to another the way one natural phenomenon follows another. The experience of inner freedom in taking our thoughts forward we feel ourselves to be individuals is something which does come most clearly to conscious awareness when we are awake. It does so because from going to sleep to waking up human beings are fully imbued with their angel and this angelic spirit belongs to our eye. It is with much greater indifference, much less strength and intensity that we feel ourselves to be part of the whole of humanity for we are naturally less close to the archangelic spirit which makes us feel that we are human than we are to our angel. And the principle which places us as individuals in the whole stream of human evolution does remain really, really shadowy. We try, of course, in working with spiritual science, to bring this feeling ourselves as part of the whole of earthly humanity awake. Realizing that in the fifth post-Atlantean era, human beings experience things in this way. In the fourth post-Atlantean era, they did so in another way in the third post-Atlantean era in yet another way. Through the science of the spirit, 
we now gain awareness of the way in which the state of the soul changes through the ages under the influence of the different spirits of the age, the spirits from the hierarchy of the archai. And this awareness really makes it possible for human beings to see themselves in history, realizing, quote, I am an individual living in the 20th century, close quote. Most people do not realize at all that their individual nature is only thinkable, can only be real, because it exists within a particular period of time. Our mind and spirit is wholly imbued with the spirits of the third hierarchy. This is something people would come to realize if they sought to develop insight in images in a more intensive way. As you will realize, this insight in images is not there in the ordinary run of human development. From going to sleep to waking up, the reality of I and astral body is dampened down. When awake, human beings lose the connection with the spirits of the third hierarchy. This is because, particularly in the present cycle of time, they are under an illusion even when awake. As we have just seen, they are under the illusion in their sleep that their eye and astral body are inactive. They are not inactive. They are in lively interaction with the spirits of the third hierarchy. In the waking state, the situation is that in the present cycle of time, our physical body and our ether body are, in a way, wrongfully absorbing our soul and spirit nature. They imbue themselves with it. The normal situation would be very different for human beings. It would be that in the waking state human beings would feel themselves to be I and astral body, with the physical body and the ether body like a kind of peel or shell which they slip into like something they carry about with them. But that is not how human beings feel themselves to be. They feel as if physical body and ether body were they, but they are not. We are indeed this entity in soul and spirit, which uses the physical and ether, ether body like a tool. We are, however, unable to rise above this delusion. It is part of the influences which our cycle in time has. So, we have to feel identical with our physical body and ether body, though in the normal state of conscious awareness this would be like a hammer we hold and use to strike. We have to give ourselves up to the delusion that it is we who move through space in the flesh. But it is not us. It is merely so because the Conscious awareness is unlawfully absorbed by our physical body and our ether body. The reason for this is that the Aramanic powers are more powerful in the present cycle of time than they would have been if human evolution had taken its normal course. They draw the eye and the astral body to the physical and ether body, as it were, creating the delusion for human beings that this head they have is they, that these hands and the whole body is they themselves. The physical body does unlawfully gain the conscious awareness which makes it seem as if our physical body brought about our individual nature. Someone who thinks that his physical body brings about his individual nature is under the same delusion as someone who stands in front of a mirror and thinks that the mirror is producing him since it is reflecting his image to him. To say that a form made of flesh, which we carry about with us, is us, is no better than if someone holds out his hand in front of a mirror and thinks that the mirror is producing his hands, his hand for him. The whole of modern science makes people believe that the individual nature we experience inwardly has something to do with the physical body and the ether body and not that the physical body and the ether body reflect this I and astral nature, creating the illusory image which from waking up to going to sleep we say is our I and our thoughts, that is our astral body. This, as it were, is the fundamental truth which we must perceive in the first place. With regard to this fundamental truth, people today are out of the forces in our present cycle of time, 
giving themselves up to a delusion in the conscious mind, which is exactly what I have just been saying. We think that the thoughts or also feelings we experience inwardly come from our living body. But human beings are subject to this delusion by nature. In their present state of conscious awareness, they cannot escape this delusion. Just as the sun seems larger when it appears on the horizon than it does when it is up above, we know this to be an illusion, but that is how it appears, so it has to seem to us that it is in flesh and blood, as it were, that we see ourselves as individuals. The conscious mind is deceived. Human beings have not always been subject to this delusion. Essentially, it is a character trait of post-Christian times, after the mystery on Golgotha. Before the mystery on Golgotha, it was a different kind of illusion. People did then not think that their conscious awareness was bound up with the physical body. History does not refer to this, but it is so nevertheless. It would be nonsense to suggest that someone who lived in the second or third millennium before the Christian era thought his soul was somehow produced by the physical body. In earlier times, no one felt that his soul and spiritual nature was bound to the living body the way people do today. The people of those earlier times did, however, have a lively awareness of the spirits of the third hierarchy. This they did have. They knew, quote, my soul is not identical with my body, close quote. This gave them a distinct awareness that the soul is not bound to the blood or to the muscles and so on, but that the soul is connected with the spirits of the third hierarchy. A different kind of illusion existed for them, not in the conscious mind, but with regard to life. They considered this soul with the spirits of the third hierarchy to be bound to the natural world outside, just as modern man believes his soul to be bound to his physical body. Modern man is under the delusion in his conscious mind that his soul is bound to his physical body and therefore does not see angels, archangels and archai. His physical body obscures them for him. The human being of old, in spite of being distinctly aware of the presence of the spirits of the third hierarchy, of their being bound up with his soul, would see the sense-perceptible natural world only dimly, indirectly. Modern man thinks his soul depends on his body. The earlier human beings thought that the spirits of the third hierarchy were bound up with the natural world outside, a world they perceived only dimly. They would confuse divine spirits, the spirits of the third hierarchy, with natural phenomena, seeing them reflected in those natural phenomena. Modern man places his soul in flesh and blood, The people of those early times placed the spirits of the third hierarchy in the natural world outside. They did not have the natural science we have today, but believed natural phenomena to be brought about by one demon or another, by more or less divine spirits about which they were under a life delusion. They were under that delusion because in their view those spirits were active in the natural phenomena in an almost physical form. It is important to know that in human evolution there was this earlier, pre-Christian time, when human beings were under the life illusion which I have characterized. After the mystery on Golgotha, people were under an illusion in the conscious mind. The influence of Christ Jesus, we'll speak of this tomorrow, should be to remove this mental delusion, at least in people's conscious minds, in a way similar to the way it was done for the life delusion in the ancient mysteries. With the, quote, Christ in me, close quote, people should feel that the principle, which is I and astral body, lives in spiritual freedom and is not bound up with flesh and blood. They will, of course, only be able to perceive it through vision gained in spiritual science. But thanks to Paul's not I, but the Christ in me, they can feel it. The things I have been saying will give you the reasons why human beings must, in a way, experience the duality of the natural order on the one hand. 
This has no ideals, linking one event with the next from sheer necessity, merely connecting cause with effect and effect with cause, so that it is never possible to think that moral or other kinds of ideals are connected with whatever happens in the natural world. On the other hand, one comes to realize that our existence would not be truly human without ideals if we did not have something else to live with as human beings, something other than mere natural order. However, with the existing conscious awareness, we would not be able to see that our ideals can be as effective as electricity or magnetism or the power of heat, so that our ideals would actually influence the natural order. Because of this, the natural order and the ideal order are side by side for us, and we cannot bridge the gap between them. In our waking hours, the aramonic free thinking is, quote, as an individual person, I am not any more bound to my physical body and to my ether body than I am bound when I stand before a mirror, and the mirror reflects my image for me, close quote. If people's awareness of their eye and astral body were like this, and if they would realize that this eye and this astral body are something very real and not a mere mirror image, then they would also acknowledge on the basis of their ideals, quote, those are real powers, like electricity and magnetism, but they do not have an influence in the present time, but we'll gain effectiveness as we go from this present incarnation to the next, from this life on earth to the next. Close quote. If human beings were to realize when, in their waking state, that their eye and their astral body are bound up with the spirits of the third hierarchy, or, in other words, if they were able to know themselves fully as earthly human beings, not just feeling themselves to be an independent individual, if they could sense how they are wrong in feeling that they are human beings of flesh and blood, then they also would not think that the natural order which presents itself to their senses out there was indeed powerful enough to resist the power of their ideals. They would know that all matter disintegrates in the natural order of today that there is no such thing as the conservation of matter, but that everything which is natural destroys itself. When today's nature does no longer exist, something else, outward, sense-perceptible and real, will have taken its place. The ideals of today will be the natural world of times to come. We are therefore able to say, quote, We experience natural order today, there is a figure drawn, and ideal order, another figure. Close quote. Physicists think that there is conservation of energy and of matter, that the natural order persists, with the same atoms and the same forces taking effect in future. If they are honest, all they can say is, quote, The ideal order has been a dream. It must drop away and vanish, like the dream itself so that in the earth's end state the ideal dream will no longer be there, will have been buried. Quote. Through natural science we see that this is an untruth, an illusion. We do have the natural order, but there is no conservation of energy and of matter. The natural order comes to an end at a certain point, and today's ideal order will then be the continuation of it. None of the things that are around our eyes today, around our ears, around all our senses, will exist when the earth has reached the Venus stage. I have spoken of this before. Within that nothingness, the possibility will arise for the ideals of present-day humanity to be outer reality. No philosophy of life which fails to recognize that the sense-perceptible world will perish can have any hope whatsoever that the ideal principle has the power to come to realization. If the sense-perceptible world were eternal, if there were such a thing as conservation of energy and of matter, the ideal world would be nothing but a dream. 
It is of tremendous importance that humanity needs to be enlightened in our day and know that the ideas of the present time will be the natural world of the future and that it is a tremendous illusion to think that atoms and physical forces go on forever. They are not eternal. They are temporal. It is a fatal aspect of spiritual science that one has to contradict a view which is considered to be the most certain of all in the established science of today, when in fact it is nothing but an aramonic deception. Let us consider once more what I have just been saying. Before the mystery on Golgotha, human illusion was an illusion in life. After the mystery on Golgotha, it became what we may call an illusion in the conscious mind. If we know this, we understand many things in human evolution. Above all, we understand why human beings who, before the mystery on Golgotha, had atavistic clairvoyance, nevertheless did not see the things which they did see in their true form, but saw the spirits of the higher hierarchies as demons. This is why the old mythologies are largely demonologies. All the gods in the ancient mythologies are demons. This was so because there was this illusion in life, and human beings did, in a way, have to think of a kind of false natural order as the divine order, just as today they have to think of a false bodily order as humanity's order. There follow the mystery on Golgotha. Human beings had to take their state of soul to the point, as it were, where they perceived what had resulted from the mystery on Golgotha. The human soul related more directly in its waking state to the spirits of the higher hierarchies than it does today, when the conscious mind is deceived. People would see the spirits of the higher hierarchies, merely recasting them because of the life delusion into Zeus, Apollo, and so on. Those were spirits of the third hierarchy, but they had been recast, seen under the influence of the life delusion, just as today we see everything relating to man under the influence of the conscious mind's delusion. Yet with all this a divine world order extended into humanity. Just consider how close people of past ages knew their human world to be to the divine world order. There you'd have the human hierarchy, and then there would be the divine hierarchy. People did not feel as closed off above as we do today. Their world ran on toward that of the gods. Think how close a Greek would feel his world of gods to be to the human world, the human hierarchy. There followed the mystery on Golgotha. There it was no longer the case It was not the mystery on Golgotha, which was to provide a replacement for what had been lost, but it was time which brought it about that human beings were cut off in their evolution from that conscious connection with the divine and spiritual world of the third hierarchy. A memory remained, however, an historical memory. Then came the time after the mystery on Golgotha, People had to think in a somewhat different way than they had done before the mystery on Golgotha, but some of the immediate past still had an influence. In the immediate past, human beings knew that the divine spirits had influenced events on earth, putting human activities on earth in order. Because of this, people of old were convinced when they established states The term state does not quite meet the case, but people are used to putting it this way. When the people of old created social structures, founded them, I'd say, they would know that these social structures were being established under the influence of the third hierarchy. People felt that their institutions on earth were institutions of the gods. You need only study the history of ancient Egypt with no need for clairvoyance and you'll find that the Egyptians were wholly convinced that everything human beings did in their social situations on earth was instituted by the spirits of the third hierarchy. This is how it was before the mystery on Golgotha. Only a memory of this remained after the mystery on Golgotha. 
What was the consequence of this? Well, you know that the church gradually established itself after the mystery on Golgotha. The church established a particular ranking order, deacons, archdeacons, bishops, archbishops, and so on. There was a quite specific idea behind this, which is still quite evident in the works of the early church writers. Read Dionysius the Areopagite and you'll see it quite clearly. The administration of the church was to reflect the divine order. The way a deacon related to the archdeacon was to reflect the relationship of angel to archangel. And then again the relationship of archdeacon to bishop, a reflection of archangel to archai. The social structure of the church was intended to reflect the theocracy. Up in the spiritual world were the ranks of the hierarchies. Below, reflecting the spiritual hierarchies, the ranks of church dignitaries. The thinking behind this was not of the legal kind in the early days, after the mystery on Golgotha, it was theocratic. The church's hierarchy was seen as a reflection of the divine and spiritual hierarchies. This was the thinking in the early Christian centuries on earth, intending to cultivate institutions on earth where the relative positions of human beings reflected the image of the hierarchies up above in the spiritual world. People then gradually lost the awareness that had remained as a memory, an historical memory, from the times of the old theocracy, when they had still known that earthly institutions were in fact a consequence of things done by the gods. Abstract concepts took the place of the living world of gods, which people had seen in the past and later on remembered. Instead of knowing that there is a world of divine, individual spirits up there, people then had abstract metaphysical concepts. There followed centuries when abstract ideas, metaphysics, took the place of the individual gods. Christians would call them angels. The divine order, which was to be reflected in the human order, had provided a theocratic element. The application of mere concepts to the order of human society provided something which, well, could only serve to maintain order in human social relationships. Where before thought was given to creating an image of the divine world in the way human society was structured, the only aim in the metaphysical age was to maintain order, punish evildoers, neither punish nor reward the good, establishing the kind of order needed to maintain the social order, when abstract metaphysical concepts had replaced the living gods, it was merely a matter of creating a human order in which people were labeled, making one the superior of the other, not because being superior was meant to reflect the relationship of an archangel to an angel, but because order was only considered possible if one person commanded and the other obeyed. Abstraction took the place of a social order that had been full of life. Essentially, this was the time of real metaphysics throughout the Middle Ages. It was the Roman mentality which essentially provided the elements for this metaphysical order which then spread everywhere. The German word Fürst remains to remind us of the theocratic order. The first because someone has to be the first just as one is the first also in the divine hierarchy. A reminder of the merely metaphysical kind of order, the order of officialdom, administrators, is the German word Graf, which is connected with Grafo, to write. The metaphysical order involves registration, maintaining order, producing documents, making contracts. Then came the more recent times. They brought disbelief in those abstract concepts, disbelief in metaphysics. People were only able to believe in anything evident to the senses, even in human life. Awareness of the traditions which had still persisted in earlier times, when traditions were living awareness of the fact that something or other was at work in social structures, originally people thought of gods, later of metaphysical concepts. 
Such living awareness no longer existed in more recent times. It has to be regained in the ways indicated through spiritual science. But the industrial age brought the total eradication of all awareness of the spiritual background to the social structure. This is why Auguste Comte and Saint Simon felt particularly connected with the industrial age, seeing that they were prepared only to accept positivist science, that is, anything connected with external, sense-perceptible, natural order of causal necessity. The concept of truth has changed completely as a result. Modern people are not yet truly sentient of the fact that the concept of truth has a history. People have no real idea of this today. People who still know themselves to be in a theocratic order did not see truth the way people do today on the authority of natural science. It is extraordinarily difficult to speak about these things. Today, one thinks that with regard to the world order, truth means that an idea is in accord with an external reality. This is because of natural science. They did not see truth like this in the early Christian centuries. Their idea of truth was different, and this other meaning of truth was largely connected with the theocratic social order. They truly did not have the idea of truth which lives in all human souls today. People fail to realize this extraordinarily important fact. It will be much easier for us to grasp the idea of truth which people then had if we connected with the idea of the ordeal. Footnote. Historically an ancient test of guilt or innocence by subjecting the accused to severe pain, survival of which was taken as divine proof of innocence. The German term for this translates as divine judgment. Footnote. End of footnote by translator. When two people enter into single combat, we need not concern ourselves with the view taken of a duel today. I'm merely giving it as an example. It cannot be decided beforehand if A will win or B. Otherwise, they'd hardly start their duel. No, the truth only emerges as the event proceeds. We still have this idea of truth today, when a war is fought. People would not go to war if everything was known beforehand as it is when an experiment is done in a laboratory, where every aspect has been considered beforehand and one knows what the result will be. People would hardly go to war if they knew the outcome in advance, as one does with a laboratory experiment. There we still have the old idea of truth, which was that the truth will only be apparent in the process, and all one can do is watch and see what the result of the ordeal will be. That was the old idea of truth. People like Auguste Comte, or today's socialists, who have completely abandoned this idea of truth, other people have not, they only think they have, only acknowledge the kind of truth where developments can be foreseen. Quote, gaining insight in order to foresee, close quote, was Auguste Comte's motto. And that is a radical reversal of the idea of truth in our time. But we can only grasp nature with this idea of truth. And people are under a colossal illusion in this respect. They think, for instance, that they are able to grasp historical life with Auguste Comte's notion of truth. But one cannot do this. Nor can one do so with the old ordeal notion of truth. But that was influenced by the life illusion. Our present-day idea of truth is under the influence of the mind being deceived. There will have to be the idea of truth developed out of anthroposophy, a concept of truth that is gained in a much more comprehensive way than the way in which Augustine, for example, arrived at his idea of truth. As I have shown, this was subject to a delusion. This is connected with many things and very much depends on it. It is not enough to speak of an evolution of the idea of truth in abstract terms. We have to know in detail how the idea of truth takes the human soul in different directions depending on the nature of this idea of truth. It is an anachronism to speak of nationality the way it could be done in pre-Christian times. 
Then it was not just that people were thinking that the divine order extended into the human order. It truly was so. Now it no longer extends into it. So, where people today cling to natural orders, to things merely brought about by birth following birth, the national principle, for instance, we are in an anachronism. People are forced today to look for different structures for their social order in post-Christian times, structures that are not determined from outside. People of earlier times were able to consider their nationality because they saw this as an institution of the divine order and saw life on earth as a reflection of the divine order. Modern man cannot venerate the nation itself as something special in the same way without falling into anachronism. We must endeavor to find different social structures. To venerate the nation as something special would lead to the aramonic deception of today. Nations are leftovers from pre-Christian times. And modern humanity must get beyond that by developing in the way which I have mentioned. We have to realize how much people are seeking a special form of the truth concept. This is important, even if it is awkward at the present time. If we are unbiased in taking the standpoint of truly grasping reality, we will have to accept many an uncomfortable truth. People are today literally moving toward the true aim of anthroposophy. The philosophy of life which had Auguste Comte as its particular representative is limited to the natural order outside. There is need to advance again into the spiritual world, and a bridge must be built between reality and ideality. This is indeed what I want to refer to particularly in these lectures. It will not happen, however, if we merely talk of these things, but only if we grasp the concrete impulses in the world. For this, we must look wholly without bias at certain facts. Strange facts are connected with the things we are now considering. Just think, yesterday I spoke to you about St. Simon and Auguste Comte. Both were only considered considering positivist science to matter, that is, anything relating to sense-perceptible life, to the causal natural order. And yet there is the strange fact that Auguste Comte turned away from St. Simon, his teacher and guide, because St. Simon had become too much of a mystic in old age. The strange fact is that St. Simon, as well as Auguste Comte, were, on the one hand, basing themselves firmly on the ground of Aramonic science, consciously basing themselves on Aramonic science in the industrial age, and then to turn mystic. Strange. It is a strange fact. We have to inquire into the why of such a fact. The why of such a fact will, however, only show itself if we take an unbiased view of the way in which human beings are seeking spirituality. Many people who, like Auguste Comte and St. Simone, intended to go only by the natural order, are moving towards spirituality. Now there is something most peculiar in the human life of more recent times. Take another fact, looking at it wholly without bias without any kind of national chauvinism, which does not become us. In the views that arise as the flower of more recent national characteristics, something is characteristic in a way which is to be found down below in these national characters. Starting from this, I'd refer you to another fact, to Bentham, very much a trend-setting English philosopher who lived from 1748 to 1832. Bentham may be said to have been characteristic of his people's way of thinking. In a sense, Bentham's way of thinking has been called utilitarian, also utilitarian in a deeper sense. There is a particular principle behind his thinking that relates to the ideal world order. This principle is usually also referred to as, quote, the greatest happiness principle, close quote. This human happiness is, according to Bentham, that the good, that is, the ideal to aim for, consisted in the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people on earth. Let us really look at this. The good is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people on earth. This is indeed a key element in utilitarian philosophy. 
we have to consider that those words have been called absolutely aramonic, not by Bentham and his followers, but by people who take the spiritual point of view. Occultists in his own country have said that Bentham produced this, in quotes, utterly devilish statement. They called it devilish, for according to those occultists, if it were the case that the good consists in the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, then evil would consist in the greatest happiness for the smallest number of people. This is not something which I myself want to present as a definition or explication. It is what people say. So on the one hand, the English philosophy of Bentham, greatest happiness. On the other hand, English spiritualists saying, Bentham's thesis is absolutely devilish, for in that case evil would, evil would mean the greatest happiness for the smallest number of people. The conclusion would be that evil and happiness could exist together, and a spiritualist cannot accept that under any circumstances. I am merely presenting a fact in cultural life which is most eminently significant for the most tremendous opposition existing between spiritualists and the outward philosophy of life in a particular area on earth. Having said that, in tomorrow's talk these oppositions will be resolved, I am ending today's talk with a succinct statement. You can take three things, Gertianism, Comptianism, and Benthamism. These relate in three different ways to humanity's spiritual striving for the future. German Gertianism, as such, has the potential to develop into spiritualism. French Comptianism, as such, that spiritualism can develop alongside it, like the strange mysticism alongside the positivist philosophy of Auguste Comte and Saint Simon. With the English utilitarianism, Benthamism, the only thing that can arise is the most severe opposition of spiritualists to the popular view. This is a fundamental part of evolution itself. French nature has to evolve in such a way that idealism and realism, mysticism and positivism, can run side by side. In England, within essential British nature, things will more and more go in a direction where the people who become spiritualists there will gradually have to fight more and more against their own national characteristics, that is, against the flowers of the philosophies of their nation. As to Auguste Comte, I am not presenting theories, but also giving you the facts, or at least some of them. When he had turned to positivism, he abandoned his teacher, St. Simon. But there was such a distinct inclination toward mysticism at the end of his life, he clearly accepted a trinity. He venerated three things, the great fetish, the great medium, and the great spirit. And as he said that the great fetish was the womb of humanity in space, space was the medium from which humanity arose as from the womb. The great spirit is humanity spread out over the earth in abstract terms. Auguste Comte acknowledged this trinity, a strange combination of positivism and mysticism. We'll say more of this tomorrow. The end of Lecture 2 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moyes, and this is Lecture 3, given on the 8th of September, 1918. First of all, I must remind you of what we were saying yesterday, and we can then take this further. Essentially, what I said yesterday was that it is not possible to gain insight into the relationship between the ideal, or also the spiritual, on the one hand, and the material in the world, on the other, the purely causal natural order, unless one takes the real nature of human sleep into account. We started by considering Augustine's thinking, the way he wanted to gain true certainty about the world in his inner experience. Today we can no longer think like that, I said, 
for the simple reason that today we must know that human sleep always refutes this idea. We could never stay with the idea in some way that the inner experiences of human beings persist after death, that these inner experiences are truly eternal. If we had to look at the time from going to sleep to waking up the way we do in our ordinary conscious awareness today. In the ordinary conscious mind of today, we see the inner experiences grow dim in sleep. We did say, however, that as soon as someone achieves the first stage of looking into the spiritual world, they find that the human eye and astral body, that is the actual human soul and spirit, are as much connected from within with the world of the angels, archangels and archai, as human beings are connected with the animal world, plant world and mineral world in their waking hours. In sleep, the world's adversary powers dim down human awareness, and we are therefore unable to realize that in our sleep we are connected with the hierarchy of angels, archangels and archai. These imbue the human eye and astral body with their own essential nature, holding and sustaining the human astral body and I. And we told how three things have come from this connection between human beings and the hierarchic spirits. The first is that even in our ordinary state of mind, we have a more or less definite feeling of being an individual person. We know ourselves to be an I. We would never do so if we had only the powers we have in our waking hours. It is like an after-effect of our experiences in sleep that during the day in our waking hours we do all the time feel ourselves to be an independent individual. This is because the angelic spirit from the spiritual world of which we are part is connected with us from going to sleep to waking up. But the archangelic spirit, or rather a number of archangelic spirits, are also connected with our soul and spirit. The after-effect of this, in our waking hours, is that we know ourselves to be members of the whole of humanity, knowing altogether that we are human beings here on earth. Every human being really has awareness of his or her independent, individual nature, even if it is not entirely distinct. Awareness that we are human is less clear-cut. We have it at the back of our mind. Some philosophers, Feuerbach, for instance, or indeed Auguste Comte, held the view that it is indeed an important discovery for human beings when they come to see themselves as human in general, as members of the whole of humanity. And we heard yesterday that Auguste Comte would speak of the Great Spirit, meaning the human being. He was, however, speaking from the point of view of ordinary materialistic science, not knowing the spiritual basis of being aware of our humanity in the background of our inner life. We would not be able to have the least idea of being human if the part of us which in sleep is separated from our physical and ether body were not wholly imbued with the archangelic spirit. Thirdly, we are imbued with the spirit of the age, the spirit from the hierarchy of the archai. Anything arising from this remains really quite dark, shadowy in our mind. Present-day humanity does not have it at all, except when people feel themselves to be part of history, the, the life of history. Oriental thinking has not at all advanced as far as this awareness of being an earthly human being. It has been the particular task of Occidental civilization to feel ourselves to be part of history, in our case, let us say, as belonging to the 19th and 20th centuries. In today's materialistic age, this does not go far beyond the year and some external historical dates. We'll hear in a minute how little this really means where real life is concerned. It needs spiritual science to make us realize how the state of the human soul changes through the millennia, how human beings change and how we now look back on earlier times. And I know that the people of the third post-Atlantean era, the Egypto-Chaldean peoples, 
had a very different constitution of soul and of their humanity from the one we have today. We have this sense of being part of the whole evolution of humanity as an after-effect of our connection with the Archai spirit during the time from going to sleep to waking up. From going to sleep to waking up, we should know that we are connected with this third spiritual hierarchy. How does our life from going to sleep to waking up, which happens every day, differ from our life between death and being born again? Every night as we go to sleep, we are putting our physical and ether body aside, provisionally, as it were, until revoked. The body is kept for us. We are then connected with the spirits of the third hierarchy. On waking, we return to our physical and ether body. The situation is different when we can no longer return, having died. Then our physical and ether body is given over to the drives of earthly change and development. Apparently so. We know that it is apparently so, having talked the other day about the fact that it seems to be so. As far as our experience goes, our physical and ether body is given over to the spheres of earth and sky. Yet, in the time between death and rebirth, we are not merely in contact with the spirits of the third hierarchy, the way we are in sleep, but we are in equally close contact with the spirits of the second hierarchy, the exousiae, or spirits of form, the dunamis, or spirits of movement, and the curiotites, or spirits of wisdom, and also the spirits of the first hierarchy, seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. As here on earth we direct our essential human nature toward the world, and in the world periphery to everything to be found in the natural worlds, so will we then be aware, not outwardly but inwardly, of the higher hierarchies, having an influence between death and rebirth. From a certain point of view, this is the difference between human sleep and death. In sleep we are directly, and also indirectly, connected with the spirits of the third hierarchy. After death, with the spirits of all three hierarchies, all the way up to the most sublime spirits. With this in mind, you'll also be able to see how human beings altogether have their place in the universe as microcosm related to the whole universe, to the macrocosm. Let us get an overview of what I have been saying. After death, our spiritual nature is inwardly connected with the spirits of the third hierarchy, those of the second hierarchy and those of the first hierarchy, just as here it is connected with the animal, plant and mineral worlds around us. When you get to know everything which the spirits of the third hierarchy do in the first place, they have other things to do as well, but we are always only talking about some aspects of things, aren't we? The spirits of the third hierarchy are single individuals, each acting on its own, but through its actions also together with others. If you bring to mind what these spirits of the third hierarchy bring about, it is, first of all, everything first of all, as I said, that happens in the historical life of humanity. You may also put it like this. No one knows anything about the reality of humanity's historical life unless they have some idea of the true nature of history, which in real terms is made not by human beings, but by the spirits of the third hierarchy. It is they, angels, archangels, and archai, who actually make history. Human beings take part in the work of this third hierarchy by gaining from it awareness of their individual nature, their humanity, of being historical entities on earth. Human beings have their place in the world because those spirits create historical life and human beings do, in turn, have their inner nature and their inner connection with historical life from these spirits historical life all around us. History, as it is generally accepted, is largely a story that has been agreed upon, a, a mere reflection of the inwardly historical life, the course of which is created by the spirits of the third hierarchy. We may now ask if the spirits of the second and first hierarchy 
also had tasks in a similar way. Speaking of the exousiae, dunamis, curiosities, spirits of form, spirits of movement, and spirits of wisdom, respectively. Well, their task was much more comprehensive. Let us leave aside their connection with humanity to begin with. You will find it easiest to consider their task if you direct your attention to your ether body. You know, of course, that when you start from your eye and move inward, you'll first of all come to your astral body. Through the astral body, you are connected with the historical life of humanity. The spirits of the third hierarchy create and influence the historical life of humanity. But when you go further, down to the ether body, you find that this ether body is a most complex entity. In present-day human life, human beings do not know much of the whole complexity on which this human ether body is based. You will get some idea of everything which has to work on this ether body if you study titled Occult Science. There you find how the ether body evolved from the whole cosmos in the successive Saturn, Sun and Moon periods, consecutive embodiments of our Earth, and how the spirits of the higher hierarchies played their part in this. To put it succinctly, we may say from a particular point of view that everything in world evolution, a more comprehensive evolution, which our ether body is connected with, just as our astral body is connected with the historical life of humanity, is created and developed by the spirits of the second hierarchy, by exousiae, dunamis, curiosities. To give you a clear picture, I'll say that the spirits of the second hierarchy do all the things that influence the human ether body. This really leads to something else again. When you wake up in the morning and enter into your ether body, you are actually entering into a creature of the spirits of the second hierarchy. You also enter into your physical body, which in the ancient mysteries was called the temple of man. Anything discovered about this in anatomy and physiology really and truly is merely the absolutely outermost envelope or shell. We can only get an idea of this utterly marvelous creation, which is the human physical body, if we know that it has been created by the spirits of the first hierarchy working together. Entering into your physical body as you wake up in the morning, you are actually entering into into the work of the most sublime hierarchies. Consider, therefore, how things are arranged in life. Here, between birth and death, we enter, on waking, first of all into our astral body, where the historical life of humanity takes effect. We also enter into our ether body, created by the second hierarchy. There, much of the cosmos, the etheric life in the cosmos, is at work. And we enter into our physical body, created by the spirits of the first hierarchy. In our life between death and rebirth, however, we are not living with the creation, but with the creators themselves. Here you have one of the marked differences in life between birth and death, and life between death and rebirth. As you enter into your bodily nature here, you are entering into all that is creature of the higher hierarchies. When you die, you enter into the hierarchies themselves. You move from the creature to the creators. That is the situation. Let us now ask, as we consider what has been said, what is the true nature of our earth? The things our ordinary geology or other sciences discover about the earth are again merely an outer shell. So what is the earth's true nature? You know that we have our physical body in common with the whole mineral world and in the waking state we are within a part of the earth. We have our ether body in common with the whole plant world and in this respect are within a second part of our earth. We have our astral body in common with the animal world, the I we have for ourselves. We are thus within the three worlds on our earth and they really make up the whole of our earth. It is the ground we stand on, as it were, not physically, but in our essential human nature. It is something that cannot be seen. It stays supersensible. 
It is the ground we stand on, and the mineral world is its lowest part. The mineral world is the lowest part of this ground we base ourselves on. You'll remember from occult science that the mineral world did not exist in earlier embodiments of our earth. The moon did not yet have a mineral world, nor did the old sun, nor indeed old Saturn. You can read it up in occult science. The mineral world only evolved on earth, the fourth stage of earth evolution. I ask you to remember this. It is a difficult matter, but it is ex- extraordinarily important. There had to be three prior stages before the mineral earth evolved. We call these three stages the three elemental realms, with the mineral world the fourth. We might also say about the earlier embodiments, during the Saturn embodiment of the earth, first elemental realm, during the sun embodiment of the earth, second elemental realm, parenthesis, the entities which were then mineral world had earlier been elemental realm, close parenthesis, During the moon period, not the present time, the old moon period, third elemental realm. The mineral world arose as the fourth realm on progression to earth. Human beings bear this within them. To be within the mineral world is to be in the fourth development. We bear this mineral world within us and it is this which makes us into visible entities. This mineral world is also the only one which is complete in us. When the earth will have come to an end, when it will have entered into another embodiment, human beings will be as complete in the plant world as they are in the mineral world today. They will then be in the fifth stage of development. I am saying that the earth will reach an end state and then arise a new Jupiter period. Human beings will then relate to the plant world the way they do to the mineral world today. They will be in the fifth development. To be in the plant world is to be in the fifth development. There will be a further embodiment of our earth. We call it the Venus stage or period. Human beings will then hold their own place in the animal world. Not be animals, but be in the animal world. As you know, this is different from being an animal. To be in the animal world is to be in the sixth development. There follows the conclusion, the seventh in musical terms, in the whole process of evolution. We call this the Vulcan embodiment of the earth. Man will then have reached the highest level of his evolution. He will finally be wholly human. To be in the human realm is to be in the seventh development. And the life of man goes through a total of seven stages of development. Let us look at present-day human beings. As we have seen, they are within the mineral world. They are not yet in the plant world. Life will be very different for them when they will be in the plant world. They will not feel themselves to be individuals, but members of the whole of humanity. They will then, for instance, find it intolerable to have a certain degree of good fortune if someone next to them is suffering misfortune. Today people feel separate from others as if they were a screen, as if there were a screen between them. This will have to be so, otherwise they would never be able to develop their individual nature. But it will be different in the Jupiter world, where human beings will be in the fifth stage of development. There they will find it utterly intolerable if one person is happy and another unhappy, for they will not feel themselves to be an organism, to put it in abstract terms. Now, they do not feel themselves to be an organism, but that is maya, illusion. A time will come, however, when human beings will be in the plant world and will be unable to bear individual good fortune if someone else is suffering misfortune. This thought is behind the feelings of the spiritualists of whom I spoke yesterday. I told you that English spiritualists will have to fight a great battle in future times against the whole of popular English culture. The evil in this culture is utilitarianism. In Bentham's case, this utilitarianism essentially led to the principle that has been called the maximum of happiness, excuse me, the maximation of happiness. This utilitarianism will fill people's minds more and more, and that is why this way of thinking will only come to be spiritualized under opposition from those who are spiritually minded. 
That is the prospect for the future. The spiritually minded will have to overcome popular culture, vanquish it to annihilation. And so I was able to tell you that Bentham arrived at his maxim out of his nation's culture, saying that the good on earth was the happiness of the greatest number of people. His worst opponents were the spiritually minded in his own country, who told him that this was a devilish definition, one which one could only produce if one thought of nothing but the present. Thinking a little of the future in evolution, one would know that it was quite intolerable to think of the happiness of the greatest number, since the opposite to this would be the happiness of the least number, and that would have to be evil. Yet evil and happiness have nothing to do with one another. Such contradistinction will be impossible in future, when human beings will feel themselves to be within the plant world, part of the whole of humanity. Today we cannot cut away an important organ in the human body, for the whole human organism would then perish. In future, when the earth will be within the plant world, it will not be possible for a particular group of people to be suffering without the whole suffering. That will be a particular stage in evolution. Bentham gave a definition of happiness that has absolutely no future, but only a present time, and this must be fought particularly by those who seek spirituality. Yes, but why is it said to be the opposite when one says, quote, good defined by Bentham as the happiness of the greatest number, evil defined as the happiness of the lowest number. These are not opposites in abstract terms the way people see it, but spiritualists do not think in abstract, but in real terms. They do not ask, quote, what is the opposite to this, but think of the reality which evolves, and that is not usually the general way of thinking. Individuals will take part in the whole to an even greater degree when they are in the sixth stage of development, and particularly so if they are wholly human, wholly spiritualized human beings in the seventh stage. We have seen from this that the way we are now on the solid ground of our earth, we do as human beings, insofar as we are creatures, really only get as far as the fourth stage of development. We have the mineral world, and this is complete. The other worlds, the way they are today, will partly perish, and human beings will develop them in a different way, the plant world as I have described it. We won't speak of the animal and human worlds today, but on another occasion. Today human beings find themselves in the fourth stage of development, when they see themselves as creature among other creatures. They do, however, project into the other stages of development, for as we have seen, human beings are under the influence of the third hierarchy, even when just asleep. This hierarchy is further advanced than they are. It is today in the fifth stage of development, and the other spirits have advanced even further. Human beings thus project into the higher stages of development. I would ask you to be patient and really think these subtle thoughts through, for you must now make distinction between thinking yourself a creature and thinking yourself the independent spirit which you are in sleep, for instance, or between death and rebirth. Insofar as you do here think of yourself in your physical, in your ether body, astral body, and I, you are thinking of yourself as a creature on earth and are in the fourth stage of development, but are projecting into the fifth, sixth, and seventh developments. As you live not just in your body, but also out of your body, in sleep or in death, you project into the other hierarchies, and those other hierarchies are more advanced. So we are able to say that if we look on the earth and everything on it, and in it as something created, then it has, as creation, developed as far as the fourth stage, and we have developed with it, also as far as the fourth stage. But since we feel ourselves to be independent individuals, human beings, feel ourselves to be part of earth evolution, Knowing that our ether body has been created by the second hierarchy and our physical body by the first hierarchy, we extend up into the other spheres, the other developmental elements. 
The seventh stage of development is not the end, however. Evolution continues. And since we project into the higher forms of development, we also project into an eighth form of development, the famous eighth sphere. It is reasonable to say that in a way we do extend to the eighth development since we extend up to highly developed levels of sublime spirits and are thus in the divine realm or the realm of the spirits, uh, call it what you will. We extend into this eighth development with the most subtle parts of our spiritual nature. This extension to the eighth development is a great secret, but we can get an idea of a very slight, I'd say, not very intensive projection into the eighth development if we consider the following. We know that the central point for earth is the mystery on Golgotha. Looking back to this mystery on Golgotha, how it happened in year 1 to 33 in our calendar, in the 747th year following the founding of Rome, we find it happened in the first third of the fourth post-Atlantean era. We refer to the time in the evolution of human civilization when it took place as the fourth post-Atlantean civilization. We know that the third period of civilization preceded the Greco-Roman period. We are now in the fifth, for the fourth in which the mystery on Golgotha took place ended in the fifteenth century. We are now in the first third of the fifth post-Atlantean period of civilization. Humanity evolves through the periods of civilization, but when we speak of them we are actually speaking of something in which human beings are not wholly involved. All of you are bound to have been incarnated in the ancient Egypto-Chaldean period, which was the third post-Atlantean age, then again in the Greco-Roman period, and now in the present one. But you only ever live through eighty years if you reach the age of eighty, all things being well, of the period. And there is a much longer period of time between your incarnations, the period from death to rebirth. Human beings thus share only part of the successive periods of earth evolution. You may say, of course, quote, ah, well, human beings only go through part of it in their physical body, but it is not for nothing that they live in a physical body. They experience the world from the standpoint of the physical body because they would not be able to have the experiences which they have in the physical body when they are between death and rebirth. Close quote. Now, Anything experienced between death and rebirth, when human beings are in the purely spiritual world, may be rated more or less highly. We won't go into this today, but it is different from the things human beings experience here through their physical bodies, always in episodes of human evolution as a whole. They would not be able to experience them if it were not for development in the living body. People have quite the wrong idea when they are ascetic about the development of the body on earth, seeing it as an enemy of the higher human being. That is not so. It is something which gives human beings something which they cannot gain in any other way. Someone who despises life in the body, considering it to be something inferior, is utterly mistaken, for it signifies something most sublime, most important in human life as a whole. Spiritual science cannot go with the mysticism or that wrong direction in Christianity, not the right but the wrong direction, where people despise what they call the mundane world. Human beings experience the world from a different angle between death and rebirth. They experience it in the way in which they are able and with now with now the creators themselves influencing them and not the creations which influence them through physical body and ether body. It is a different experience. It is because of this that we need to get to know not only the things perceived through the senses, but also the supersensible during our time on earth. We cannot get to know the historical life of humanity, which results from the efforts of the third hierarchy, from the point of view we have in life on earth. And for our time, please note that I am saying for our time, for it was not so in pre-Christian times. For our time, it is most important that human beings become aware that if they want to get to know themselves as part of history, 
whilst here on earth between birth and death, they must also come to know what the angels, archangels and archai bring about as historical life. Getting to know the world only in the way natural science, scientists seek to know it today, getting to know the world the way it is described in history, as if history were made solely by people and not by the spirits of the third hierarchy, is to get to know only the outermost layers of historical evolution. History can only be known by someone who is aware that whilst here in a physical body, he must, as it were, see what the spirits are doing on earth, which he gets to know in a very different way between death and rebirth, if I may use a term which has to be relative, personally, individually, in their heavenly deeds. We have to get to know their influence on historical life on earth. But it has not always been the way it is now, in the age in which we live. Above all, it was not like this in the third post-Atlantean era before the year 747 in Egypto-Chaldean times. We know that people's whole inner life, the whole state of their soul, was different then. Life from beyond the earth shone into ordinary human life, and people knew, though their interpretation was different from the one which we use in mythologies, that the spirits of the third hierarchy influenced their eye and their astral body. They meant the spirits of the third hierarchies, though they called them Osiris or Zeus or Apollo or Minerva or whatever. They knew that those spirits, they merely thought them out and interpreted them, but the figures thought out and interpreted actually were those spirits, had an influence. They might not have wanted to see them, but they did see them inwardly, for in those early times the mind was not deluded the way it is today. Only the delusion about life existed, anthropomorphizing those figures, as it is said. People knew of those figures, however. This is one of those points which changed the whole life of humanity. Today people do not know in their ordinary state of mind what plays into their lives. Man was born with a soul in that third post-Atlantean era was born again in the fourth post-Atlantean era and again in our time. Human beings do not perceive what the spirits of the third hierarchy bring about as historical life, but they should get to know it. They really should. The people of earlier times came to know it in its mythological form. Let us enter into such a human soul. There are more incarnations, as you know, but let us take three successive incarnations, one Egyptian, one Greek, and one from the fifth post-Atlantean period of civilization. In the third, the Egypto-Chaldean period of civilization, that soul experienced the things which it could then experience because the spirits of the third hierarchy influenced life. This gradually dimmed down. Some would still experience it in the fourth, the Greco-Roman period, Many still experienced it in the proper way, especially until the year 333 after the mystery on Golgotha. Then it gradually disappeared. People then had to limit themselves more and more to the sense-perceptible world around them, unless they went through such inner development that they came to know the spiritual world by another route and were thus able to ascend to the spirits of the third hierarchy. If we look at such a soul as it now returns again, it comes with everything it had taken in during the third post-Atlantean era in the Egypto-Chaldean period of civilization. But let us assume that such a soul refuses in the present incarnation to consider the involvement of the third hierarchy in the historical life of humanity, saying to itself, quote, What concern is it of mind what angels, archangels, and archai have done? To me, history is something which human beings have done at all times here on earth. Quote. Such a soul does not take into account that the deeds of the third hierarchy have played a part in everything human beings have done on earth. Let us now assume, for clarity's sake, for some souls it also applies with regard to the fourth era, the Greco Roman period, up to the year 333. But for clarity's sake, let us assume such a soul has come from the Egypto-Chaldean period. Then it needed no effort to know something about the involvement of the third hierarchy. 
for this was a natural part of human life, and the soul would still bear this within it. Let us say, therefore, that the soul bears within it anything which it had been able to take in at that time. You would not have been able to tell an ancient Egyptian about this historical life. He would have had no real concept of historical life, that human beings make history. He would have laughed at this, for he could see that the spirits of the third hierarchy were making the history, though he would think of them in his own inward way. In this day and age people bear all this within them, but unconsciously so. It has gone down into the subconscious. They now believe that history is something which people on earth can have made. This creates a strange state of soul, and I'd ask you to let this be very clear in your minds. Looking at such a soul in the present time, we would say that it refuses to take its place in a real way in humanity's historical life. It says, quote, I do not want to know of the involvement of the archai, archangels and angels. I only want to know from physical evidence what people have been doing from those ancient times. Close quote. But a soul cannot develop further as a result, but will in reality remain at the point where it was in ancient Egyptian times. It will have the maturity only of a soul in ancient Egyptian times. It is not prepared to take hold of reality. The angels, archangels, and archai have continued to develop. They have done the things which humanity has since been able to experience. Such a soul will say, quote, What the hierarchies have done up there in the spiritual world is something I'll not concern myself with. I'll concern myself solely with my own abilities. Close quote. Those abilities are, however, none other than those which it already had in ancient Egyptian times. Numerous such souls live in the present time. Consider the strange position such a soul is in. Up to the year 333, a soul could not get into this position, for the spiritual world was still coming in of its own accord. Now, however, souls may be in a strange position. They cannot refuse to accept reality. They are, of course, within the deeds of the angels, archangels and archai, but they deny this in their minds, accepting only the things which human beings have brought about here on earth. This is a case where people, as creatures, are in the fourth stage of development. That stage involved everything which happens in creation. Since Egyptian times, therefore, everything human beings have done on earth is part of the growth stage of development. But man himself extends beyond this. And because he has not been able to extend consciously into the realms into which he does extend, he is in his essential nature actually above the seventh stage of development. He is there within the eighth stage of development. It is possible today for souls to be actually in the eighth stage of development but fail to accept this because they do not acknowledge the work of the angels, archangels, and archai in human history. They acknowledge only the fourth stage, and so the eighth sphere remains unconscious within them. This is an extraordinarily important fact. When a soul in this position develops a philosophy of life, what will it be? The individual ignores his own reality. He does not admit that he projects into a sublime realm of the spirit, although he does, in fact, do so. He only admits that he is in the human realm. This stage of soul has only emerged clearly in the industrial age, as I have called it. It has only been since people were holy in the industrial life that they came to ignore the fact, in their philosophy of life, that human beings extend up into the spiritual world, taking account only of the outward activities of human beings. This is something significant. We cannot understand the present if we do not know that there are numerous people today who extend into the eighth sphere with their philosophy of life but ignore this fact. They cause all the damage on earth which comes about when one extends into a sphere but denies its existence. 
By denying that they extend into the eighth sphere, into the eighth stage of development, man excludes himself from the good of this stage and gives himself over to the aramonic spirit of the developmental stage concerned. His thinking becomes aramonic rather than divine or spiritual. Speaking of spiritual science, one must point to the facts, the truth of that world. The truth is that something like the materialistic view of history of Karl Marx, for instance, who lived from 1818 to 1883, his philosophy of life, is wholly aramonic. The secret of that philosophy of life is that the projection of man's spiritual nature into the supersensible worlds is ignored and that because of this the human being falls prey to the aramonic powers. As soon as human beings exclude their conscious awareness from the worlds into which they project, they fall prey to the aramonic or luciferic powers, in this case the aramonic powers. It is a fact that today very many people represent and fight for a purely aramonic philosophy of life. In doing so they evoke everything that will have to happen if the aramonic rather than the divine order spreads over the globe. Bentham's philosophy, which I spoke of yesterday, is initially an external theoretical version of this aramonic view. Marxism is another version, and is also creative, configuring, and tremendously influential. People living a middle-class life, slow to change, know nothing of this, and for decades have not concerned themselves with the elements of such philosophies which have developed in the social sphere. Marxism is an extreme version of this. It will continue to have an influence. Something which initially was meant to be just knowledge will be happening in life to be absolute reality. Only one thing can be a help in this situation, and that is insight, insight which generates a will to act. Truths like these mean radical changes and are definitely not suitable for making your Sundays more exciting. Truths like these are deep down, connected with the whole of present cultural life. Much will depend on people being prepared to consider the things that live in their thoughts in connection with the whole world order. For we have now entered into the cycle of time where we will not progress without getting into horrific disasters unless we realize how something which happens within the human being relates to developments in the whole cosmos. Truths like these, when you find them in your search for truth, you can be assured of this, will be rather a shock at first. If you have a feeling for the way in which great truths bring great change in the world, you will also know the shock they may be. Only superficial minds might think that it does not shock one to have to say, quote, Araman is pulsating through people who many others thought, close quote, and it was, of course, also true, continue, quote, were honestly endeavoring to discover the truth, close quote. It touches the heart, my dear friends. And when such truths are found, one tries to cope with them. They are not made to go in one ear and out the other nor are they made to be found in solitary meditation and accepted as sensational. None of these truths are for such purposes. One has to cope with them. One must be able to discover how world evolution, as it is called, being there all around one, also in people's opinions, is in accord with the existence of such truths. Someone like myself, who has seen how many people today people can nowadays convince themselves of this through external facts, live with Marxism or Marxism-type views, will certainly consider it necessary to go more into these things. There one will often say to oneself, quote, perhaps you are nevertheless under an illusion, close quote. We need not put the whole of the spiritual world into immediate doubt, of course not. But when it comes to such concrete truths, one does often say to oneself, quote, maybe you are under some kind of illusion here, close quote. The profound sense of responsibility concerning truth must of course arise particularly when they are spiritual truths. One then tries to go deeper and deeper. In fact, however, there are not few but very many things that provide dreadful confirmation of what I have just been presenting 
as the aramonic nature of Marxism, for instance, and similar philosophies of life. A while ago, when I was speaking to you, I did rather challenge you. I said that time, as we experience it, is really a delusion and is in reality something quite different from people's experience. This, I said, was so because people did not see time in perspective. They experience space in perspective. Trees that are further away look smaller than those nearby. We really must see time in perspective as well. Events further away in time must be seen differently from those closer to the present. The basis for this is that time truly is what investigators have always thought it to be, the most important medium for deceiving humanity. We imagine that the spirits of the higher hierarchies also move through time the way our own inner life does. This is untrue. In reality, the essential nature of the higher hierarchies lies in times past, but they exert their influence from times past. Just as in space it is possible to have a distant influence using light signals or the like to influence others who are are not too far away. Time is not what people think it is, nor is it what philosophers like Kant consider it to be. In reality, time is something quite different. Human beings think it is real, but it is another maya, a great delusion. Above all, Things which we think in our delusion about time to be in the past actually continue to exist. Time truly turns into something rather like a space. To see things as they really are, one does not look on past events the way one does at objects in space. Time deceives us. We know from spiritual science that the wellsprings of other great delusions in human philosophies of life arise because of the illusion about time. If there were any physicists among you, I would be able to use the language of physics here. I would be able to show you, using physical formulas, that when physicists use time, T in short, in their formulas, that time is just a number, something quite unknown therefore, not anything real but quite unreal. Only velocity is always real. But physicists see velocity as a consequence of time, You are not physicists, however, and unlikely to put your minds to this, and so I will not go into this any further. Time is delusion, which is a truth of great import. For the fact that time is delusion is the basis of many other delusions in life. We see everything the wrong way. For example, if we use time in the wrong way with regard to history. People tend to think that certain things that happened in the first three Christian centuries are now in the past. In reality, they ought to think, quote, the archangel or the spirit from the hierarchy of the archai, which guided events at that time, is still here. This continues to have an effect in another way, close quote. Being past and gone is a delusion. Much depends on this, excuse me, much depends on it that we get to know the perspective nature of time when it comes to spiritual reality. Knowing that we have to be deceived about events in time just as, not believing this, we are deceived about events in space unless we allow for perspective. Just think how great the delusion would be if you were not to accept perspective. Considering something distant in space to have the same power to affect you as something close by. You are looking at a distant mountain. Your health depends a great deal on the air around you and not on the air on the distant mountain. If you want that air to improve your health, you'll have to go there. Essentially, reality has to do with perspective when it comes to reality in life. And it is the same with regard to time. We are living in the right way in the present time if we do not think that events in the more distant past carry the same weight as more recent events. If we consider the Egypto-Chaldean period in the third post-Atlantean era, limiting ourselves to surviving documents and record them the way history written by fools does, the agreed-upon fable which they call history today, we are making the mistake in perspective. It really is of no significance in the present day what people did in Egyptian times. 
But the things which the angels, archangels, and archai did, those are important. This will only emerge, however, if we use perspective. It is therefore a basic principle in spiritual investigation, not only today, when we have to rediscover all these things, but it has always been a principle that time as such is maya. No one who knows the true nature of time has ever reckoned with time in such a way that it was taken to be true, that time itself was taken to be a genuine reality. The strange thing which emerged was that Karl Marx, I have spoken of him, and millions swear by him today, though more or less in nuances, more or less in formulas, but that does not matter. Karl Marx tried to answer the question, quote, what are the things of true value for humanity? What is it that is truly achieved in humanity? Close quote. He answered this question in an extraordinarily original way, for it had never been answered like this before. People had always looked at true value in some other way, not the way Karl Marx did. People would consider things to be of value to humanity, let us say, according to whether they had to be transported through long distances, if much intelligence had been needed to find them, etc. I once tried to explain this to you by saying that human labor must also be considered in qualitative terms, and one must altogether look at it in a very concrete way. We consider the engineering marvel of the St. Gotthard Tunnel. No one can build, build such a tunnel unless they know differential and integral calculus. Differential and integral calculus was invented by Leibniz, or, if this makes the English more happy, by Newton. The two of them were in dispute over the invention. We may say, therefore, that Newton or Leibniz also worked on the St. Gotthard Tunnel. It certainly could not have been built without them. One has to put quite a different value on the work of Newton or Leibniz than one would on the work of someone who put one stone on another in the tunnel. This is a point to be considered in putting a value on human work, something of value for humanity. The theory of the value of human labor has taken different forms. Values have been put on labor, something of value in life, from all kinds of different points of view, but never in the way in which Karl Marx did it. He included just one element in his theory of value. To him, everything that had value in human life had value only because it was condensed time, especially condensed working hours. The economic value, the value in the world economy, was measured in whether it could be produced in three, six, or twelve hours. A major part of Marx's theory was based on this. The theory is so widely accepted today that you may find that when a member of a higher class is speaking about labor from his point of view, a worker will get up, a real socialist, and say, Please read it up in Karl Marx. He would not have to look, have the book with him, of course. Page 374, and there you'll find this or that. To judge life, we must really know it, or we will find there are constant surprises with one thing happening or another. The things that happen arise from impulses in the human soul. However, if one cares as little as people have in recent decades, have been caring, about what was really happening deep down in the human soul, one should not be surprised when the whole finally collapses and one faces disaster. I have been saying these things for a particular reason. It was the first time that very original something, which is but the source of deception, was made the measure of all economic values, time in form of working hours. Take this from the standpoint of a higher perspective. People with insight into reality have always known that time is deceptive. Now someone comes along and says, quote, but the things that are of value in the world have only as much value as the condensed working hours in it. Close quote. Surely this means, in other words, quote, your reality is therefore illusion and only condensed time for labor has real value. Close quote. The people who want to be wholly materialistic only basing themselves on reality, make the deception into reality, even in the form which they give to time, and reality is overlooked. This is just one example. I could give you many examples of things that are a comfort when one is taken aback by truths 
which strike like rolls of thunder if one has a heart for the life of humanity. But when one then studies these things in detail, when one focuses on someone like Karl Marx, knowing that his spirit was an Aramanic influence, and asks him, quote, how does this go in detail, close quote, one will indeed arrive at the Aramanic element and feel that these are truths one may admit to oneself. Basically, it is not easy to have to say to oneself that everything that is anachronism in the world today is coming into our world because people take a position which is outside the spiritual world and which then becomes the eighth sphere for them, and because they take the world only from the creature point of view. Here you will indeed realize in all its gravity what it means when I stress over and over again that it does not matter at all if someone speaks of something beautiful, something one is able to accept. What matters is what actually becomes of those good things said. Again and again I have to draw attention, you know I am not saying this from some kind of silly vanity, to the fact that it does not matter what the thoughts are which we have in mind, but that we take care to see what effect these thoughts then have. You may have a truly marvelous thought, but if you have no idea of what effect that thought has in real terms, then it may well have the opposite effect. I have been trying to make this clear for years, giving examples. One example was in a lecture I gave at the beginning of the twentieth century. I said, I am summing up in a few words what was a full exposition at the time, merely to illustrate my point, that more people than ever are today pacifists, talking most beautifully of guidance for humanity from their pacifist point of view. Pacifism has really never before had so many followers as today. That is what I said at the beginning of the century. I went on to say that this was a definite sign that we were about to enter into the greatest war humanity had ever known. To think as unrealistically about human situations, the way people did there, considering the subject of those thoughts only, having little awareness of the true effect of the thoughts that live in the soul, an effect one can only truly grasp by considering the whole world, that was not the way in earlier times. People are only doing so in an age when all those things of which we have been speaking are spreading. Why is it that something can actually set the tone for many people, which is no more than thought content, but completely unrealistic, something which can never have anything to do with actual events? Thus Woodrow Wilson's thoughts, no different from thought content in Egypto-Chaldean times, the thoughts of someone who does not care that there is spiritual reality in history, but merely develops a sequence of abstract thoughts. Why is this so? It is because of all the special characteristics of our time. Future historians will have to attach the name Woodrow Wilson to everything our time has produced by way of unrealistic thoughts which have had the opposite effect. It is this which seriously affects our philosophy of life which has to have that effect. And we must not look at it as relating to today and tomorrow, but as something we have to look at in the light of the whole of cosmology, from the point of view of having been put in that situation. Answering such questions from the point of view which arises from a world-wide view will judge someone like Woodrow Wilson not from sympathies or antipathies, but in a truly objective way. The anachronism is that many people today cannot go into this because it is uncomfortable to look things in the face. You cannot look things in the face without going into them more deeply. It has to be said that people who do not relate to historical life today are ignoring the actual history brought about by the third hierarchy. They, therefore, have nothing to do with the real impulses when they speak, but essentially are dealing only in the empty husks of words. A basic requirement in our time is that we get to know and understand that when we have the best and most beautiful ideas, perfectly adequate to explore the natural world all around us, we'll still never understand anything connected with history. History does not proceed the way natural life does. History proceeds through the activities of higher spirits. This has to be added to the other philosophies of life. 
Humanity lived with theocracy when people still remembered the way the theocratic order extended to their life in the past. Then came the metaphysical age, essentially developing official administrative systems in the whole world. Then came the purely materialistic age, the age of industrialists. This would take humanity into irreality where the spirit is concerned, if it were not for the counterbalance of finding one's way again into all that is real and genuine. Though one can only contemplate this if one is able to rise to something which is hidden from people in ordinary life, in the present time cycle. We have to learn to speak of supersensible things again if we want to speak of history. People talked a lot about historical ideas in the 19th century. Well, we all know that you can't fell a tree with ideas. The followers of Ranke and similar historians do, however, believe that humanity's historical life is brought about by ideas. It will have to be realized that this time, the merely metaphysical time, also has to be overcome. Otherwise, a philosophy will prevail that is wholly limited to things perceived through the senses. Humanity must work to come to the spiritual. They will only be able to do this if, to begin with, they at least work their way from the unreal history of sequence in time to the real process, which I'd say is particularly tangible behind the reality outwardly perceived by the senses in the case of history. People will then no longer produce social programs or the like based on ideas that relate merely to outwardly apparent life. They will once again proclaim their social programs that arise from the revelations of the spiritual world. The programs people to produce today differ a great deal from those revelations that come from the spiritual world. We'll speak of this next time. I'll continue these contemplations next Friday. They cannot be taken to their conclusion that quickly. The end of Lecture 3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity, and the Mystery of Evil. Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moise. This is Lecture 4, given on the 13th of September, 1918. I am going to continue with the theme which we have been considering for some weeks, but in a more aphoristic way. I have always told you that the great problem, when it comes to philosophies of life, is now, and I have always stressed the now, that with the views that are generally held, people find it difficult to build a bridge between the approach known as idealism and what we may call the view taken of the natural order of things. When modern people try and build such a bridge by seeking to understand how moral ideas, for instance, to take just one group from the sum of ideas, relate not outwardly but inwardly and in real terms to the views and concepts people develop on the progress of causal natural order. They end up in a kind of philosophical dualism, as we might call it from the spiritual scientific point of view. This is something we've been stressing over and over again. People try to build such a bridge, but they do not succeed. We'll find it easier to look at things relating to this question if we compare this dualism of the present day with something similar which existed in pre-Christian times. It was something which we might call fatalism. Until the second and third centuries before Christ, and later even more so, though it came to be more and more anachronistic, people were literally compelled to take a fatalistic view. Essentially, fatalism was also the basis of Greek philosophy. In more recent times, all fatalism has really been anachronistic. It is out of place in the present age. We might say that the ancients were seduced into fatalism. People of more recent times, and particularly the present, were and are seduced into dualism. 
Let us be clear in our minds why the ancients could so easily submit to fatalism. We know that the state of mind of human beings has changed radically in the course of evolution, and it is superstition to assume the kind of successive evolution which is assumed in common or garden-variety Darwinism, for instance. The state of mind has radically changed, and history is here, more than anywhere else, a fable that has been agreed upon. The ancient's state of mind was such that they never really saw nature the way we do today. And on the other hand, things of mind and spirit were not as conceptual, based on ideas, as they are today. The idea which the ancients had of nature was that they amalgamated nature and spirit in their mind. For the spiritual, they took images from developments in nature to form their ideas. The ancient teachings of the gods were myths fully imbued with ideas taken from the natural world, perceived through the senses. Speaking of nature, the ancients would not use the dry, abstract terms we use today, but speak of elemental spirits that sustain and bring about the phenomena of nature. This was not because they expressed themselves in a very childlike way. It was because they saw things in a real way, because of a very real state of mind. People of old did not see nature the way we do now, which is under the influence of modern science, even for those of us who are not scientists. They did not see it in the abstract way, wholly in accord with ideas, in which we have to see it today. In this mingling of nature and spirit, they induced their own fatalism. For with natural phenomena, imbued with the activities of spirits, as recently described, all life was, of course, intentional in the outward way in which human actions are intentional. It was an image, but the people of old had no other image, and that inevitably led to their deceptive fatalism. A different state of mind evolved in time. We have characterized the change in the state of mind from all kinds of different angles. Today we'll look at it from a quite particular point of view. Let us consider the question which we shall however, only be able to answer on the basis of everything which we have been considering in the last lectures. What, objectively, do people see when they follow the natural order? And what, objectively, do people think up in their minds when they speak of spirit today? I am now not saying that we speak of spirit in spiritual science. I am speaking of the way in which people in general are today speaking of spirit, with more or less of one or another nuance. We know that even those who are not theoreticians, we'll leave the theoreticians aside, will, in wanting to understand the natural order, arrive instinctively at the way in which substances and forces work. I am now not speaking of natural scientific theories of substances and forces, but of how simple the average person today quite instinctively imagines nature to be, basing his view of natural phenomena on processes which are material and rich in forces. This is where people are taken into an illusion. We know this if we look at these things, investigating them in a truly objective way. For everything that can be said about the nature of matter and forces in that case, is illusion. This is not entirely due to faulty thinking. It is simply due to the present state and constitution of the mind. We are no longer speaking of maya or illusion as people did in Indian philosophy, for instance. For in ordinary life we have no insight into the real facts. We have no insight into the real facts and are therefore really always under an illusion when visualizing nature. This is the one thing. The other is this. How do people see the spirit today? This is something which is very much adrift in abstractions. 
You will find this easier to see if you take one particular philosophy or another. It does not really matter at all which one you take. You can take one that offers a confusing play of words like Oikens, or one resting on more sound foundations like Liebmann's, or you can consider one which is more to the popular taste, like Schopenhauer's, and so on. People speak of the spirit in today's philosophies. If those philosophies are not purely positivist, like Comte's, which we got to know the other day, if they are not materialistic, the philosophers will at least speak of spirit. But what do the philosophers speak of, calling it spirit, in the present state of mind? Assuming a certain substantial and force-related order, and running it like a net through the phenomena of nature, people make their view of nature into an illusion. In the same way, everything said about the spirit, from the generally accepted point of view today, is essentially an hallucination, and the accepted philosophies are really only a sum of unrecognized hallucinations. Basically, people are constituted in such a way today that in their minds they are adrift between illusion, when they look at nature, and hallucination, when they consider the spirit. What philosophers dream about the spirit, seeking to construe a certain view of it from nothing but concepts, is really just a sum of subtle hallucinations. Subtle, yes, but nevertheless, hallucinations. These are forms that arise from the inner human being, for reasons which we won't go into today, and as such do not really have anything to do with reality. I have, on quite a few occasions, drawn your attention to phenomena from the world of facts, which clearly show that all the things people may have in their minds need not have much to do with reality. To make my point, I pointed out that a whole number of philosophers are naive enough today to say that human beings must be considered to be made up of body and soul. Even the world-famous philosopher of Wundt is about body and soul, the opinion being that it is free from prejudice. But what is the whole of Wundt's philosophy? I have spoken of this before. Or what are other philosophies in general, in reality? It merely implements what was agreed on at the Eighth General Council held in Constantinople in 869. That one must not, this is approximately how the definition of the resolution goes, in speaking of the human body refer to body, soul, and spirit, but that the spiritual was merely a quality of the soul principle, and it was only permissible to speak of body and soul. The trichotomy of body, soul, and spirit was considered heresy throughout the Middle Ages. Theological philosophers would quake in their boots when they, when reality forced them even just to hint at body, soul, and spirit, for that would be heresy. Philosophers are subject to this view to this day. They merely follow the dogma established at that council in Constantinople and they believe themselves to be free from prejudice when in truth they are implementing a resolution by the council. We have to consider things without illusion. We must look at reality. Our young students are everywhere in philosophy learning something that was decided on at the council of Constantinople. Now, I certainly am not saying that the things taught today are a direct consequence or effect of that resolution. The dogma established at the Eighth Council in Constantinople was in turn only thoughts expressing more profound changes that lay hidden below the surface and are still in progress today. All who want to establish dogma, be they the good philosophers at the Council of Constantinople or the good professors at today's universities. All those tissues of concepts are essentially mere conceptual hallucinations that rise up in human beings and have so little reality to them that the underlying reality cannot be truly grasped. The sole constitution of modern man is such that he is swinging to and fro, as it were, 
between the hallucinatory nature of his concepts and the illusory way in which he sees the natural world. He is therefore in danger of falling into dualism. He'll always be in danger of being able to take any ideas he is able to think up only into the hallucinatory sphere of concepts that do not come close to reality, or take anything he thinks up concerning nature only into the illusionary sphere of views on nature, which also has nothing to do with true reality, but is illusion. Human beings simply are not made to discover truth, as they call it, a word directly, to find it easily, I'd say. They have to start with something which in life can bring dichotomy, doubt, skepticism, and then penetrate to the truth. In the present cycle of evolution, human beings are compelled to rise from that to and fro between the hallucination of philosophy and the illusion of their view of nature to the true reality, to genuine reality. Now we might ask, I am of course speaking more or less in aphorisms, and it will need the whole to see the connection. Quote, what may we say is the most immediate reason why the people of old fell more into fatalism and humanity of more recent times are more liable to fall into dualism when it comes to their philosophy of life. Close quote. We are in danger of this when we give ourselves up to mere play with concepts or we might today also say mere dialectics. You will, of course, object. Quote, Modern man, with its sense of reality, is not at all made to fall into mere play with concepts. Close quote. Ah, but you are quite wrong. Future ages, when our own age will be seen more objectively, will realize that such inclinations to play with mere concepts, to theorize, never existed more for humanity than they do at the present time. Today people like to escape reality, turning to mere play with concepts. But when you leave reality and start to twist and turn your concepts, to link them, separate them, the moment you have moved away from reality, you are indeed in danger of either fatalism or dualism. What matters, and what we must develop for ourselves today, is a sense of reality. I have often emphasized this from various points of view, and must do so again. It is not exactly easy to develop a sense of reality, especially also when it comes to spiritual things. It is particularly when it comes to spiritual things that we are caught up more than we think in mere play of concepts, in playful dialectics. Something which seems to be external illusion is very apt to encourage illusory notions as soon as it plays into the moral and spiritual life. People will always seek to theorize on certain things. They seek to theorize on good and evil, on freedom or necessity. When it comes to the most important questions in life, we may say, people are really dreadfully inclined to give themselves up to mere play of concepts, of words. When you come across discussions on philosophies of life, somewhere or other, it all tends to be just within conceptual dialectics. What is more, people deceive themselves by thinking that they have concepts when in reality they cannot have concepts at all. Side by side with the concepts they also have their sympathies and antipathies for certain concepts and, uh, and against others. It is according to their sympathies and antipathies that people create one or another conceptual complex for themselves. I won't go into this, however. In the great majority of discussions which are a play on concepts in form of questions, people do not concern themselves with reality. To be clear about what is meant here, let us take a fact often met with in life. Hatred. The existence of hatred. One wants to explain such a thing as the existence of hatred in human nature. People very often try to explain this and similar things, by merely playing around with concepts. Hatred exists as a mental phenomenon, a psychological reality. Yet going into these things one soon finds that certain concepts one develops with regard to this do not really capture every nuance of the hatred phenomenon. 
We can only understand such things if we try to get from the world of illusion to the world of true reality. Hatred is something which enters into the human soul from a deeper world of reality. So one has to ask oneself, quote, This hatred, is it the same in the world of reality as it is when it presents itself in the human soul? Close quote. If it is something different in the world of reality than it is in the human soul, we shall soon realize that we, evidently, will not arrive at a spiritual view of it if we merely come to know the hatred in the human soul. If one looks for hatred in the cosmos, using the methods of spiritual science, now not in the individual human being, for hatred enters into the individual human soul, if one looks for it in the cosmos, it will be something completely different. The element which comes to realization as hatred in the human soul is also to be found out there in the cosmos. One merely must not be deceived into looking for the kind of forces of nature which the illusion in modern science is looking for. One must look into the reality that lies behind nature. There one does find the equivalent of the hatred. But in the cosmos this hatred is something which differs greatly from what it is in the human soul. In the cosmos hatred is a power without which individualization could never happen. There could be no separate identities, human or otherwise, if the power of hatred did not exist in the cosmos. I am not speaking of the illusion of atoms repelling one another, but of something real. Hatred does arise in the cosmos, but there it must not be judged morally the way it is when it enters into the human soul. In the cosmos, hatred is a power behind all individualization. The whole world would otherwise blur into a single whole, which is what nebulous pantheists desire. No entity would stand apart differentiating itself, if the principle did not prevail throughout the cosmos, which human beings initially do not see in the cosmos, though it plays into the human soul, assuming the particular form which we come to know there as hatred. Now the question arises, how does humanity relate to this cosmic principle? I did already hint at this in one particular respect. Today we'll add to this in an aphoristic way. When discerning philologists, philology has also been made abstract today and has grown mediocre, but when discerning philologists studied the languages found among the Native Americans, when, in quotes, civilized people, I am putting this in quotes, had reached America and discovered the Native Americans, the more discerning philologists found that the languages of those people showed a remarkably transparent logic. There were many languages, as the philologists assure us, and as is indeed true, where the finer points of Spanish and Italian are to be found in the development and differentiation of those languages. Such things were found among the natives of Greenland. Undoubtedly those natives did not have the intellect of which modern man is so proud. This modern intellect also would not get very far if it took up the development and creation of languages. There is plenty of evidence of what the modern intellect comes to if used to be creative in language. Objective common sense did indeed rule in human souls that were still native and had not yet developed the modern intellect. I did the other day show you how objective common sense prevailed in language creativity. The common sense which prevailed there did not yet come to human beings who were as highly individualized as today's worldly rationality is. It came to human beings who were less individualized at the time, less separate in their identity, influencing them more as cosmic rationality. In those early times, people were not the savages of whom modern anthropology creates illusory ideas. They were part of a whole organism, metaphorically speaking, of course and came to be individualized bit by bit. They were members of a whole organism, and did still give expression to cosmic rationality, 
or common sense, or we might also say that cosmic rationality came to expression in them. There you have a definite indication of how the cosmic principle influences the human soul. You can also transfer it to a special phenomenon, such as cosmic hatred, which finds its way into the human soul. We know that in the spiritual sphere it will be necessary to speak of certain polarities, much as we do in the sphere of nature. How did that cosmic rationality which we have in language come about? Humanity is no longer creative where language is concerned. Only remnants of this are to be found today. How did that cosmic rationality enter into the human soul? How did it become individual? Seeking to answer this question, we come to everything we call aramonic. How does something like the phenomenon of hatred enter into the human soul from the cosmos? There we arrive at the Luciferic principle, which is the polar opposite of the Aramanic. People feel embarrassed to speak of Araman and Lucifer today, but do not feel embarrassed to talk of positive or negative electricity or positive or negative magnetism. The fact that they feel embarrassed is due to a modern superstition. Even if it is clearly understood that this fact exists, that spiritual entities, things of a spiritual nature, did indeed enter on the one hand as the Luciferic principle in such elements as hatred, or as the Aramanic in things such as language, or also thinking. We must, on the other hand, also clearly understand the significance of things in the world at large. When my view of hatred is that I call it the basis for the great beginnings, that there can be individualization, separation, that we do not have everything in one great original stew, I am referring to the phenomenon, the fact of hatred, in the far distant past, in a past when man did not yet exist in his present form. I am referring to a very, very far distant past. I am giving you a view of hatred as it was in a far, far distant past when the human being had not yet differentiated out from the rest of the world order. We might speak of the different realms of nature, know how they developed into mineral, vegetable, animal, and human worlds. You only need to read my occult science and outline. We can speak of these natural worlds, if we do so wholly in terms of their reality and not the illusion, then the power of hatred lives in all of it, but in the way I have shown you, as cosmic hatred. There came a time in evolution when something which otherwise is general cosmic fact played into the human soul. It entered into the human soul through Luciferic Aramonic powers. It was then in the human soul taken out of the cosmic, the cosmic as it had developed from earlier times to this day. Making a dream, excuse me, making a diagram of the cosmic principle from the past to the present moment is a picture We know, having talked so much about the law of the conservation of energy or of matter, a law which in fact does not exist, that anything which is real in a purely natural way in the present, including matter, will come to an end. We know that anything which today has a here and now that can only be seen in the spirit is the seed also for future matter or substance. Taking the spiritual view, we have to say that everything which is now order of the past has flowed from the spiritual. Everything which has thus flowed out will come to an end. The order of the future will only flow from the spiritual henceforth. It could never become fixed natural order if there were such a thing as conservation of energy and of matter. The most powerful of all superstitions ever to have existed is that there is conservation of matter and of energy. The spiritual, which today makes itself known only in thoughts, is the seed for the natural order of the future, just as the small seed of a plant, which only makes itself known in a small way, in the present year's plant, will be the plant of the following year. 
This means that man himself fits into the world order in a conflicting way. Our attention is drawn to man in this conflict when we seek to understand the whole situation. When, above all, we want to find the transition from cosmic hatred to the hatred in the individual soul, the hatred which shows itself in human nature. As you know, when we look at a human being before us, we are able to say, forming ideas, feeling, and acting out of the will, that is his nature. He shows himself to us to have idea-forming, feeling, and will-based nature, and these make up a whole. But all the beautiful things said about this in philosophy will not get us anywhere unless we are also able to make clear and accurate distinctions. Even the sharp-witted psychologists of our time are beginning to realize that we don't really know anything much about acting out of the will. I've explained to you how we act out of the will. For today, it is enough to indicate that present-day psychologists also have to say to themselves that we don't know much, really, about acting out of the will. Even when awake, human beings really sleep through the way they act out of the will such being its essential nature. We might also say that human beings do not reach down as far with their souls as acting out of the will. They believe, I spoke of this as a concrete fact when discussing Augustine, that they are right within their essential nature when they form ideas. It is not something they can say, however, when it comes to acting out of the will. In waking life, people know as little about the way in which some intention connects with even just the complicated mechanism of a hand movement or of the legs walking as they know about their living body or their environment when they sleep. Acting out of the will is something we sleep through at the present time. When we use the methods of spiritual science and penetrate from mere idea to action, we learn from the fact though these are spiritual facts, how it happens that human beings sleep through the way they act out of the will today. We'd really be in a very bad way with our thinking, our intellect, if it were not for the other circumstance which I have mentioned and which I'll shortly consider in more detail. We'd really be in a very bad way with our thinking, for basically it is always childlike where our essential human nature is concerned. In the course of life between birth and death, our thinking gains some knowledge about the immediate present in the world, nothing about past and future, or at most some hypotheses, though these do immediately fall apart if one gets really serious about them. This thinking is indeed the seed for the future. Just as a plant seed is something which does not really have much significance today, but will at best have next year, so does our thinking today have no value in real terms. It relates to what could be in real value the way a child does to an adult. Read that again. It relates to what it could be in real value the way a child does to an adult. Thinking is really wholly made for the future, but only what is going to become of it will have real significance in future. The actual content, the substance of thinking, only has seed value today. However, if we use spiritual science to enter into will-based action, seeking to perceive the subject of it, it is just an activity, but seeking to perceive the subject of our own will-based action, it will be something which bears within it awareness of the most far distant past, of the cosmic past. You will never understand world evolution using only the intellect unless you enter into will-based action with vision in images, inspiration, and intuition. It is only in the human will to act, which at the same time builds up the whole human organism, that we find a subject which holds the memory of the cosmic past, just as you have memory of your ordinary life. The difference between the human intellect and the human will to act is that the human intellect will, at best, only develop a memory for one's individual, personal life. The will to act, out of the reach of the human intellect, 
holds the memory of the cosmic past. Human beings bear the memory of the cosmic past in them, but without spiritual scientific investigation, they cannot reach it with their intellect. We may say, therefore, that on the one hand, human beings have the will to act as a faculty, bearing within them, figuratively speaking, the memory of the cosmic past. As intelligent beings, they bear within them only the present, for the intellect is but seed for the future and not yet present for the present. Excuse me, and not yet something for the present. I'll read that again. As intelligent beings, they bear within them only the present, for the intellect is but seed for the future and not yet something for the present. With reference to the will to act, the human intellect is just like the tiny seed in relation to the whole plant. Having the will to act faculty, we are, as cosmic spirits, based on the whole of the past because we are individuals. As intelligent human beings, we are in the present and we prepare to grow into the future. Our will to act faculty may thus truly be said to relate to the intellect the way a very old person does to a child. The human being with the will to act relates to the thinking human being the way a very old person does to a child, with the necessary extension of time, of course. What can balance this out? Cosmic common sense, which I have earlier and on many occasions called the Aramanic principle, influences the thinking human being. If we had to depend on ourselves as human beings without Araman's influence, the situation for our intellect would be very different at the present time. The Roman Catholic Church might be highly satisfied with a humanity that had only the measure of the intellect which today arises from human nature itself, relative to the potential which man has in the whole cosmos, this intellect is childlike, just as our will to act is very old indeed. The Aramanic principle influences our thinking, and our thinking cannot be thought of in evolution without the involvement of the element of speech, for instance. The Luciferic principle influences our will to act. The Aramanic principle penetrates us by winding our intellect, which in evolution as a whole is still relatively weak and childlike, up higher and higher to a certain sun height. But there is also the other side of the coin. We have an intellect which is not really arising from us. We have an intellect which we might roughly compare not to a plant which rises from the ground and then has the seed, but to a plant which has another plant set upon it, which does not bear seed but is another plant, another more perfect plant. Our intellect is arranged, organized, harmonically. Because of this it tends to blind us, as spiritual scientists, we do not, of course, say that we should not use this intellect, seeing that it is aramonic. It is merely that one must look at things without illusion, be clear that the human intellect is a powerful light and may shine even more strongly than the intellect which is coming forth from human nature today is able to do. The intellectual principle can deceive human nature placing things into a certain sphere for them where they are dazzled. When human beings use their intellect to cast light on this, it is like a blinding light. And it is really because of this that human beings make things into illusion. Just as the Aramanic principle influences the intellect, so does the Luciferic principle influence our will to act, so that it goes to sleep really goes to sleep. The Aramanic principle enlightens our seed-like intellect. The Luciferic principle lulls, puts to sleep our will to act, subject which really bears the memory of the whole past in it, with the result that people know nothing of that past. This, taken at a somewhat deeper level, is the basis for dualism in man. The dualism must be bridged but cannot be bridged if we turn merely to theories. 
We have to turn to the facts themselves, the facts of spiritual life, knowing that our intellect has a different prime origin in the world than our will to act. The situation with them is like having a child and a very old person standing side by side. We would be artificially deceiving ourselves in setting up the abstract notion, in quotes, man, which really is nothing but an abstraction, and in saying, quote, the child is a human being and the very old person is a human being, close quote. Such concepts suit people today because they mix everything up. Thus the soul is said to be uniform today, thinking that as such it has the same prime origin as intellectual thinking and a loving will to act. But, as I have just been indicating, we must make distinctions if we really want to understand the human being. The philosophy of life we think up, using only the intellect, will therefore never get anywhere near reality. It remains hallucination, for it arises from an intellect filled with a spirit that is not of this world, with the Aramanic spirit which does not belong in the world order, which we behold with our eyes. The same holds true in its own way for the will to act, for this is filled with Luciferic spirit. People have always had a feeling for this or given expression to it. Hardly anyone realizes, for instance, that in the Old Testament there is already some idea at least of this polar opposition of Aramonic and Luciferic. I am saying it not I am saying it is not much realized because people will nicely read chapter after chapter in the Bible and there too make no distinction. No distinction is made between the book of Job and the Pentateuch, five books of Moses. Yet the distinction between those books does give a first idea of the polar opposition between Aramonic and Luciferic, which we need to grasp. Moses poses the question as to the evil in human nature. That is, if I may put it like this, how cosmic hatred, human hatred, influences human beings. Moses inquires, Moses inquires into evil. He then presents the fall in a magnificent picture. We know that hidden behind the fall is the entry of the Luciferic principle into human nature. Then a certain consequence is connected with Moses' view that really all misfortune and even death is due to this human sin, or pre-human sin, if you prefer. We may say, therefore, that misfortune and death are the consequence of sin. The book of Job presents the radically opposite view. In the first place, you do not have a serpent, but a purely spiritual entity, an Aramonic spirit approaching the divine spirit. And in Job, we do not have someone like Adam, who is capable of falling into sin, but indeed someone who is said to be, quote, perfect and upright, close quote. How does the spirit, how, how does that spirit, who approaches God, want to achieve his aim of having Job fall into sin by bringing misfortune upon him. It is exactly the opposite. This spirit wants to bring misfortune on Job so that he will fall into sin. The misfortune has come and misfortune is said to lead to sin. According to Moses, misfortune comes from sin. In the book of Job, sin comes from misfortune. Views are in radical opposition in the more pagan book of Job and the Jewish book of Moses. But, as I said, people read one thing after the other and do not pay attention. Today it is absolutely necessary that people are not misguided into the idiotic self-knowledge, in quotes, which is so often said to be desirable, but that they truly come to know themselves and objectively know how to distinguish between intellect and will, just as they learn to distinguish between hydrogen and oxygen. Otherwise, they will only apparently overcome a certain dualism. Things that happen in one period of time have always been long in preparation, and we can really only study the things that stand out as being particularly significant in an era. 
wanting to be thorough in building a bridge, in the present-day dualism, let us, above all, consider on the one hand the hallucinatory nature of the intellect, which is connected with everything of which I have been speaking, and, on the other hand, the illusory nature of natural phenomena, which I have also been discussing. These take human beings into a kind of inner conflict in life. Two streams are active in them, and they must aim to let there be only one. One stream is particularly seductive. It is the stream which arises from the relationship which people have in their souls with the natural order. A person of our time who sees reality for all things to be of the same kind, an anatomist, to take an obvious example, or a physiologist, will take the human body today and distinguish only outwardly, not inwardly, between the individual members of this body. I'd say he puts the heart beside the liver and investigates both organs only externally, not taking account of the time perspective of which I spoke the other day. In fact, we will only learn properly about the nature of the heart and of the liver if we proceed in a genuinely spiritual scientific way in embryology learning to distinguish in time the beginnings of the heart in early embryology. We also cannot simply put them side by side and say they consist of cells. On the one hand, this is correct, and on the other, it is nonsense. We know very well that something can be correct and a nonsense at one and the same time. However, in the scientific stream, efforts are made today to explain the natural order taking no account of things being at different times, but putting them side by side, and this leads to abstraction. Then the temptation is particularly great to put things side by side, cause, effect, cause, effect, abstract, illusory, causal order. We know from things I told you last year, and also this year, that this is not the way to look at nature that nature only becomes explicable if one looks at it in the first place as reflecting something which is spiritual. Then you arrive at the true theory of metamorphosis, at genuine Gertianism. Then the human head is seen as something which reflects an infinitely distant past, and the organism of extremities as something which points to a distant future. There, something which exists on its own is seen not merely in a causal chain, but as imagination, the image of something which is behind it. We will not understand the human head if we merely look at it as growing out of the rest of the human organism. In reality, it has been created out of the whole cosmos, and in a different way from the way in which the organism of extremities is created. For instance... In physics, everyone would think it ridiculous if one were to explain that the compass needle always points north because there is a force inside it that makes it point north. No, one realizes that there is one pole and the other pole because the cosmos, Earth's magnetism, gives the compass needle its direction. Yet when it comes to man or to any organism, they say everything grows from it in a straight line. Just as the compassed needle points north on one side and south on the other, for cosmic reasons, so does the human head point back to an infinitely far, distant past, and indeed into past times when the earth had metamorphosed itself, and the organism of extremities points to far distant futures, for, but now for temporal cosmic reasons. The orientation is cosmic, and it is in time. This will be the ultimate development of genuine Gertianism, rising from mere illusory causal order to seeing nature through vision in images, recognizing that what we have before us is the image of something else we rise above mere illusion. But we must not stop at nature. We need a correlate, something to complement it, Someone who talks about nature in that way would again be a fantasist if he were to take nature in that way and not, on the other hand, declare, quote, Such spirit, as is said to be the opposite of nature, 
in more recent philosophies, is also hallucination. And again, we must not stop at this. Close quote. All that lives today has developed slowly, and humanity has gone through all kinds of different stages, gradually advancing, I'd say, to the point where the human soul is in the process of gaining insight into the spirit. We can distinguish three stages in this, just as we can say that our understanding of nature is still very confused today, and strive toward the stages of insight, which in my knowledge of the higher worlds are called imagination, inspiration, and intuition, so we can say that the human soul principle has gradually developed intellectually through three stages of being truly within the spirit, so as to truly grasp things in mind and spirit. These are the three stages. Living with an idea of the spirit, which is, of course, something hallucinatory, because one takes the spirit as it is at the present time and does not realize that it is seed for the future. Living with the idea, dreamlike, having some idea of the spirit. The second stage is prophetic vision, where something of the future is truly experienced in visions, like those of the ancient Hebrew prophets. And something does already live in there of knowing that the mind and spirit has the quality of being seed for the future. The third stage, little understood as yet, but there is a depth to it, involves taking an apocalyptic view of the world. All of these stages are preliminary to gaining the spiritual scientific view, though this must, on the other hand, combine with the vision of nature in images. Otherwise, it would, metaphorically speaking, float in the air. Seeing nature in images raises us beyond the illusory aspect of natural science. A realistic attitude to the process which goes through having an idea, an inkling of the future, vision of the future, prophetic vision, apocalyptic vision, raises us above the hallucinatory, hallucinatory element in the life of mind and spirit. We absolutely must not take the spirit the way it is taken in more recent philosophies. That is the human mission in the present time. We must not take nature the way it is taken in the naive view of nature, nor in the theoretical natural science of today. No, we must lay aside the illusions we have about nature, as it were, and perceive the way in which it is but an image of something else. And we have to realize that the mind and spirit is mere shadow image in the way in which it presents itself in modern philosophy. Then a bridge is built between the ordinary way of seeing mind and spirit and the ordinary way of seeing nature. And there will be a third thing. Mere discussion has never served to overcome such things as dualism, only looking at the facts. But it must be all the facts and then finding a third element to go with the two. The symbol used must therefore represent a trinity. We do, of course, understand today that these concepts, again, refer to something which floats on top. But we have to have concepts. They do no harm so long as we do not overestimate them. We are speaking of normal humanity, of the Luciferic and the Aramonic principles, and also making a representation of this, it is to be the central focus of our building. Auguste Comte also had an inkling that there had to be a view that was threefold by nature. He spoke of the Trinity to which I referred the other day. This genuine Trinity which will encompass the view of mind and spirit and the view of nature and thus truly overcome dualism must also have the spiritual science with anthroposophic orientation within it. One cannot therefore arrive at a genuine anthroposophic spiritual science unless one also gives serious consideration to the light and shadow sides of present-day natural science and science of mind and spirit. These things have to be taken seriously. Merely throwing things together and establishing theories will not achieve anything considering the seriousness of the present-day situation. Life 
does not proceed in a general mix, but is differentiated and individualized. Anything striven for in future must be striven for in a differentiated way from the beginning. It is still widely the bad habit today to treat everything the same way. When someone has a political theory today, he will also shape everything else according to that political theory. Philosophies of life and so on, treating everything the same, all based on his favorite theory. That is how it is in our day. Life proceeds in a differentiated way. Only someone who knows this will be free from illusion. The future lies not in striving for a general mix of life, but for marked differentiation, for a life in mind and spirit as true knowledge, a certain inner life of which people have little ideas yet, a life which in the thinking of earlier times may be called a religious life and for political life. Throwing everything together, regulating one thing the way one does another, one falls into the kind of error of which I spoke last year, or indeed two years ago. Things run in separate streams. On one side, social life, according to socialism. On the other, religious life, according to freedom of thought, and scientific life, according to pneumatology, the study of spiritual entities and phenomena and the nature of the human spirit. The three must work together in a living way if the future is to offer a certain healing power in human evolution. Not a paradise on earth, there being no such thing, but a certain healing power. It would be anything but good, however, if people were to think of external life in pneumatological terms, for instance, establish religious sects and fill them with pneumatological life, that is, run political life from the pneumatological point of view. That would bring nothing, nor would it bring anything if religious communities were to do politics in the old sense. Just as the hands cannot do the things the head is able to do, nor the legs, so pneumatology cannot do what socialism should be doing, nor religion what socialism should be doing, or indeed pneumatology. What matters is differentiation of certain things, but not just in theory but in actual life. I want to conclude with this today, taking it further tomorrow. As I said, it is meant to be merely aphoristic, adding some new aspects to the basic issues with which we are concerned. That is the end of the lecture, lecture four, but there is an addendum, and I'm going to read that. It's at the end of the book in note number 29. Uh, tra uh, editor's comment, first of all. At the end of the lecture... Rudolf Steiner added the following comments relating to disagreements among some of the members. See also the volume now in preparation on Anthroposophy and its opponents, German title Die Anthroposophie und ihre Gegner, CW 255b. These were not included in earlier editions of this volume, and so the, and now the notes by Steiner, the additional notes. In addition, I wish to say the following. I am under no illusion. You know, or at least some, of, some who do truly understand some of the things I put forward should know, I am not inclined toward persecution mania, nor to any kind of illusions in life. Genuine spiritual science does thoroughly rid one of such things. In spite of this, I do sometimes have to comment on one thing or another. It is sometimes necessary to make such a comment so that members who call themselves anthroposophic do not completely go to sleep. I do not want people to be under any illusion. Well, there are a number of things that need to be said. However, because of a particular recent incident, I want to say the following. It is true that in the immediate future this movement, which I call anthroposophic, will be exposed to major attacks from various angles, and particularly from one side, which is already very evident. Individual attacks are of very little account, for whatever people say individually is usually an amat as amateurish as can be. But the fact remains that it has been an attack, especially when coming from the clerical side as of now. There is an intention behind this, and that is more important than what is said in individual instances and must be taken very seriously. 
With regard to something which happened just the other day, I therefore wish to say the following. The kind of thing I mean here must, of course, be taken as such in human life that one does not pay further attention to it the way it comes to me. Those concerned will know what this is about. Anyone who wishes to tell me something or discuss something with me should do so quite openly, nor should they imagine that they have something to bring that is essential if they are not speaking openly. As I said, I am under no illusion, and anyone who thinks that I am under some illusion is very much in error. Even if it should be the case that there are people here, on the building site, who bear things on two shoulders, as the saying goes, given up to some ambiguity, there is no need to try and inform me about this in some covert way. I know more about people, including those who walk around on our building site, than I am able to tell, things I must have in mind. No one should think that it is necessary to draw my attention to it in a covert way, that harmful things may perhaps be happening here. For in the way in which social life has to be, when one is having an eye on something as real as this building project, it is not always possible to act according to genuine insight gained from deeper background knowledge. Anyone who does, after all, want to tell me something should do so openly. Otherwise, people will be under the illusion that I am deluded and had illusions about the people with whom I have to deal. I do not do so. I know that people can also be two-faced. And that is the end of the, uh, the end comments and, let's say, the complete end of Lecture 4. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil. Collected Works, Volume 184. This is uh, Lecture 5, given on the 14th of September, 1918. I have heard of and met present-day mystics who have sought to gain insight into human nature in the following way. I want to tell you the result which they believe they have obtained. They say something like this, quote, Looking at human beings as they walk about on earth, their whole existence is something of a riddle. In their soul existence, they go far beyond anything they are able to represent in their whole existence as human beings, revealing themselves, as it were, in the relationship to other people. One therefore has to assume that human beings are something quite different by nature, from what they appear to be as they walk about on earth. They have to be a comprehensive cosmic spirit, which, in its inner nature, is much, much more mighty than is apparent here on earth. There must be reasons why they have forfeited life in the great cosmos and have been banished into this existence on earth. Close quote. As a follower of mysticism, going in this direction, told me, quote, to learn to be modest, to make no demands, and even to feel small here. But in reality they are great, mighty cosmic spirits, though in some way they have come to be unworthy of living as such cosmic spirits. I know that many people will simply laugh at such ideas, but those who take a deeper view of life know that such a mystic idea ultimately also arises because it is so very difficult to solve the riddle of life. This difficulty is increasingly coming to awareness, especially so as more human souls seek to enter deeply into true true reality. I do not, of course, intend to say anything about this idea which people who are following a particular form of mysticism have. I merely wanted to show it to you as something which has also found a place in human souls as a concept. One could just as well present a dozen other abstract, more or less philosophical or mystic solutions to the human riddle. If one then tries to fathom why different people seek to clarify, often in highly unusual ways, what man's existence on earth really is about, one will arrive at various things. Above all, one discovers that when it comes to the great questions about human existence, people are not prepared to fulfill one thing for themselves, though on lesser occasions 
they will definitely admit this on every possible daily occasion. People will admit on every possible occasion that one should not obscure the truth for oneself by wishful thinking and that anything one wished were true cannot be the standard for the objectivity of truth. In ordinary life on the small scale, anyone will immediately admit this. On the large scale we see, as it were, human inability to arrive at a philosophy of life that is in accord with reality exactly because people cannot help themselves to bring in their wishes when it comes to grasping the truth. And it is usually wishes, which we might call unconscious wishes, that play the greatest role, with people not even admitting that there are wishes in their souls. Yet those wishes are present in the soul. They remain subconscious or unconscious. Exactly this would be the task for spiritual scientific training, to bring those wishes to conscious awareness and so to become free of illusory life and enter into the sphere of truth. Such unconscious wishes come into play particularly when the most sublime truths of life should take effect, life truths concerning the nature of human life itself, let us say, this ordinary human life in the physical world, between birth and death. An approach that is genuine, objective, and in accord with reality must always look at the whole course of life if that life is to be understood. Imagine that such a study of life which is in accord with reality would give a result which the individual would not wish to have at all, not even in subconscious wishes. The individual would then do everything he could to overcome that unwelcome result by using sham logic. Essentially nothing in life on earth as we consider it suggests that the truth must be in accord with human wishes not even unconscious wishes. It might rather be the case that the truth also about human life is something which is not in the least pleasant. Spiritual scientific investigations show that this is indeed the case. It is, of course, possible to find a higher point of view from which things may appear different again. But for the life which people would like to have here on earth, Truthful observation shows that it certainly is so, that the truth about the human being is exactly such, that most seekers of comfort in life must feel a slight frisson of horror, even if subconscious, but you'll know what I mean, a slight unconscious, sometimes very powerful subconscious frisson of horror. One must then look at the whole of human life. Readers aside, frisson is F-R-I-S-S-O-N, Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And a reader's aside. We know that when we look at it carefully and objectively, the whole of human life falls into different periods. You can read about these periods in my small publication titled The Education of the Child. We know that one will only understand the human being if one looks at life initially from birth to second dentition, then from second dentition to sexual maturity, from sexual maturity to the early twenties, up to the twenty-first year on average, let us say, then again until the twenty-eighth year. One can understand human life just as one seeks to understand anything in natural science if one considers the periodicity of human life in seven-year periods. Significant things happen in every one of these periods. Yesterday we referred again to the position which man takes in life and how he relates to the cosmos. I reminded you of the image of the compass needle. The form of the human head does, for instance, go far, far back to an infinitely distant past. The form of the extremities points to a distant future. Just as the compassed needle points north at one end and south at the other. The relationship to the cosmos is, however, a different one in every one of the main periods in human life. The principle which is active in us 
during the first seven years is essentially very different from the principle which prevails in the second seven-year period. Everything which comes more or less to expression in the seventh year, in that the whole of growth builds up as if on a shore, everything piling up as the permanent teeth emerge, comes from the powers of the cosmos in the first seven years. And then there is something which human beings hold back as they develop, on reaching sexual maturity, something which gives them a tinge in a way as they develop and gain sexual maturity. This develops because certain powers of development, which are wholly established in the cosmos, develop in the human being during the second period, and so on. The situation is such, however, that we have to say, the different elements in the whole human being are always interacting. Children also develop some soul activity up to second dentition, and this is particularly important in those early years of life. Let me just remind you of Jean-Paul's words, that undoubtedly we learn more that is of value for life from our nurse at the beginning of life than we do from all our professors when at university. There is something very true, very right in those words. We merely have to put the right value on things. We learn a great deal in those first seven years, but intellectually, as it were, and also otherwise, the things we learn stay down in the dullness of inner life, a life which is still largely a life in the body. Read it up in my title, The Spiritual Guidance of the Individual and Humanity. You'll see that one can also put a different value on a child's life in the first seven years. A wisdom that is far from minimal prevails in the human organism in those years. When a child has come into the world, the brain is still fairly undifferentiated. It only differentiates out in the course of time. The structures which develop in the brain do really and truly, if you study them, reflect the influence of a wisdom that is more profound than anything we manage to come up with later in life when we design a machine, for instance, or do some kind of scientific work. We will, of course, not be able to achieve in conscious awareness, later on, what we did achieve when we first came into the world. Cosmic sense, rationality, is then active in us. That that cosmic rationality we also spoke of when speaking of the development of language. A great cosmic wisdom is truly active in human beings in the first seven years of life. In the second seven-year period, this cosmic wisdom goes in the direction of tinging the human being with the quality which then leads to sexual maturity. There, cosmic intellectuality is at work, though as yet only to a small degree. One would like to say that whatever is left over and not used in the inner human being, well, it rises up into the head. The head also gets something, though usually this is what you would expect. The head gets what can be spared in the inner human being, in the unconscious sphere of the inner life. And development then continues in seven-year periods. People do not normally study the whole of human life, normal life as they call it. It needs some dedication to study normal human life, devoting oneself to the true human being himself, and then also to the great cosmic laws. It may sound odd, but one cannot understand the principle which is at work in human beings in the early years, the first seven years, definitely not when one is a child, but also not as a young man or woman, not even if one imagines oneself to be understanding the whole of life in one's twenties. One cannot understand it. It is possible to gain some understanding of what goes on in childhood when one looks for this insight inwardly in the human being, in inner experience, roughly between one's 56th and 63rd year. Only advanced age, when one is very old, provides opportunity to gain a bit of insight into what is active in us in the first seven years of childhood. This is hard to accept. For today people want to be full human beings when hardly out of their teens. It is not acceptable today to have to admit 
that there is something in this world, something which actually concerns us personally, where one has to be well up in one's fifties to understand it. As to development in the years when people move towards sexual maturity, from the seventh to the fourteenth years, one will only be able to understand some of it more or less between the forty-ninth and fifty-sixth years in the early fifties. It would be good if such truths came to be accepted, for they would help us to understand life. The truths one usually posits about the human being are what people wish. They merely do not realize this, the wishes being unconscious. As to the things that happen from sexual maturity to the twenty-first year, one gets some inwardly experienced insight and will be able to form some opinion about it between the forty-second and the forty-ninth year. Between the thirty-fifth and the forty-second year it is possible to gain some insight into developments in the twenties up to the twenty-eighth year. What I am saying about these things is based on genuine observation of life. This has to be made by training oneself in the spiritual scientific method of observation and not in the kind of frippery way of gaining self-knowledge which is often given that name today. One must develop genuine insight into human nature. It is only in about the time from one's 28th to one's 35th year that one can have experiences which can be understood at the time when one is experiencing them. A certain balance then exists between understanding and thinking. In the first half of life one may think or envisage all kinds of things. For true understanding of the things one can envisage in the first half of life, one has to wait until the second half of life. This is an uncomfortable truth, but that is how life goes. I can even imagine that there are people who say, quote, well, if human beings are so precisely defined in their inner laws, where do they have free will? Where's their freedom? Where's the awareness of their humanity? Quote, close quote. Yes, I can imagine that someone feels unfree because he's not able to be in Europe and in America at the same time. That someone feels unfree because he can't fetch the moon down. But the facts do not go according to human wishes, and the facts must be faced even when someone gains insight into himself. It is not for nothing that we live a life that modifies itself, metamorphoses itself. We live this life in such a way that every period in life has meaning and significance in its relationship to others. We live a normal life, as we call it, beyond the sixties. We'll talk about early death also from these points of view tomorrow and in a way only come to understand in the second half of life what was active within us in the first half of life. People would be much more certain and sure in getting their orientation in the world if this truth about life could be more widely accepted, for they would then build on a secure foundation in life. Today, people basing themselves not on objectivity but on wishes do often simply say, quote, Ah, well, one has to learn things until one is in one's twenties, but then you are ready and ripe for anything in life. Close quote. They completely overlook the inner connections in life. To get to know life is indeed an inner task, and when it comes to this intimate task, we must not forget that wishes must be silent and objectivity must be taken into account. A degree of balance came to exist in the course of human evolution. Things had been very different in earlier times, and I have spoken of this before. You'll remember how I spoke of human evolution from the Atlantean era to this day, how humanity grew progressively younger. A degree of balance arose because it came to be in the course of evolution that one element became related to the other. If that had not happened one would simply have to take life like this. Someone who was only in his twenties would simply have to believe someone who was in his forties about certain truths, which one can only grasp in a living way in one's forties, as I have described it for you. It is not entirely like this, for in the course of human evolution the concepts themselves 
the ideas, have become such that one can gain some degree of sentience to convince one in one period of life about another. If one has sufficient devotion to let people in their forties and fifties tell one of their life experience, providing, of course, that they have had some, people tend not to have any today, if one lets oneself be told the experiences in life when one is younger, then one does, after all, not have to depend on belief in authority today. This has already come about in evolution. By giving it thought, young people are able to think, there is more to the nature and character which the thoughts have assumed than something that merely appeals to belief. There is indeed a certain possibility that one will also understand. Otherwise we'd have to say that human beings think when they are young and understand when they are old. But there is something there which can give one more than conviction of faith, purely authoritative conviction. This balance this balances things out to some extent. Take what I have said as a truth for life. If you take it as a truth for life, it will cast light for you on practical life. Just think, if what I have been saying exists in life, is thought and felt and people are sentient of it, how this will be reflected in the way people relate to one another, how it will create elements that link one soul to another, Someone who is still young looks at the old person in a particular way if he knows that that person is able to experience things and compared to someone who is merely able to think, this means that something that was thought is also understood. One will then take a very different interest in the things someone of a different age is able to tell one if one looks at life in such a way. And one will still be interested even at a greater age in all the youngsters and even children around one. You'll remember how often I've said that even the wisest can learn from a young child. No doubt the wisest person will happily and lovingly learn from a young child. He may not be able to learn about morality or about philosophies of life, but he would be able to gain infinitely much wisdom exactly from the young child, especially with regard to cosmic secrets. These still come into their own in a young child, in a way that is very different from later on in life. The interest that links one soul to another will grow tremendously if such things are not just abstract theories, but the wisdom of life. It simply is a characteristic of spiritual science that it elevates, strengthens, and increases the bonds of love which essentially must rest on the bonds of mutual interest between individuals. Ordinary rational wisdom can leave people dry, as dry as some academics are. Spiritual science, if its substance is truly grasped, cannot leave people dry, but will always, whatever the circumstances, let human beings love others, strengthening and increasing mutual human interest. Today I intended to tell you about some things that are not nice to live with, but are the truth, facts. One will not progress in spiritual science unless one gets used to looking facts boldly in the face, even if they are uncomfortable. Another fact, already evident from what was said yesterday, is that the kind of intellect we are able to achieve in the present human cycle is altogether only suitable for providing insight into a limited time span. I really do not envy the people who lightheartedly set about translating Aeschylus, even Homer, the Psalms, and so on. Honestly, I do not envy them. That people can in our time believe that all those middle-class pretensions in Mr. Wilamowitz's translations of Greek plays truly represent Aeschylus, anything of that kind simply is a sad sign of the times. People are not able to observe as soon as it somehow gets to be on the large scale. They often also do not have the patience to observe things on the small scale. It would be a good thing to try simply as an exercise and observe things on the small scale. Let me give you an example of a rather childlike small matter. The other day I read an essay in the International Journal published here in Switzerland 
in which the socialist writer Kautsky particularly complained of a Russian socialist having quoted him so badly that the opposite of what is said in Kautsky's books was given as Kautsky's view. It was highly unlikely, considering the nature of the subject matter and the nature of the people involved, that Kautsky's text had been deliberately falsified. I then read the Russian's essay and also had to say that it was odd how he represented Kautsky's views. I formed my own opinion even as I read, for I found it interesting that such a thing was altogether possible. As I read on, I soon realized what must have happened, and this was confirmed later on when that author apologized, though I only saw this later. He had not read Kautsky's work in the original German, but in a translation into Russian. Writing his essay in German, he had back-translated it. So this is what had happened, translation from German into Russian and back-translation. Because of this, the opposite of what it had said in the book came out and was quoted. It needs no more than this when something is translated from one language into another, quite honestly so, to change things into their opposite. There need not be any funny business involved, but essentially only the principles according to which translations are done today. It is a small childish observation I have been mentioning. Someone who has the patience to observe such and similar things in life should not really be surprised to be told, quote, it is impossible to understand Homer simply with the powers available to us today. We only think we understand. Close quote. Well, that is looking at the matter from outside. There is, however, an important inner aspect to it. The state of the modern soul was so very different in the days of Homer that modern people are also far removed from the possibility of understanding Homer. The present-day state of the human soul is such that it is very much tinged by intellectuality. The state of soul in Homer's day was not. People today cannot rid themselves of that tinge if they stay in that ordinary, everyday state of soul. It is more compelling than people think and more powerful than they are aware of. They live with abstract concepts. Homer, not at all. But people find it difficult to reconcile this with their subconscious or unconscious wishes. They thus say to themselves, quote, Well, having the understanding which is normal for the present time, one has to forego understanding anything which originated in the days of Homer or even just Aeschylus. Close quote. This renunciation is not at all in accord with people's subconscious wishes. This is where spiritual science must come in. It does not stay at the ordinary state of soul, but evokes a comprehensive state of soul, which allows one to enter into states of soul which are of a different kind from the normal states of the present time. With the means of spiritual science, it is once again possible to enter into something which is not accessible to the present state of soul. This renunciation, resignation, would be of tremendous importance for people today, so that they say to themselves, quote, The understanding we are able to have extends only through a limited distance in human evolution. Close quote. It is also important to think of this when it comes to looking to the future. You can be as explicit as you like today. Write or say things clearly. Note down what has been said but this will not continue for much longer. In the near future, times will move faster, if I may use this paradoxical phrasing, than was the case in the past, and it will then be quite impossible to understand anything we say or write today the way we understand it. Once again, it will only be for a certain period toward the future that our understanding will be such that people can understand what we now say and write. Historians refer to documents only wanting to rely on physical documents, but it does not depend on the existence of documents if we do or do not understand 
but on whether our powers of understanding go that far. Our powers of understanding do not at all extend to times that are further away. And if we then do not have that resignation, we'll arrive at Kant-Laplace theories or the like. I have spoken of this on quite a few occasions. What really is a Kant-Laplace theory but the helpless attempt to use the intellect of the present time to think about the origin of the world, in spite of the fact that our normal state of mind and soul is now so far removed from this origin of the world that anything thought up in our present understanding of the world about the time that should be covered by the Kant-Laplace theory cannot be anything like the original origin of the world, excuse me, like the actual origin of the world. The knowledge that is necessary to resort to different ways of gaining insight if one goes beyond a certain distance in time is something which spiritual science must also provide. People are unable to gain insight into past times beyond a certain limit unless they resort to spiritual scientific research unless they try to use different senses from those to which the intellect is bound. Taking note of what I have just been saying, I think you will realize how narrowly confined the horizons must be for present-day people unless they are prepared to resort to other stages of investigation, to other stages of gaining insight, when it comes to the things which the ordinary intellectuality, which really sets the tone today, cannot reach to gain comprehension. We know that it is possible to rise to imaginative, inspired, and intuitive insight. These methods take us into different stretches. They alone can extend the island of existence which we are able to survey in the present day state of mind and soul. Everything which encompasses the present day state of soul is really bound to the human eye capital. You can read up on this in my title Theosophy, title Occult Science, and so on. Human beings also bear other elements of their essential nature in them, astral body, etheric body, physical body. But the ordinary present-day state of soul does not extend down into the astral body, nor the ether body, or the physical body. For anatomists are only able to see the outer aspect, Inner insight does not go beyond the eye, let alone, perhaps, the physical body. One has to be able to follow the human being full of understanding from within. The insight into life of which I spoke at the beginning of today's talk is a first step in that direction. The things one is able to understand in the second half of life are a beginning, though a feeble one. For a better start, one will have to rise to spiritual science. When one grasps the human being inwardly, one goes down from mere intellect to acting out of the will. Yesterday I said that the subject of acting out of the will, the principle in us which is actually doing it, preserves the cosmic memory. Whatever man could develop if he had the will to do so, as he develops normal wisdom of life in the second half of life, would be a start of this going down process. It would not cast light on much, but it would enlighten him about what human beings need to live. But if he then goes down with the higher insight he has developed, this entering into his own essential nature would open up the cosmic memory for him. Then something different from the Kant-Laplace theory would emerge, for instance, the reality of our physical nature. As you know, the physical body is the oldest part of us, going back through four incarnations of the earth to the Saturn period. It is possible to learn from the ordinary wisdom of life, which opens up in the second half of life, what needs to be done to enter more deeply into essential human nature. Man is an image of the world, and in gaining insight into this image, is able also to get to know the world. People are usually governed by subconscious or unconscious wishes when, lightheartedly, or taking the easiest possible line, 
they think up something like the Kant-Laplace theory, when they should really say to themselves that the subject is not accessible to their thinking. Here we are once again, approaching the tasks that lie ahead by moving in circles, I'd say touching on what prevents people today from building a bridge between ideality and reality, which is our present theme. People have sought through the ages to overcome these problems, but it is difficult to be really clear about these things, because it is awkward, because people do not like to face the real facts. People are in the habit of accepting half the story and not the other half. A typical example of this, Karl Marx once said that philosophers had so far only endeavored to interpret the world with their concepts, but we needed to change the world, and one really had to find thoughts that would change the world. The first part is absolutely right. Philosophers have endeavored in so far as they are philosophers to interpret the world, and if they were a little bit intelligent, they would not think that it was possible to do anything but interpret the world. Yet the very archetype of all philosophical philistinism, Wilhelm Traugott Krug, who taught in Leipzig from 1809 to 1834, and wrote many books ranging from fundamental philosophy to the highest levels of philosophy, demanded that Hegelian philosophers should deduce not only concepts, but also the development of the pen, which greatly infuriated Hegel. Resignation is needed also in this field, saying, quote, Of course we are, as whole human beings, called upon to change the world, and so far as the world consists of human lives. Close quote. But the kind of thinking we do in the present time, gloriously adequate and truly perfectly suitable for understanding the natural world, this thinking is utterly unsuitable for getting us anywhere when it is a question of letting action based on the will come into effect. This is an uncomfortable truth. For if one understands this, one will soon no longer say that whereas philosophers have so far endeavored to interpret the world, what matters is to change the world, secretly hoping that one can contribute to this in some way with some form of dialectics. Instead, People say to themselves that the philosophers have only been able to interpret because they are able to refer to things. With nature, it is enough if we just interpret it. For, thank God, one would like to say, the natural world exists without us, and we can consider it enough just to interpret it. Social and political life does not exist without us. And there we cannot say it is enough merely to grasp it in concepts which are suitable only for interpreting life and not for shaping it. There it is indeed necessary to advance from mere theorizing, which is largely hallucination, as I have shown yesterday and is very much a hobby today, to real life. Real life, with its facts, demands that we do not take it in the linear way which people are used to taking today. Yes, ideas which one person conveys to another do lead to something, but they do not always lead to the same thing. Absolute truths do not exist, nor do absolute facts. Everything is relative. And the effect of something I put in words depends not only whether I consider it to be true or not, but also on what people are like in a particular era how they react to it, if I may put it like that. Just let me give you a significant example, one which it is most important to consider. Going back to about the 14th century of the Christian era, we find that before that century, it was possible to speak to people of mysticism. Mystic concepts still had the impetus then, which served to educate people and give them impulses. The Oriental population of Asia, the Indian, Japanese, and Chinese people were still preserved, excuse me, have still preserved much of these faculties. For certain sections of humanity will retain earlier qualities or faculties at later times. We can at present still study things, and this had also been the case with European peoples in earlier times. 
but the whole state of the human mind and soul has changed. Someone who passes on, presents mysticism today, for example, must understand that an era is coming closer and closer where the way in which people react to the presenting of mysticism, uh, proper mysticism, that of Meister Eckhart, Toller, and the like, teaches them the things which Lucifer calls forth in them, things that lead to trouble and strife. It would seem that there is no better way of preparing a sect for trouble and strife, disagreement, for abusing one another, but by pious mystic speeches. Well, if you think of the straight line, this will, this will seems downright impossible, but it is a factual truth. It is so because it is not just the content of anything said, but the way in which people react to things. And one must know the world, and above all one must not base one's views just on one's wishes. Let me once again remind you of the conversation I once had with two Roman Catholic priests in a town in southern Germany. They had attended a lecture I had given on the Bible and wisdom. There was nothing the two priests could really object to. But even if there is nothing to object to, priests cannot simply accept that. They have to raise some objection. So they said, quote, uh, Yes, in substance, we would be able to say the same. But we say the things we say in such a way that everyone can understand them. You are only saying them for a number of people who have a certain level of education. Anything we say has to be understandable to all. Close quote. My answer was, quote, Well, you see, it does not matter what you think is comprehensible to everyone and what I think about it. Our theoretical views as to what people understand are irrelevant. What matters is that we study reality and there you can easily make a test for reality. Let me ask you, when you use these methods and present in your church today what you think everyone can understand, does everyone go to your church, or are there not some today who stay outside? The fact that some stay outside counts more than your belief when, than that you speak for everyone. The reality is that some stay outside. Your belief that you speak to all is your belief. I speak to those who do not go to your church, for it is my opinion that one must accept reality, and that one can also speak to those who do not go to church but nevertheless are justifiably looking for the way to the spiritual world. Close quote. A commonplace example to show the difference between thinking in a way that accords with reality, letting reality dictate what one's view should be, and the way most people think they know things they have just dreamt up and wish for and swear by. Someone who investigates reality is also prepared at any moment to abandon something he considered to be right and give his thoughts a different direction when the facts teach him the truth. Reality does not go as much in a straight line as people would wish. So it can certainly be the case and will be more and more the case that is the trend in the evolution of human nature, that members of a sect will grow more and more quarrelsome and cantankerous as one seeks to teach the most pious mysticism, the most heartfelt mysticism. But it is equally wrong to teach people one-sided natural scientific views. It needs great mental acuity to gain insight to natural science. And as you know, I am not at all inclined to give less recognition to the natural scientific truths than anyone else. But there is also the fact that if only natural scientific truths or truths of the natural scientific kind were taught to the world, the mental acuity used to find natural scientific truths would greatly contribute to condemning people to be unfree. Where one-sided mysticism would lead to more and more trouble and strife, one-sided natural science in the present-day sense would cause inner lack of freedom to being inwardly bound. So you see that it is properly thought through when we say that in spiritual science one must endeavor not to be one-sidedly mystical nor one-sidedly natural scientific. Justice must be done to both 
neither overestimating nor underestimating the one or the other. We must advance from duality to trinity. Spiritual science will, of its own accord, avoid the either-or and accept the both-and, one casting light on the other. You know, it is always a bad thing when someone of a natural scientific bent inveighs against mysticism. As a rule, the thing, things he says will be downright silly. In the same way, it is downright silly for someone purely given to mysticism, knowing nothing about natural scientific insights, to inveigh against natural science. To inveigh against mysticism, to ring the changes, is something which really only a mystic should allow himself to do, and only someone who knows natural science should permit himself to inveigh against natural science at one point or another. Then the things said will be what they are said to be, as they can be properly assessed. But it will always be a bad thing for natural science to be bad-mouthed by someone who knows nothing about it, perhaps believing himself to be a great mystic. Or when a natural scientist knows nothing about mysticism and denigrates it. In the field of spiritual science it has been said many, many times that certain truths must seem paradoxical to people because they go so much against the standpoint of being at ease in ordinary life. Today I have been speaking about a whole number of things which have surged up against your souls unresolved in a way. I have spoken of some facts of life that will have to be admitted if one also wants things to be different. Some who are today considering themselves to be great people, capable of much, have no idea of these truths of life. And that is exactly what lies behind the great catastrophes in our time. That there is this great need to get to know this life and people do not want to know it. Tomorrow we'll consider some things that will resolve some of the contradictions which quite rightly surged up against your souls today. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moyes. This is Lecture 6, uh, given on the 15th of September, 1918. Looking at human life in spirit and soul, one cannot use some ideas that are widely accepted, particularly in present-day life and present-day views. One such idea, which is not a good one, concerning human life in spirit and soul, is, for instance, the idea of evolution. The idea that one thing evolves from the other, or rather one state from the other. To avoid misunderstanding, let me stress that I do not say something now about the idea of evolution being of no use. We did make extensive use of it yesterday, for example. But when one is speaking about human life in soul and spirit and not in soul and body, the idea of evolution serves no purpose. Yesterday we were speaking of life in soul and body, how it progresses from birth to death, there we do need the idea of evolution. The situation is different when we speak of human life in spirit and soul. If one is speaking in accord with reality, concepts or ideas other than evolution will serve. Human life in spirit and soul, the way we know it within the outer reality perceived through the senses, involves thinking, feeling and doing or acting out of the will. To understand the course of life in spirit and soul, according to thinking, feeling and doing as we go through life, we must take note of the following. Living in thinking, feeling and doing, that is, in feeling something and what has been felt coming to expression in thought, or perceiving something in the outside world which then comes to expression in thought, or doing something letting will become deed, 
thus going through life in spirit and soul, the relations must always be considered which exist between spiritual entities. Wanting to describe the element of spirit and soul within which human beings exist with their soul, we must not shy away from speaking of connections that exist between entities of spirit and soul. Let us assume, for instance, that someone is more of a thinker. While the activities of thinking, feeling and doing are never completely separate in real life, so if someone is a thinker and forms ideas, the will is involved in the thinking. The will is involved in the process of thinking. And also, when we will, when we do something, thought is involved in what has been willed and done. The situation is that people are sometimes more thinking and less doing when they think, when they reflect, or they are more doing and less thinking and taking action, or also when they give themselves up to some feeling they experience. But talking about it the way I have just been doing is merely a very superficial characterization. One has to use a very different approach if one wants to come to the reality of these things. One must then, for instance, consider this. I am perceiving something or other in the outside world. This encourages me to form ideas about it. I am not taking action. My will intent is limited to directing my bodily nature toward the outside world and perceiving that world, letting thoughts follow one another. My activity is more reflective, perceptive, And in reality, this means that I enter into a spiritual region where certain spirits have the upper hand, which incline more toward the Aramonic nature. Figuratively speaking, I am sticking my head into a region where spirits who are more of an an Aramonic nature have the upper hand. Instead of saying, and this is merely in accord with seeming reality, quote, I am reflecting on something, close quote, I would have to say, in speaking the truth, quote, I am active in a spiritual region where spirits have the upper hand over other spirits, damping them down, as it were, and in thus having the upper hand, keeping those in balance which are more inclined toward aramonic nature. Close quote. When one says something like this, it does not at first sound vague, indefinite. Let me read that again. When one says something like this, it does, at first, sound vague, indefinite. But one cannot put it in any other way but the way they are in the spiritual region. Our language has been created for the sense-perceptible world. It is, however, possible to present such things in images by taking the process out of the human being, as it were, and moving it more into the cosmic sphere. For initiates... The fact which one characterizes in outward terms by saying, quote, I am reflecting on something which has stimulated me, close quote, is figuratively expressed more or less as follows. Human beings live cosmically within the cosmos. I have spoken these days of the compass needle which cosmically points north and south and does not determine its direction from within. Human beings are oriented within the cosmos. They live in such a way that we are in one way considering their orientation by saying, quote, cosmically they are oriented in such a way that their orientation may change and swing to and fro among different signs of the zodiac. And there's a figure. The orientation changes going from ram, excuse me, going toward ram, bull, twins, crab, lion, virgin, scales, scorpion, archer, goat, water carrier, fishes. Their orientation is also such that initially there is a main direction, so that if we base this on the zodiac, the head is oriented upward, the extremities downward. We may say, therefore, there is something like a balance beam in this orientation, separating the upper from the lower. What would the cosmic orientation of the human being be? if we were to look at him in a way in which I would not wish you to be now, so that he neither thinks nor acts, 
but simply gives himself up to his general feeling of life, half asleep and half awake, not being passive nor active, but passively active, slouching along in life. A lot will then also be going on inside him, but he won't be aware of this. If we wanted to characterize this condition, as I said, I would not want you to be in it now, we would say that the beam is horizontal. But if he were in the kind of state of soul in which I'd hope you to be, reflective, stimulated, and taking in the things that are said, the beam would have to be in a different position, and we'd have to say, quote, all the souls sitting in this room, or at least a number of them, enter into a region where certain spirits raise the beam on one side. Close quote. In physical life, there, if there were excess weight moving the beam, we'd say the beam is going down. But we are now speaking of the spiritual. There we have to say that the beam is rising. When someone is reflective, certain spirits in the region which he then enters raise the beam from scales to virgin. I then have to draw the beam so that certain spirits, which incline toward our amonic nature, raise it like this. So that would be the human being musing, reflecting, beam extending from virgin to fishes in the diagram. We may ask, therefore, quote, what does it mean when a human being is reflecting? Close quote. It means that he uses his position as a human being in the whole cosmos in such a way that he uses the powers in which he swings to and fro to enter into a cosmic region where this state of balance prevails. So, you think yourself in a reflective state. Thinking yourself in that state, you have to think to yourself that your, if I may now put it like this, spiritual space into which you then enter is within a region where a struggle that has come to rest is taking place. The spirits here on the left would fight those on the right and vice versa. But the struggle is not actually going on when you are in a reflective state. It has come to rest. This means, however, that certain spirits with harmonic tendencies have the upper hand. When a beam is at rest, though at an angle, and is no longer swinging to and fro, something is dragging it down. That would be the real situation which corresponds to reflection, to thinking activity. Thinking, as we call it in ordinary existence, based on the senses, is merely maya, an illusion. You have to describe real thinking cosmically by asking about the whole position of the human being within the cosmos. This position of the human being in the cosmos that gives you answers as to what certain spirits in the spiritual world are doing will also answer and tell you what thinking activity, reflection, truly is. Essentially, therefore, the way we speak of thinking in ordinary life is an illusion. To describe it in a way that is in accord with reality, we'd have to say, quote, we are in a region where thoughts arise in our thinking space because certain spirits inclined toward the Aramonic have raised the scale on one side, Close quote. That is the actual thing which happens. Let us consider another thing that happens in the human soul and spirit. It is that we act, but not wildly so, that our actions are full of intent, of thoughts. The way one thinks of this in ordinary life, describes it in ordinary life, is again mere illusion. For when we do things, act, we also enter into a certain cosmic region. But now the situation is that certain spirits which incline toward luciferic nature make the scale rise in the opposite sense, so that we must now draw the beam like this. Again, reference to the diagram, figure 5. The arrow would indicate the direction in which those spirits lift the beam from its resting position. Acting out of the will, with real intent, we are oriented in a region of the cosmos where the beam is held like that by luciferic spirits. This had been preceded by rest, and as soon as we enter into the region of doing, of acting, the luciferic spirits begin to make the beam tremble. 
we then enter into a kind of struggle which is taking place in the cosmos. The Luciferic spirits begin to fight our Amonic spirits, and the unstable position, with the beam shifting, reflects the struggle which is truly taking place between our Amonic and Luciferic spirits in our, act, in our will to act. So, the will to act we speak of in our ordinary speech and define with our ordinary ideas is mere maya, illusion. We talk of the will to act in the right way when we say, quote, when we act out of the will we are in a region where the world balance beam has been raised, going from bull to scorpion. This did, however, happen without us. We enter into a region where the beam has been raised without us. So we go into exactly the kind of region where rest begins to change into movement, begins to change into rhythmic play. In the first of our mystery plays, I indicated something of this nature. It did, of course, have to be indicated in dramatic form, that we must not imagine that something happens merely in the human being who thinks or feels something in soul and spirit. No, cosmic powers are set in motion. The way it is presented on the stage is that great cosmic events take place whilst Capacius and Strader behave in a particular way. They really do, not in the sense perceptible, but in the super-sensible world. In the sense perceptible world, one can only present these things to the senses the way they have been presented in the play. It is, however, stated quite clearly in the play that the way people behave here, as we describe it, is really only a reflection of something real. Significant events take place in the cosmos when a human being wills or thinks even the least thing in his soul. We can never will or think something inwardly without entering into regions where spiritual struggles take place or spiritual struggles come to rest or spiritual battles have already been fought as we enter into the outcome of the struggle and so on. What I have just been describing is part of human soul and spirit nature. It is, however, hidden from the life which people live between birth and death. But in the spiritual sphere, it is the truth. In a different context, I did say that these days, in relating to the world in an intellectualistic way, as is the custom in the world, human beings are actually living in hallucinations. Basically, the ideas we have of our thinking, feeling, and doing are hallucinations. And the reality behind it is the way we are able to show it on the stage in this way. It is the things I have just been describing which really are behind anything that goes on in our mind and soul. Reflections are revealed to human beings which to them seem to be thinking, feeling, and acting out of the will. As soon as we look at human beings as they truly are in spirit and soul, the concept of evolution no longer applies. It would be complete nonsense to say that human beings only grow reflective at a particular age and are given up to a raging will nature before that, and that the one evolves from the other. Nothing evolves like this in the region of the spirit. All we can say when we see that a child has different ideas, feeling, and will than does an old person is that the child enters into different, a different spiritual region where the struggles between the different spirits take a different form. You do not get the kind of development or evolution in the spiritual region of which we spoke yesterday. In this spiritual region, we only understand things past if we say that the picture of the struggle, of the relationship, of the changing relations between the spirits whom we seek behind the higher hierarchies is different from the picture we have in the interactions of the hierarchies when speaking of the present. Yet another picture results when we speak of the future. We see different pictures of the relationship between the different spirits in the hierarchies, depending on whether we are considering past, present, or future. And it would be very wrong to say that the picture of the struggle of the future evolves from that of the struggle in the past. 
In the spiritual region these things are, in a certain respect, side by side, not one after the other. Because of this one cannot speak of evolution, but only of a spiritual perspective, something I did already refer to in another context. We may say, therefore, that when we consider the human being in spirit and soul, it is pointless to say that he is first a child, goes through second dentition, that he then reaches sexual maturity, and so on. The development seen in body and soul is bound up with a spirit and soul principle, where one cannot speak of evolution, but only of transitions in the interrelations between the spirits of the higher hierarchies, moving from one picture to another. You cannot gain a real insight into the relationship between the temporal and the eternal unless you consider what I said in my lectures yesterday and today. Yesterday I showed how human beings as entities in body and soul are within the evolution of time in such a way that they will indeed have to be old before understanding what has been happening within them as children. There we are fully concerned with development or evolution. We have to acknowledge, however, that in spirit and soul, human beings are not at all in a process of evolution, that the concept of time in the form in which we know it in the life perceived through the senses does not apply at all when we speak of human nature in spirit and soul, that we are wrong in applying the concept of time to the sphere of the higher hierarchies. There, everything is eternal. Things do not proceed in time there. But we are dealing with perspectives in which we have to see the struggles and changing relationships. The concept of time does not apply to the changing relationships in the higher hierarchies. We are merely presenting the nature of the higher hierarchies figuratively in using the time concept. Because of this you can see in my title Occult Science how careful I have been in indicating that things do, of course, have to be presented in time, in the images given, especially where I was referring to the Saturn and Sun periods, where it has been described like that. But I did distinctly say that the time concept is only applied figuratively to anything preceding the Sun period and half the actual Sun period as well. You can read it up in my occult science. Those comments of seemingly secondary significance in the book, based on the science of the spirit, are of the greatest importance, for they provide the basis for understanding the difference between things temporal and transient and things eternal that go on forever. If you consider what I have just been saying, you will be able to say that yesterday I attempted to describe essential human nature for you purely in time. The concept of time played a quite considerable role in what I said yesterday, the role being that it does depend on time if one has a certain ability to understand, speaking of the time one has lived through before reaching old age, or time not yet lived through, in which case one is still a child. Everything we discussed yesterday was strictly based on the concept of time. We described what, in the light of spiritual science, is the basis of essential human nature in body and soul. Today I have been speaking of the things that are the basis for the human being in soul and spirit. This can only be spoken of by going into the region of eternity. Describing it in such a way, and this is difficult to do, that the concept of time does not apply in this region, in which we are as human beings in spirit and soul. So in this respect we truly are discordant creatures. As we develop through life we know that we must calmly and patiently wait until our bodily and soul nature is mature enough to understand things. On the other hand, we are all the time in the region of eternity, where we do not develop and, as it were, look just once in childhood at one location in the region of eternity and, in advanced old age, at another location. Here on earth human beings live in such a way that the things that happen in the region of eternity are radiating down into the things that happen in time and the two mingle. In the knowledge gained by the initiates, things that mingle must be kept apart 
for they can only be understood if held apart. In that science, the things that are in the region of eternity have always been called the upper ones, those in the region of transience, the lower ones. Living here on earth, human beings are, from this point of view, a mixture of upper and lower, and will never gain any kind of insight into essential human nature by looking at the mixture. They will only gain insight if they know how to keep the things that mingle apart. So you will find it understandable that when it comes to the aspect which life on earth offers, you cannot in your normal state of conscious awareness establish that things are the way I did say today. Someone who wants to base himself only on the ordinary conscious mind may say, quote, Yesterday you told us something about the human being which we cannot see, which is not anything real at all, for human beings do not develop in the way you described yesterday. Some are very mature when young, close quote, and so on. This objection is, however, raised from the illusory point of view. Reality is as I have described it yesterday and today. People fall into dualism today because they do not see the lower principle being as fluid as I have presented it yesterday. The initiate must free the lower principle from its rigidity and make it flow. In ordinary life, people look at someone who is before them. The initiate must consider the process which takes place between birth and death. He must see the human being in a state of flux. Then, again, as the initiate considers thinking, feeling, and doing, which is in a state of flux, he has to stop the flow and look at the aspect which is bound to the body and therefore appears to proceed in time in the region of eternity, the region where things are side by side, but spiritually side by side. People strive for the knowledge of the initiates and are happy to admit also in outward terms that the environment we observe, the environment evident to the senses, is maya, a great illusion. But when things get serious, they prefer not to consider this but seek to stay with maya in describing both the upper and the lower region. Nice diagrams are called for that follow the pattern of maya concepts and go up into the spiritual world with them or move down above or below the conscious mind. People say, quote, well, you don't describe things so that I can understand them, close quote. But all there is behind this, but all there is behind this is this, quote, you are asking me to arrive at different ideas than the ones that exist in Maya. You ask me to arrive at ideas that are in the region of reality, close quote. Another objection may be, quote, what does it matter to me what goes on in the lower part? One will also manage quite well by just applying the concept of time in earnest to human evolution or by looking at the region of eternity in life, close quote. People might say this if they stay in Maya, if they develop ideas that come from the mixture and do not go beyond Maya. Well, you can just about live be able to live in a sleep state if you stay in the region of eternity. In the first place, however, any concepts or ideas you produce here, however great the acuity, however much they could hold their own among today's scholars, will only allow you to just about live, but you cannot die with them. No one can die with the concepts produced here. And this is the point as soon as one touches on this secret, where spiritual insight gets really serious. Concepts produced without the knowledge which which initiates have, these ideas will, after death, take one into a wrong aramonic region. You will not enter into the region of human principles, a region which you are, in fact, destined to reach if you are not prepared to develop concepts like those which the knowledge gained by the initiates provides. 
In earlier times, higher spirits would, in supersensible ways, teach human beings who had atavistic clairvoyance the concepts of initiation. A kind of supersensible teaching existed essentially until 333 after the mystery on Golgotha, which prepared people not only for life, but also for death. Since then, need has arisen for human beings to make their own efforts to gain insight and so prepare their soul that it can go through the gate of death in the right way. There is nothing more frivolous than to say about the knowledge of initiates that one might simply wait until one comes to the region after death and see what the situation is. In the science of the initiates, one is told that anyone who waits like that is sinning against life. For you would get a terrible shock if an initiate, this is an impossibility, were to tell you the kind of monstrosity you would be born as if you had that attitude in your life between death and that birth, saying that you'd wait and see till you're born on earth and then you'd see the creature which lives in the blood, covered in flesh. Yes, there'd be a beneficent influence, but they would not relieve you of the need to prepare for yourself the powers that would save you from being born a monster. Higher spirits will protect you there. This spiritual life between death and rebirth say the spirits who teach there, exists not only for our region. It exists so that the region of the lower principles be prepared in the right way, so that no monsters arise there, but truly well-formed human beings. But life on earth too exists, not only for the earth. It exists in order that human beings may be able to die in the right, the human way. Human beings must here on earth prepare their lower nature so that they will not enter into an Aramanic region which is unlawful. There are, of course, also lawful Aramanic regions, but this would be an unlawful one that would not be in accord with their human nature. So that is the first thing. The second thing is this. You can, if need be, live as an isolated individual. But in reality, one does not live as a single individual by ignoring the region of eternity. But you cannot live within the social, human social order. The human social order is guided and led by the spirits in the higher hierarchies. And if you enter into even the most minimal human relationship, our whole life consists in relationships between ourselves and others, And anything you put into this relationship does not come from an awareness of being within the spiritual region, the region of eternity. You will ruin the social contact. You are then having a part in bringing about the catastrophic phenomena of destruction and annihilation around the globe. Social or political views, not coming from the spiritual, are destructive, annihilating, Only a view where one is taking account of the region of eternity will enliven anything evolving in the political, the social, and altogether human community life. That is the great solemn truth, and the knowledge gained by the initiates must make more and more people aware of it. The signs of the times are such today that the time has passed when sublime spirits taught supersensibly which was the case until 333 A.D., lessons people did not have to attend to consciously, for they were largely given in sleep or in a twilight state. Today human beings have to learn the things they need from other human beings. They must simply put aside the arrogance which makes them say that they can always develop their own opinions. In the region of transience, They need to grasp such things as this. Old people have something to say to the young, which only they can tell them. And if one grasps this, why should one not also grasp that there is knowledge gained by initiates which one human being learns from another? And this is also a leaven in the social life that must develop in future, that people take in things which they are not able to perceive for themselves at some time or other, 
now speaking of the region of time, from other people. Yesterday I told you that through evolution in time the arrangement is that one need not accept things on mere authority, but that in the ideas which arise within one you can indeed have a kind of conviction welling forth from your own inner life. I emphasized in a number of my books that belief in authority should not flourish in the soil of spiritual science. But one thing must be certain for all who truly base themselves on the science of the Spirit. You are not an initiate by simply being cock on the dung heap and begin to crow about your own convictions at any time in life. You can set up all kinds of programs which you think will rule the world, but never produce a body of knowledge which will truly flow into the life and activities in the world. The knowledge of the initiates will be needed more and more for all life and activity in the world. In earlier times, initiation was like a thinking given to people. As we move toward the future, people must with all their will turn toward the knowledge which comes into the world through initiation. All kinds of wishes, subconscious wishes, will go against this. It is not easy for people to develop the great seriousness needed to enter in the right way into everything that is demanded by everything that has been said. It is really quite difficult to tell people today how much they need to be of good will because they often see this good will as a heartless will. Someone who truly enters into the meaning of spiritual science will know that moving toward the future there is no other way but through the science of the Spirit, through initiation, to create soul substance that can go through the gate of death in the right way and can find its right place in human social life. You can come to live in it, and then the counter-thought will come. So, a person has entered into this kind of life, and there are others whom he loves for one reason or another, who do not want to know about this great challenge in our time, about turning to spiritual life. He will then wish that these other people shall also be blessed, and it seems heartless when the full truth relating to this is stated. But someone who is of good will in this sphere will know that there is no good will in closing one's eyes and saying, quote, well, they do not want to know about spiritual life, but they can also be blessed without it, close quote. What one has to say is, quote, every effort must be made so that spiritual life may come to the earth, close quote. We must endeavor to be positive and not so much follow thoughts that are so closely bound up with wishes, thinking of the situation of people who do not want to know, but with good will give ourselves up to spiritual life in the endeavor to bring this spiritual life into the world and, and so take humanity into the state of blessedness, if I may use the term, of being in harmony with the spiritual world. Behind the attitude often called loving, lies not only superficiality, but also a failure to see things as they truly are. Someone speaking from initiate knowledge today does not do this merely to bring theoretical insight to the human soul, but is speaking from a warm heart with love for humanity. He knows how much the signs of the times indicate that the great task will be to speak to people of this spiritual life and to work in such a way in the life of people that this spiritual life will reach the human soul. It will, of course, call for some degree of courage to face up to human evolution in time. The views of the upper and the lower have to be clearly understood, as they have to be today and as far as possible must also be presented to the human soul. If you look at the whole of life, the way it is looked at in a prejudiced, illusory way today, Yes, then you won't talk of the whole of life. You'll really only talk of a very small part of life. I have tested this. I know the existing Goethe biographies, for instance. They do tell us all kinds of things which Goethe has done, thought, and envisaged between his birth and his death. 
But when this Goethe soul went through the gate of death, everything written from the point of view of today's illusory philosophy of life did not have the least significance for the region into which the human soul enters after death, which represents a different blend between the region of eternity and the region of transience. For this too is transient. The human being will be born into a new existence. For in the region into which human beings enter through the gate of death, we can do nothing with everything known through the illusory philosophy of life, through the illusory biography recording the life between birth and death. There the only question that matters is, quote, how did the soul speak to the cosmos? Close quote. Things a person has told others, even if they have been the most beautiful things here on earth, will not have been spoken to the cosmos unless they have themselves arisen from spiritual insight. The things Goethe had lived through had been spoken to the cosmos, if we look at this life in such a way that we describe the seven-year periods, especially with regard to his life. How much he changed from one seven-year period to another. How remarkable that the great change in his life came within a seven-year period when he went to Italy, or at least made the decision to go to Italy. The things that happen from one seven-year period to another, under the region which creates the biographies in the ordinary sense, speak into the cosmos. Something can be done with them when the human being has gone through the gate of death. What Goethe said as the spirits from the region of eternity influenced him, which can be described the way in which I have described it today, does in turn relate to the region into which one enters after death. Describe Goethe's life from the point of view which results from the spiritual way, spiritual way of looking at one seven-year period after another. What Goethe felt when he wrote words like, quote, things you wish for in youth are yours in abundance in old age. Close quote. If you look at Goethe's life from the point of view of transience, and come upon words like these which Goethe wrote as a motto at the beginning of a chapter in his works, quote, things you wish for in youth are yours in abundance in old age. Close quote. If you come up to such words with spiritual scientific insight, you are, as it were, coming up against the eternal Goethe. And if again in a spiritual scientific mood, you come on something of Goethe's where something coming from the region of eternity enters into his words, from the region where the hierarchies let their interplay proceed, you come on something which is the eternal Goethe. To get to know not only the temporal in the world, but the eternal, which one can only get to know by the roundabout route of spiritual science, is the task set for us when we take up the science of initiation. Things from earlier times must now be seen in the light which can come from the present-day science of initiation. There is something in the Roman Catholic Church which we may compare with the effect which a red rag has on a certain creature. If a Catholic, who today is often considering himself to be dyed in the wool, could speak up against some kind of philosophy of life, it would be a philosophy of emanation, presenting the world from the emanation point of view. Then this philosophy would be condemned, perhaps less for the man himself, but certainly for the faithful sheep for whom he writes or speaks. All one has to do is to attach the predicate emanating to a philosophy of life. Our staunch Catholic opposes this emanationistic philosophy with the creationistic philosophy, the philosophy of creation from nothing. Now, again, dualism would be used, putting the emanationist philosophy that acts like a red rag on one side, the creationistic philosophy, creation from nothing on the other side, one adopts the creationistic philosophy and rejects the emanationistic philosophy. Emanationism has specifically come to be known in the Occident by way of gnosis. 
The way it has become known in the Occident, the literature on which it is based has largely been destroyed. This emanationism is already a kind of caricature, and a great misunderstanding arises because essentially only the caricature is known in the Roman Catholic world. For their theory of emanation, with one eon arising from another, with the less perfect or the less sublime eon arising from the more perfect eon, exoterically usually known as gnosis, has already been corrupted. It goes back to a philosophy of life that was of a completely different nature, one that was still possible in the times when spiritual teachers from the supersensible world taught humanity. Emanationism, which as I said had, has already been corrupted, points back to knowledge which in the old way related to the region of eternity, the upper element. When it comes to this upper element, one can in a way defend him emanationism, not in its corrupted form, but in the form where only a perspective in time is spoken of and not an actual process of evolution. And as there was no reference to evolution, one also could not speak of something arising out of nothing, for that would be an evolution, even if evolution at a radically extreme point. There one cannot speak of one thing arising from another, but in the way we also did not speak, as we talked about the region of eternity today, of an emanation, an arising, but of changing relationships among the spirits which have the quality of eternity. When we talk about the region of transience, we can certainly speak of evolution, but then also of the extreme case of evolution, of which we have essentially, implicitly, been speaking a great deal these days. Surely it means continuous creation from something which to the world is nothing when we say that the present ideals are the seeds for the future and the present realities are the fruits of the past. Rightly considered, this gives us the true uncorrupted creationism. The challenge for people today is this, to see what was meant by emanationism in the right light and apply it to the world of spirit and soul, to see what true uncorrupted creationism is in the right light and apply it not to the creators, but to the creation, to the element of body and soul. The salvation, the redemption of the philosophy of life is to acknowledge the duality, see through it, and not jumble things with dualistic orientation together in a nebulous way. To see the region of eternity in the right way and also the region of transience and be able to tell them apart. Then we'll be able to say, quote, When I look at the reality that lies before me, it is a reflection and at the same time also a consequence. It is a reflection in that it belongs to the region of transience and is governed by evolution a consequence in that it belongs to the region of eternity and is governed by that which results when we see the things we have today been characterizing for the life in spirit and soul in the right way. Close quote. Someone who puts things in the right way will not say that creationism is right and emanation is wrong, nor that emanation is right and creationism is wrong. He will know that both are necessary factors if we are to grasp life in the full. The overcoming of dualism cannot be done in theory, but only in life itself. Someone who is looking for a way out between the region of the upper and the region of the lower, the region of transience and the region of eternity, and does so in theory, using concepts, ideas, notions, will not succeed. He'll always end up in a confused philosophy because he is using the intellect to look for something that must be looked for in life. In life, however, one is only looking for the truth if one knows, quote, you have to turn your attention, on the one hand, to the region of eternity, there to perceive what admittedly does not present itself in external reality, and then also to the region of transience, there to consider all human beings and all creatures in a way which actually contradicts outward reality. Close quote. 
equipped with both the reality you approach, experiencing it in a living way, will come together from the elements which originally gave rise to it. The consequence of the region of eternity and the reflection of the region of transience. This is how we grasp it in life if we do not want to have a theoretical philosophy of life that is all concept and idea, but are ready to have two philosophies, one for the region of spirit and soul, the other for the region of body and soul, and do not want to have a theory for the source that feeds life and makes it fertile, but have the two live together. Then and only then do we escape the dualism. This is the challenge facing humanity today. It is not a matter of having founders of religions appear to teach spiritualism. It is not a question of some founders of scientific sects making their appearance who teach materialism. What matters is that we see matter materially in evolution, the spiritual immaterially, spiritually, in the region of eternity, and see reality in the two coming together. Letting the spirit illumine the material, letting the material harden the spiritual. This is what must become part of the future philosophy of life. There is no need for philosophers who give people definitions of the truth, nor definitions of what science teaches, so that a monistic harmony is established. What matters is that the dualism between truth and science is recognized, looking in a life that is alive to the relationship between truth and knowledge, and so arrive at a living rather than a theoretical epistemology. Not truth or knowledge, but both truth and knowledge. The knowledge sustained by the weight of truth, the weight of truth illumined with the light of knowledge. Acknowledging that man is dualistic in the world and can only overcome such dualism as needs to be overcome in his life in growth and development. It is not Kantianism, the belief that whatever lives in the outside world is not the thing in itself, but truth and knowledge which future humanity must make its task also in philosophy, recognizing that everything around us is maya, but maya because, as human beings, we take this position in the world, which is dualistic. We create maya by doing so, and we overcome maya in life in that we ourselves come alive, and not with theory or notion. That is what I have also written in my title Truth and Science and my title Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. A new edition of the latter will be available shortly. Readers aside, this is also known in a newer edition called Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path. There is also another title, The Philosophy of Freedom. End of readers aside. I have made some additions. The text has not been changed but considerably expanded on certain points. It is a question, therefore, of understanding the signs of the times and on the basis of this cultivating cultural life in all kinds of fields of human activity. The end of Lecture 6. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moise. This is Lecture 7, given on the 20th of September, 1918. There is no need, really, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of laying the foundation stone for our building. And there is particularly no need for this among the people who have been more or less close in space to the building through those five years. These are disastrous days, and for that reason, too, one certainly has no time for special celebrations. Nor should the celebrating of anniversaries become a habit in our movement. Only a few words shall be said on the subject. The building could not be finished in the time which some people may, perhaps, have expected when they attended the foundation stone ceremony, 
or were involved in some way or other, perhaps in their thoughts. But that is not the essential thing. The essential thing with this building, even if it is still incomplete today, is that it actually does exist. Even if it were less complete than it is, the essential point would be that it does exist. And looking at its forms, one can see the spirit in which it is meant to exist. We have talked about its design, its nature, on a number of occasions. The fact that the building exists is something we really want to register as a fact a fact which, in a way, is also an obligation for us. It simply is not one and the same thing if our spiritual scientific movement would have existed without this building over the last five years, or if it exists with this building. It is not the same thing, absolutely not the same thing. The building is, above all, a landmark for our movement. In a sense, it shows to people far and wide that there has to be such a movement in the world. It is also an obligation, as is evident to us from the way the outside world sees this building. The outside world would have been much less aware of the whole of our movement if the building did not exist. It simply is a fact that at the present time, visible signs mean a great deal to people. Considering that a good deal of our work for the spiritual scientific movement will no doubt consist in fighting hostile movements, it has to be acknowledged that the existence of the building contributes quite a bit to the existence of powerful, hostile movements. People would pay less attention to us if the building did not exist. It is, therefore, not enough to feel a degree of satisfaction that the building has come into existence. Considering this building to be our own affair, we must also have a feeling to go with this, like the South Pole belongs to the North Pole or the North Pole to the South Pole, that it is our responsibility to stand up for the anthroposophical cause in the right way. I'd like to say that we should not really feel pleasure or satisfaction with regard to the building, unless we are at the same time doing some, everything in our power to stand up for the anthroposophical cause. For the building would cause the destruction of our cause if sufficient strength could not be found to defend it. I would say that if we did not have a building, we could have the luxury of merely belonging to the anthroposophical cause, for there would be no visible sign which attracts the attention also of people who need visible signs. But if we take pleasure in the building, if we feel satisfaction about it, we must also accept a certain obligation to stand up for the cause of anthroposophy. The most serious misunderstandings are, of course, connected with the anthroposophical cause itself. But we shall also hear of countless misunderstandings of the worst kind where the building is concerned. You only have to meet someone new and then, excuse me, you only have to meet someone now and then who has visited the building or talks about it, and you'll see what misunderstandings there are. Many other things also show us how something positive affects people, and our building is something positive. We won't get very far by seeking to correct ill-intentioned attacks in a negative way, but we'll go a long way if we endeavor to present the positive to the world in the right light. People who have been to the building, the evidence for this exists, and who have let it speak to them, have seen something positive, and they, or at least many of them, have not formed a bad opinion of the cause that is connected with the building. We just have to be careful not to attach all kinds of mysticisms to the building when people come to visit it. The building will have its own effect if we objectively interpret it as the artistic reflection of basic spiritual scientific facts and basic observations. It will definitely compromise the building and the whole of our cause if you seek to impose all kinds of mystical things on people. My intention has been to speak of some such practical things. The most important thing is that we remember the laying of the foundation stone five years ago. The significance of this building, which is intended to stand before us in liveliest sentience, 
of the inmost nature of the anthroposophical cause. We have frequently uttered thoughts on the building and will also do so on all kinds of occasions in future. Today we take the thoughts that come to us when we look back on the occasion five years ago when we laid the foundation stone and make them part of the feeling that connects us with the building. I have often spoken to you of how the human soul is changed in the course of human evolution, how short-sighted it is to think that today's state of soul can be understood if we do not look back on the transformations which this human soul has gone through. We look back, I need not recapitulate, on the different periods of earth evolution and have on a number of occasions characterized the post-Atlantean era to show how the state of the human soul has always been changing in this post-Atlantean era. It is particularly in speaking of these things that we must move from abstract to concrete thinking. We must try ever more intensively to answer the question, quote, what did things really look like in the human soul in those earlier times? Close quote. We are looking back on a primal period when we may say so in more than a figurative sense. Divine teachers were imparting the sacred secrets of existence to human beings. And we know that from then onward human beings have found many different ways of learning about those secrets of existence. The ideas formed in the human soul did indeed change again and again through the ages. Ideas we have living in us today and put in words at any moment also lived in earlier states of soul, but they live there in a very, very different way. Many of our most common concepts were utterly different then. Today I'll refer to two common concepts living in the human soul today. People are at any moment referring to them in words that are part of their vocabulary. They also lived in the human soul in the past, but in a completely different way. I want to speak of the concepts space and time. Space is the most abstract thing people can think of today. They do not have much idea of space today. Three dimensions at right angles to one another, or if one reads textbooks of philosophy, how far physical objects extend. And there are also other definitions of space. But all this, consider how dry, cold, and abstract it all is. Three dimensions at right angles to one another, or indeed everything that is said about space and geometry, dreadfully abstract, dry, and conceptual. So conceptual that in art the whole of space, with time, by the way, has become subjective shadow, merely looking at the sensory phenomena. This abstract concept of space, which modern people know very little about except that it has length, width, and height, this abstract notion was a very different thing in the distant past, with some idea still existing today for a few particularly sensitive people, but only a trace of it remains today. Yet we do not have to go all that far back to the 6th, 7th, 8th pre-Christian centuries, and it will be fair to say at that time, space, the way people experienced space, was something very different for the human soul and not the dry abstraction which space is for the human soul today. In early Greek times, the human soul still knew something when experiencing space which it could connect with, which it could feel in a living way. It felt itself to be in something that was alive when it felt itself to be in a space. At most, only a trace of this remains for humanity today. A few people have traces of sentience, I'll come to this shortly, of being present in space as a person, as a human being. But the people of those earlier times were saying something by which they meant a significant relationship between them and the universe as they distinguished between above and below, left and right, in front and behind. The living relationship people had with the three dimensions in those times 
do indeed have terribly little to do with our abstract three dimensions, which really do nothing but be at right angles to one another. Uh, Truly boring if you can do nothing for all eternity but be at right angles to one another, like the three dimensions in geometry. The living experience which people meant in that past, when speaking of above and below, left and right, in front and behind, really has terribly little to do with those three dimensions. Above and below, it was something full of life when people in ancient times were still sentient of how they were first a young child and came upright from below up when they felt how life consists in unfolding in the direction from above and below. Life consists in living the direction of the above and below. It is just a short distance which we move away from the ground in normal life as we grow, unless one lives in the Aramonic times of airships or the Atlantean times, though in those times it was not very far above the ground, as you know from my description of Atlantis feeling oneself to be living in the above and in the below, and not just above and below. The contrast between above and below was felt in those early times to be the contrast between the world of conscious awareness and the world of objects, the conscious and the unconscious world. People were deeply sentient of how subject relates to object when they experienced above and below. Above and ever higher and higher above are the worlds of the gods. Below are the worlds that are opposite to the gods. And the human being has his place in the above and below. Even with someone like Goethe, who only you only need to study his Faust, you still find remnants of that awareness of above and below. Humanity was then also sentient of left and right. We have to speak in abstract terms about left and right today. The people of early times genuinely learned something when experiencing left and right, a genuine world of observation. The above and below is the line from infinity to infinity or from conscious to unconscious. Left and right, in experiencing left and right, people felt the connection in the world between meaning and form wisdom and form. Just draw an axis of symmetry. Anything to the right of it and to the left of it will together give you the form, and you cannot connect the one with the other unless you do it meaningfully, relating one to the other. If above and below were pointing to the mysterious relationship which human beings have to the spiritual and material worlds, The experience of left and right is the relationship of human beings to the world as it spreads in the form. They would feel themselves to be in this second element of space as they related left and right to one another, letting wisdom prevail in forms symmetrically arranged in left and right. This experience of meaning in form of wisdom in form, in all possible variations. This feeling oneself within this harmony of meaning and form, wisdom and form, was to the human beings of those earlier times what for us today is the abstract second dimension. And the above and below and the left and right come together in something which is the plane, which cannot yet exist in sense-perceptible form, needing thickness, needing in front and behind, if it is to exist in the sense-perceptible world. And in this third element, in the in front and behind, the people of old sensed the material making the leap into the spiritual. Above and below, left and right, they would still sense as something spiritual. There can be no physical existence if if something is just above and below, left and right. It is just an image and has to be an image in space. It needs thickness to be material. In those early times, people had a lively awareness that when you grow, you take a few steps up from the ground in the above and below direction. Walking, you can move freely and are in your will element, in front and behind. 
Between them is the moving in complete freedom to left and right as you stand still. The people of those earlier times were sentient of these three opposite pairs, which in their nature are part of the whole universe. This stay where you are with regard to left and right, this stepping out into the world with regard to in front and behind, this slow upward movement along the above-below axis. Living in the above and below, they were sentient of everything we call the intelligence, the rationality of the universe being active in the whole cosmos. For them, all intelligence, alive in the universe, was interwoven with the above and below. Being able to be involved in this intelligence of the universe, as they grew from below upward, they also felt themselves to be intelligent. Participation in the above and below was to them also participation in cosmic intelligence. Participation in left and right, with meaning and form, wisdom and form interwoven, was to them the feeling which is alive and active throughout the world. Standing quietly, surveying the world, was to them the connection between their own and the world's feeling. And walking through space in the in-front and behind axis was to them the unfolding of the will, taking one's place in the universe, in the world will, with one's own will. They felt their life to be interwoven with above and below, with left and right, with in front and behind. Conscious and unconscious elements, above and below, wisdom and form, left and right, spirit and matter, in front and behind. That was the sentience of those early t- earlier times. At the same time, however, those earlier people vaguely felt, I'm putting it in extreme terms, quote, if one stands on one's head, the below will be up above and the above will be below, close quote. But that is also how it is with the Antipodians. And if one sees oneself as part of the earth, the below is above, the above is below, And so it is also possible to imagine that one day, thanks to something or other, anything which is on the right will be in front, anything on the left will be behind. These directions are just as alive and active in space as they are in a sense indistinguishable, interweaving. In those earlier times when people were aware of living in that threefold space, they felt that the divine, in its threefold form, reigned in space. The divine spirit reigning in space made human beings aware of the divine in eternity. The people of those times experienced, and what I am saying now is something they truly did experience, the divine in space in its revelation, tripartite by nature. It was the image for them of the threefold God, Father, Son, and Spirit, or whatever name the threefold God was given. The Trinity truly is something that was not thought up. It is not an invention. The Trinity, with all its particular characteristics, was experienced in image when people had living experience of tripartite space. Lack of clarity may prevail, in a sense, when it comes to above and below, and the way right and left may also turn into in front and behind. Under certain circumstances, lack of clarity may also affect the interrelationship between God, Son, and Spirit. However, when in the sphere of transience, in the sphere of space, people were living with the three dimensions, not in an abstract geometrical way, which is what we do, but in concrete living experience of how the divine, comes into its own in space. When they were at the same time also aware of transience, they would relate this transience to the element of eternity, and tripartite space became for them the image of the tripartite spirit. Living down here on earth, I am living in the trinity of space. But this trinity of space is an image proof of the trinity, of the divine origin of the world. That was more or less how people thought in the past. Today, space has become abstract. 
and only a few people are sentient of the depth dimension, the thickness dimension, and the way they arise, above and below, in front, behind, left and right, the dimension of the plane. Even philosophers do not offer much living experience of this. Yet a few individuals who think about things and are not wholly asleep will realize that the depth dimension arises only on unconscious observation which is not that far below conscious awareness. People do still experience seeing the depth, but that is the last shadowy remnant of that living experience of space. In the religions which have developed, true understanding of Trinity was preceded by understanding for the oneness of the God. Understanding for the oneness of the God has much the same origin as understanding for the Trinity of the God through space. Spiritual science finds its things from the divine facts themselves. Foolish people will come and say that some external proof or other does not exist. Well, we have told a few things about this and I could tell much more, but we won't spend time on it today. Let me just point out that perhaps it is simply that today's, in quotes, science, is so unscientific that proof cannot be found. Let me tell you just one thing, in a way, also as an outward proof, that people in past times had the sentience I spoke of today. Why did the rabbis of old also call God space? In quotes. Because, in earlier times, People had the sentience of which I have been speaking also in Judaism. If science meant genuine thought in the different fields, countless riddles would be found. But these are at the same time genuine proof, external proof of what is to be found in spiritual science, though in this case from the spiritual facts. One of the names the rabbis have for God is space. Space and God are one and the same. The oneness of the divine is similar in origin to the trinity of the divine. This is because of living experience of time. For people in earlier times also did not experience time in the abstract way we do today. Concrete living experience of time was lost even earlier than concrete living experience of space. If you read Plato or Aristotle, not the way many a schoolmaster does today. I have on several occasions referred to the note Hebel had made in his diary about a schoolmaster faced with the fact that the reincarnated Plato was at his school, and lo and behold, the schoolmaster was at that time just reading out one of Plato's dialogues in class, and the reincarnated Plato was given really bad marks by the schoolmaster. This is what Hebel wrote in his diary. So if you read Plato and Aristotle with real, deeper understanding, you will, per you will everywhere, in their works, read how people really still had a good feeling for this in pre-Christian times, in the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries before Christ. It had faded to some extent by the time of Plato and Aristotle, but one can still clearly sense this getting a feel for space of which I spoke. The living experience of time was lost even earlier, however. It was very much alive in the second post-Atlantean era, the ancient Persian age. Zarathustra's disciples would have felt a shudder, of course, if one had said to them that time goes in a line which runs evenly from past to future. In the, Gnosis, in the time of Gnosis, People still had a shadow of the feeling, scarcely recognizable, however, that time was a living thing. People would not say that there was such a line going from past to future. They would speak of eons, of the creators who had been there in the past, with the later ones coming forth from them, with one eon always handing on the creation impulses to the other. The image they would have of time was more or less that in the succession of hierarchies, the spirit who went before would always hand on the impulses to those who came next, 
with the next always brought forth, as it were, by the preceding one. The preceding one would encompass the one that followed. People would look up to the one who had gone before as being more divine than the one which followed. In quotes, later was felt to be ungodly. In quotes, earlier, more divine. Living experience of and learning about time included looking at the change with the development going from divine to godless. Everything would fall apart if the godly and ungodly were not to interweave and be a whole, and that is identical with our present-day abstract notions of past and future. But in the image of time, looking back and embracing more and more comprehensive elements until one comes to the ancient of days, people were sentient of the image of the God who was one. The old experience of time provided the basis for monotheism. The old experience of space provided the basis for the Trinity. That is how the state of the human soul has changed. Something that was full of life has grown abstract and dry. Paradoxical though it may sound, modern man is undoubtedly thinking of something abstract when speaking of space, and, I think, he thinks of a living relationship when speaking of a friend. But that concreteness, that elementary living experience which speaks from friend to friend today, to give an example, is still abstract compared to the intense experience of the world which people had in earlier times, living with space and time which were images to them of the one God and the Trinity. So, we have grown dry and abstract when it comes to space and time, and something else must take their place, something of which we must have living experience, making it part of our inner life. We must learn to be sentient of the dualism, the contrast in the world of which I spoke last week. Just think of someone seeing only the ruffled surface of water. Essentially, it is an abstract line. What is concrete here? Water down there, air above it. And in the interaction of the two, of their forces, we get the maya, the ruffled surface. That is how we are as human beings as we look at ourselves within maya. If we look at ourselves in a real way, we must also see ourselves right here, water below, air up above. Water below, we see it as we observe transient development as I presented it here last week. The human being develops so that ideas he may have as a child would only be understood in old age. The ideas he has at sexual maturity he will understand a bit earlier, but still only when old age is approaching and so on, as I presented a human life where it is only in old age that one is able to grasp what one has been in childhood and youth. Life proceeds like this, not seemingly but in reality on the surface. I told you that perhaps one does not need such an overview even today in order to live, but one does need it in order to die. That is the idea of the lower the idea of the true upper principle, the region of eternity of which I spoke last week, goes with it. There the human being does not develop, but also has the principle that belongs to the region of eternity all his life, from birth to death. But today we are unable to consider how the lower and the upper interweave unless we grasp the lower at the point where it threatens to grow rigid, where it threatens to harden, If we then grasp the upper, where it threatens to evaporate, to grow spiritual, unless we grow sentient of the opposite nature, divine, luciferic, aramonic. In earlier times people had something that was alive in their souls, as they spoke of their experience of space, their experience of time. In future, human beings will have to develop inner concepts, inner idea impulses, divine, aramonic. Luciferi. The end of Lecture 7. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.podbean.com. 
please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184. This is Lecture 8, given on the 21st of September, 1918. In last week's lectures, I said that efforts must be made, with the help of initiation science, to progress from the seeming reality which is really all around us all the time to genuine reality. I also said that the endeavors which most people find they like, the endeavor to find a uniform rational theory for the world, actually lead away from reality, taking people straight into delusion about reality. Instead, one must endeavor to distinguish between two streams in reality, especially when it comes to understanding human nature, and then connect anything that can be known about either of the streams with the other. Let us briefly review what has been said so far about these two streams in seeking insight into human nature, and then try to gain the necessary requirements for a view of reality on this basis. Human life really proceeds in such a way that people will only in the second half of life be able to understand what they went through in their thinking and in their inner life altogether in the first half of life. I told you that good sense is active in us in the first seven years, from birth to second dentition. Sense reigns in us, but our own human powers are not enough to let us grasp what reigns in us then, nor anything we may have learned in those early years. We do not grasp it if limiting ourselves to the one stream which we need to consider. If human beings had to depend completely on themselves as earthly human beings, they would only be able to grasp what they thought, felt, and did up to second dentition when they reach a considerable age, the late fifties and early sixties. We thus are only ready to gain self-knowledge relating to our inner life in childhood when we reach a good age. The powers which enable us to grasp what we lived through so sensibly in early childhood are only born at that late time in human life. We then have a second period in life which extends from second dentition to sexual maturity. Just consider, we have written about this entitled The Education of the Child in the Light of Anthroposophy, what human beings go through in their thinking, feeling and doing until they reach sexual maturity. Their own human powers, the powers which man has on earth, would only enable them to understand what they have been going through there when they are in their late forties and early fifties. And anything we live through from sexual maturity into our twenties could only be grasped with our own human powers in the late thirties and early forties. Anything we think up, if you like also, by way of ideals, the importance of it, the value for life, could only be grasped using our human powers in life when we are in our thirties. Anything we live through from roughly our 28th to 35th year stands on its own, can be more or less grasped. This middle part of human life has a certain balance. There we can think up and understand at the same time. Not so in the other stages of life. You get an idea of human development in one life if you think this through you will get an idea of how human beings develop in their time on earth. Gaining self-knowledge, seeing that we are bound to time, would o really only be possible if we always waited until the requisite age is reached to understand what we were thinking at an earlier stage of life. Human life forms a whole. As individuals, we would not know anything of real significance about ourselves as earth creatures unless we were to look back in old age, unless in old age we were to look back on what was developing 
in us in our youth. This is the one side of human beings, one mood in human life. With regard to this stream, people are wholly subject to time. They simply cannot do anything but wait until the time is right. However, I did tell you that human life is not really the way we live through it in Maya existence. It is human life if seen only in relation to time. Yet what is said about the progress of human life in time is absolutely real. For at a pinch, if one wants to stay superficial, one can live with the things we live through between birth and death, but one cannot die with them. For everything else we learn in other ways are taught by others. Things we learn because humanity has acquired them in the course of history In short, the things you as a temporal human being learn in other ways than by looking back on youth in age will initially be lost when we die. We do not take things from that one stream with us through the gate of death. We take with us only the insights gained by doing so at the relevant age. And don't think that you are not doing what I am referring to. Those of you who are older are already looking back on earlier stages in life in their subconscious. It does indeed happen, even if it is at the subconscious level. You would not be taking anything of your external, temporal life through the gate of death if that were not the case. People pay no attention to this in the age of materialism. But everything which the age of materialism can teach people cannot be taken through the gate of death. Only things you have gone through by understanding in old age what was going on in the whole of your being when you were young has significance for the world. That is one. That is the one stream. The other stream is brought about in that human beings exist in more than body and soul. In body and soul their existence proceeds in time in the way we have just been considering again. But human beings also live in spirit and soul. And with this they exist not only in the realm of time, as we have just been characterizing it, but are also entities of spirit and soul in the realm of eternity. There, however, they are again something completely different from what they appear to be. There they do not develop or evolve. There they are the same from birth to death. But their thinking, feeling and doing is something completely different from what it appears to them to be. Their thinking and part of their feeling consists in entering into cosmic regions where battles of the gods are fought, as I described it to you a week ago. And their doing acting out of the will, and part of their feeling consists in entering into a different region in the cosmos where battles of the gods are fought. To reflect, I told you, is to enter into a particular region of spirituality and take part in certain battles of one kind of spirit against another. In the same way, acting out of the will is to take part in certain struggles although in some instances the struggles have come to rest. A profound truth shown in titled The Portal of Initiation is that great things happen in the cosmos as things happen in our spirit and soul. Human beings want to have no inkling in the age of materialism of the body and soul aspect which proceeds in time nor do they want to know of this aspect of spirit and soul which lives in the realm of eternity, though it looks very different from their thinking, feeling and doing in ordinary life, and seen in the light of reality takes the form of battles in the spirit. It may sound paradoxical to someone who thinks as a materialist, but when you take a thought, it is something completely different from what you see if looking at it yourself in Maya. Let us assume you have a thought. Let us say one of the kind which we mentioned yesterday. You have a thought about space. The moment you think of space, even if merely abstract, the way people do at the present time, 
The moment your mind fills with thoughts of space, your soul is in a spiritual region where Araman is fighting a tremendous battle against hierarchies of a different kind. You would not be able to have the thought of space without living in a region where Araman is fighting other hierarchies. And when you develop the will to do something, perhaps I want to go for a walk, however insignificant the action may be, as soon as you let the will become deed, you are, spiritually, in a region where the Luciferic spirits are fighting the spirits of other hierarchies. What happens in the world at large is, seen from the point of view of initiation science, something very different from the shadowy reflection we perceive when as human beings we live in maya between birth and death. For the maya we perceive is nothing but something which may be compared with the ruffles on the surface of the sea. I gave you this image yesterday. The waves ruffling the surface of the sea essentially is something which would not exist if there were not the sea underneath and the air above. The forces which evoke the ruffling of the waves are within the sea and in the air. The ruffling is but a reflection of the way in which forces from above and below come together. Our life in Maya, between birth and death, thus is nothing but the coming together of those spiritual battles that truly take place in the realm of eternity, when we think, feel, or act out of the will and the evolutional progress in time which takes place in such a way that we only understand what we did think up in our youth once we have reached old age. Essentially our life is a nothing unless we consider it as these two true realities coming together. These two true realities are there behind our life. Now, behind our life, there is not only the progress in time, where we would need to wait and wait before we could understand something we thought of earlier in life, nor the things that go on in eternity, taking the same course for the whole of our life between birth and death. No, we ourselves are within this reality, and our being in it also appears only as a reflection. The whole relationship we have to the world appears to us only as a reflection, an image. To perceive the truth always means that one must gain the strength to perceive it. It will not come to us if we prefer to remain passive. To perceive the truth means to see ourselves as we are within the two streams, in the realm of time and in the realm of eternity. And being in the two realms and living a life which, compared to the true true powers, has no more significance than the ruffled waves on the oceans have with regard to the air and the flowing waves below, we live our life between death and birth, and then also again between birth and death. The forces and powers make us their concern as we live in this way. For there always are tremendous powers, which on the one hand endeavor to tear us away from the ordinary life on earth which proceeds in Maya, and other powers that make every effort to tear us away from the realm of eternity. On the one hand, let us hold firmly on to this. We have the progress of life in time, where in our understanding we only grow mature late for what will be our future. There are forces and powers that sought to limit us to what we are as human beings, wanting to shape us in such a way as human beings that this will happen for us. This means, therefore, that there are forces and powers which want our life truly to run that way, also in Maya, also in earthly life in such a way that as children we live through one thing or another but understand nothing of it living in sleep, as it were, until our twenty-eighth year, then begin to have some understanding of what is going on at that time, and then, once we have passed our thirty-fifth year, begin to understand earlier things. 
there are powers that want to make us into purely temporal human beings, individuals who live more or less like a plant in sleep in the first half of life, and only grasp what happened during that sleep when we look back in the second half of life. There are powers that want to make human beings into dreamers in the first half of life and in the second half of life into someone who remembers those dreams and so gains self-awareness only in the second half of life. In practical terms, if those were the only powers that had an influence on us, it would mean that in our souls we are only born in our early thirties or at most in our eighteenth year. Before then we'd walked about as if drowsy in sleep. If this were just as those spirits spirits wish it to be, we would be torn away from the whole of our cosmic past. As I have shown in title Occult Science, Readers Aside, also known as Esoteric Science, and of Readers Aside, our present existence has its basis in our having gone through a cosmic past, through Saturn, Sun, and Moon periods. As we went through those periods, spirits from the higher hierarchies, who had a particular interest in having human beings arise in the cosmos, spirits who are the creators of humankind, evolved us and placed us in the earth world. In earthly existence we are, according to the one stream, human beings of the kind we have described for that world. The forces and powers are there which wanted us to be such earthly human beings only. If they were to win, they would tear us away from our Saturn, Sun and Moon past. They would preserve us in life on earth. They would make us into nothing but earthly human beings. That is the aim of certain powers, the Aramonic powers. Araman seeks to make us into pure time people, seeks to tear our life on earth away from our cosmic past. He seeks to make the earth into a completely separate entity and to make us wholly telluric, utterly earthly. Other powers seek to achieve the exact opposite. Their aim is to tear us away completely from our life in time, to give us a thinking, feeling and doing which drips down solely from the region of eternity without our doing anything to bring it about and then maintain it throughout life. If they were to win, the whole of our life in time would dry out. We would finally, actually very soon, it would have happened long since if these spirits had won, shed, lay aside our physical body nature, our nature in body and spirit, and we would be nothing but specters. Our task, in so far as it comes from existence on earth, would not be done. We would be drawn away from existence on earth. These spirits consider the earth to be too bad. They hate the earth. They don't like the earth. They want to lift human beings away from the earth. They want to make them exist in the realm of eternity. They want them to eliminate everything which proceeds in time, the way I have shown it. These are the Luciferic spirits. Their aims are, in the first place, the opposite of those of the Aramonic spirits. The Aramonic spirits seek to tear human beings and the whole of their earthly existence away from the cosmic past and preserve the earthly principle. The Luciferic spirits seek to cast away the earth, everything that is earthly in human beings, and make them wholly spiritual so that nothing earthly influences them so that they will not be filled with the nature and powers of the earth. They would wish to have man as a cosmic spirit. They would wish that the earth dropped away from evolution, that it be cast aside in the universe. Araman wants the earth to grow independent and be man's whole world. The Luciferic spirits want the earth to be cast aside, thrown away by humanity and that humanity be taken up into the realm where the Luciferic spirits themselves are, where they have their existence in the world of sheer eternity. To achieve this, the Luciferic spirits are, all the time, trying to make the intelligence which we have as human beings automatic. And they also seek to suppress our free will. 
if intelligence became purely automatic, if free will were to be suppressed, we would be able to use automatic intelligence and do what we are meant to do not according to our own will, but according to the will of the gods. We would be able to be purely cosmic spirits. Such is the aim of the Luciferic spirits. They want to make us into pure spirit, as it were, into spirits that do not have their own intelligence, but only cosmic intelligence, and no free will of their own, in whom all thinking and doing proceeds automatically, as in the hierarchy of the angels, and in many respects in the hierarchy of the Luciferic spirits themselves, though there in another respect. The Luciferic spirits want to make of us pure spirit. They want to cast away the earthly aspect. Instead, they want to create an intelligence for us that is utterly and completely uninfluenced by any kind of brain and in which there is absolutely no free will. The spirits gathered around Araman want exactly the opposite. They want to cultivate the human intellect cultivating it more and more in such a way that it will be more and more dependent on all earth existence. And they want to develop particularly also the human will, everything, therefore, which the Luciferic spirits want to suppress. The Aramanic spirits, or rather the spirits that serve Araman, want to develop just this to the full. It is particularly important to remember this. Human beings would arrive at some kind of self-sufficiency. They would be dreamers in their young days, but they would be someone quite bright in old age, understanding many things from personal experience. They would, however, receive no revelations from spiritual worlds. Let us accept the fact that anything which makes us bright in youth has come from revelations. Personal experience only comes with age. And the Aramanic spirits want to limit us to this personal experience. We would have free will, but would at best be born in spirit and soul only in our twenty-eighth year. Just consider. As human beings, we are really between the two directions of will in the spiritual world. And as human beings, we have, in a sense, the task to live through the world in such a way that we follow neither Araman nor Lucifer, but find a balance between the two streams. It is possible to imagine that people feel shudders down their spine, even in this materialistic age, when they hear what is actually going on deep down in human nature. People do shudder at this, and it was therefore arranged in the world order that divine teachers provided superconscious knowledge in earlier times so that people did not have to take a position relating to the battle in the spirit. Initiates were thus able to keep silent in the outside world about those struggles. There have always been people who know, knew, about the battles which in a way take place behind the scenes in every human life. There have always been individuals who have become convinced that life is a matter of worming one's way through a struggle, that life holds a danger. Yet it also came to be more and more the principle that one could not guide people to the threshold, to the guardian of the threshold, so that they would not have to feel that shudder down the spine, if I may put it in such commonplace terms. Those days are over, however. Times will come in future earth evolution when the children of Lucifer will have to be separated from the children of Araman, either the one or the other. To know that we are in this situation and will have to conduct life in this knowledge is something which today one has to say is a vital necessity for the future of humanity and which has to be understood. Anyone wishing to live life in such knowledge will, in a way, I'd say, have to develop cosmic sentience. What does it mean to develop cosmic sentience? It means one has to learn to see the world in a somewhat different way from the one we are used to seeing in the light of Maya. 
When one goes about in the world with initiation science, feelings arise which do not exist for as long as one lives merely in the knowledge of maya. Feelings arise which ordinary people will consider not just paradoxical but foolish, sheer fantasy. But they are as justifiable as possible, especially with regard to the truth. If one is armed with initiation science, as one faces another person, one swings to and fro between sentience of two things. In quotes, human being, one will think, quote, you are swinging to and fro between two possibilities. Either you give yourself up entirely to the temporal and grow mineral, rigid, being nothing but an earthly human being and losing your cosmic past, or you volatilize in spirit and become a spiritual automaton. You do not achieve your goal as a human being, although you are spirit. Close quote. We might say that when you have a person before you in this way, you are really always having two human beings before you, one who is in danger of growing petrified in his form, growing dense and rigid in form, and growing together with the earth, and the other in danger of casting out everything that tends toward mineralization, hardening and growing quite soft like jellyfish and ultimately dissolving as a spiritual automaton in the universe. These two human beings present themselves to those who are armed with initiation science when they study a human being. You're always afraid, I'd say. Forgive me, but one has to take such words as the language offers. And some things do sound paradoxical when you point to the sphere of reality. That all the people you meet might suddenly turn into those strange figures you sometimes see on rock faces, knights on horseback as if brought forth from the rock, or other figures in the mountains, sleeping virgins and so on, that people might turn into such things, merge into the earth's mineral world and only live on as mineralized forms. Or they might cast out anything that points them toward mineralization and be like jellyfish. The organs which have condensed might swell up, ears might be giant size, also encompassing the larynx, wing-like organs might grow from the shoulders and grow together with it all. The whole world be, would be as soft as a jellyfish, but as if dissolving out of its own billowing waveform. One would have such sentience, such, uh, cosmic sentience, I'd say, not only with regard to people, if one approaches them with initiation insight, but one will ultimately apply this cosmic sentience to everything. As you will have noticed, the tendency to grow rigid, turn to stone, comes from Araman, the tendency to volatilize, to be first like a jellyfish and then dissolve, comes from Lucifer. It is not limited to anything we encounter in human beings, but extends to everything abstract we encounter. You grow sentient of all things that go in straight lines as Aramanic, all curved lines as Luciferic. The circle is the symbol for Lucifer, the straight line for Araman. Look at the human head. This has the tendency, you can see it if you look at a skeleton, to petrify grow bony in the form given to it by the earth, to stick with that form. It is Aramonic. If the powers active in the human head were to be active in the whole human being, people would assume the form of Araman, as you see him in the sculpture over there, and would be all head nature, all personal intelligence, egotistical intelligence, and wholly self-willed, with the will reflected in the form itself. Looking at the other human being, not the head one, but the human being of extremities in the wider sense, we get the impression that if the powers active in the rest of the human being were to be active in the whole human being, the human being's form would be like the figure of Lucifer in the sculpture. Wherever we look, 
everywhere, whether in the life of nature or in social life, equipped with initiation science, we would be able to look into the Aramonic and the Luciferic principles. We just have to be sentient of the Aramonic and the Luciferic. To develop such sentience is indeed necessary in developing toward the future of humanity. People must learn to feel, quote, Luciferic spirit prevails throughout the world. This Luciferic spirit prevails also in all human social life. And this Luciferic spirit wants above all to remove from the world everything that is law in the world, any law human beings have ever established. In human social life, nothing is more hateful to Lucifer but everything that has a whiff of being law about it. Close quote. Araman wants to have laws everywhere. Araman just wants to write down laws all over the place. On the other hand, human social life is woven from Lucifer's hatred of anything by way of law and Araman's sympathy for laws. And we won't understand life unless we grasp its dual nature. Araman loves everything that is outward form and can grow rigid. Lucifer, the Lucifers, love everything unformed, anything which dissolves form, growing fluid and mobile. We have to learn from life to establish balance between the principle that wants to grow rigid and the principle of getting fluid. Look at the forms in our building. Everywhere, straight line is taken into curve. Balance is sought. Everything, everywhere, the attempt is to let something, which is growing rigid, dissolve into fluidity. Everywhere, rest is created in movement, but the rest is set in motion again. This is what is so very spiritual in the building. As human beings of the future, we must endeavor to configure something in art and in life, knowing that down below is Araman, who wants everything to freeze and up above is Lucifer, who wants everything to volatilize. Both principles must, however, remain invisible, for in the world of Maya there can only be the ruffling of the waves. Woe betide if Araman or Lucifer were on their part seeking to push their way into something that wants to be life. Our building has therefore developed into a state of balance in the universe that has been rested, lifted out of the realm of Araman and the realm of Lucifer. Everything culminates in the central figure of the group, the representative of man, where everything Luciferic and Aramanic is to be extinguished. That this is so, that it has been taken away from the only thing that should remain spiritually, is shown in the group where the Luciferic and Aramonic spirits are shown as opposites in balance so that people may come to understand it. That is the prospect we must put before people today so that they come to understand that they must find the balance between Aramonic and Luciferic. The Aramonic always makes us move in a straight line in spirit and soul. The Luciferic always guides us into wave-like or circular motion and makes us manifold. Araman is tweaking our ear when we tend one-sidedly toward monism, wanting to declare the whole world to be a single whole. Lucifer is tweaking the lobe of the other ear when we become monadists, one-sidedly so, declaring the world to consist of many, many atoms or monads, all different. Basically, for anyone with insight, one finds that when monists fight pluralists, monadologists, the human being involved in the dispute is mostly not responsible for the situation. Behind him is Araman to tweak his ear if he is a monist, providing him with all the excellent reasons, all the logic he thinks is his own to support his monism. And when someone is a follower of Leibniz or another monadologist, it will be Lucifer who provides all the excellent reasons for the manifold nature of spiritual entities. What we have to look for is a state of balance, oneness in manifoldness, manifoldness in oneness.
It is more difficult than to look for oneness or else for manifoldness, just as it is altogether more difficult to look for a state of balance than for something or other on which one may rest at ease. People turn into skeptics or mystics. The skeptics feel themselves to be free spirits, able to doubt everything. The mystics feel themselves to be imbued with godliness, lovingly and perceptively embracing everything within them. Essentially, skeptics are merely disciples of Araman, mystics merely disciples of Lucifer. Humanity must endeavor to find the balance. Mystic experience in skepticism, skepticism in mystic experiences. It matters not if you're Montaigne or Augustine. What matters is that Augustine casts light on anything that is Montaigne and vice versa. Bias makes human beings deviate toward the one stream or the other. What actually is, in quotes, the Luciferic? It really exists to make us headless, taking away our own intelligence and free will. And the Luciferic spirits, the Luciferic element, really wants us to die in our twenty-eighth year and not grow old. It is better, by the way, to say the Luciferic spirits, but Araman. For although Araman has hosts of followers, he presents as a single whole, since he strives to be such. The Luciferic elements presents as manifold, because that is what it aims for. This is why one puts it the way I have been doing in today's lecture. If things were to be just as Lucifer, the Luciferic spirits, want, we would turn into children, young women and young men, would have good knowledge of eternity fed to us drop by drop. But we would develop sclerosis in about our twenty-eighth year and soon begin to dote, so that anything we can develop by way of human insight would be cast up as sclerosis, and anything we take in in our youth could be spiritualized. The Luciferic spirits want to take us straight to the spiritual world and not let us go through Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan development before we become cosmic spirits. They consider this unnecessary. Their aim is to take human beings away from the earth and to the divine and spiritual goal with everything they have developed on Saturn, Sun, and Moon. This is a stream in which man is to be taken forward as fast as possible. It is a precipitate stream. The Luciferic spirits want to rush ahead with us and take us into cosmic spirit nature as soon as possible. The Aramonic spirits would wish to wipe out our past and take us in the earth back to the starting point, extinguishing our past, preserve us as we are on earth, and then take us back to where we were as human entities on Saturn, It is a retrograde movement. Life ultimately is made up of a precipitate and a retrograde movement, and we must find the state of balance between the two. Do not say that these things are difficult, for that simply is not the point. Yesterday I showed you how in earlier times people had experiences of space and time, experiencing them in a concrete way. To us they are abstract. To them they were concrete. We must learn to look at our surroundings in such a way that we see everywhere this interplay in processes of growing rigid, evaporating, running away and throwing back, linear and curved, held in balance. One can be asleep with things simply seen in the world. If we are wide awake and looking at the world, it will threaten in everything it is to grow rigid or evaporate as soon as the balance is lost. You can be sentient of various things when looking at the group sculpture. You can feel the representative of man at the center, the lines and surfaces and forms where everything luciferic and aramonic has been extinguished. The forms are there, but as far as possible the luciferic and aramonic quality has been eliminated. You can see Lucifer and Araman given form. You can sense this contrast in the central human being, 
in Lucifer and Araman, and you can go through the world feeling that you will find the like of this everywhere in the world. Someone who really makes the quality his own that lives in the feelings which one can develop in looking at this trinity will gain a great deal that will enable him to perform a kind of autopsy or dissection of life. Much will be revealed in the world if we look at it in the way in which these feelings arise when considering the trinity of the central human being or representative of man, Lucifer, excuse me, read that again. Much will be revealed in the world if we look at it in the way in which these feelings arise when considering the trinity of the central human being or representative of man, Araman and Lucifer. The Trinity revealed itself to the ancients in their feeling for space, the oneness of the divine in their feeling for time. The most sublime of cosmic secrets will have to reveal themselves to future humanity if they are able to be aware in a concrete way of the processes of growing rigid, evaporating, running away, pushing back, of linear and curved, of love and hatred where they are according to their laws, and so on. To see the pendulum swing everywhere in life, that is what matters. For life is not possible unless there is that pendulum swing within it. If you have a clock with a pendulum, you can, of course, avoid the swings by stopping the pendulum. But the clock will be of no use to you then. The pendulum must swing if the clock is to tell the time. This is how there must be the pendulum swing in life. Note must be taken of it everywhere. We'll continue with this tomorrow. The end of Lecture 8